Uh, let's see if I left myself something that builds. They're using FFmpeg? Does that mean I can get codecs on Google servers in like a billion different ways? <laughs> I would suspect they do it all in a, in a container or something. Is it literally they're just using FFmpeg and then they throw cores at it? Ah. Okay. So, first thing I want to do is I want to finish up the locks that I have implemented here. So, uh, previously I implemented the locks. Um, we added this interrupt state. And I think the problem with this is it's really difficult to get... Uh, values into here unless the kernel has a global mechanism since everything here is um, nothing in here takes a self whatever whatever the word is for that um, since nothing in here takes a self you're kind of relying on the kernel to have an ability to for example we had a core ID that I removed because it was not working uh, and that relies on the kernel having a global that can get a core ID which Um, I might actually be able to make that work. I would like to get rid of this. I was thinking about potentially turning lock into a macro and then having lock take an argument, which is like information about the system environment. Um, it's kind of difficult to say. Need static methods, but those those methods have no access to anything other than globals. Those methods are required to have global access. And that means everything that we access has to be in a global, and we don't really have that in the bootloader. But uh, let's let's see what we can do. That's what I meant by static. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but core ID requires a static method. Or requires uh, self potentially. I don't know. It's yeah. Gets the idea of the running core. Um. I think I might change the lock format from a ticket lock. Uh, to a slightly different lock that will just lock on the core ID. Um, it's required that this core ID is uh, unique to the core and cannot be bang zero. Okay. Cannot be bang zero. Uh, and the reason for that is we'll... Probably change how these locks work. Yeah, what are we going to do? Mm. I kind of want to get rid of this and just pass. To me, I view it as cleaner to have lock take an argument. And then we can access it with a macro. And we just have, like, lock bang. Um... I, I I guess I don't know. Uh, cannot be bang zero, and we'll we'll validate that. We'll just panic if that happens. It's kind of difficult, but we can probably do that. Um, cannot be not zero. Okay. So if I change the lock, and I have the lock uh, like this, and this is the lock, and this will be um, the lock is free when this value is not zero. The lock is taken when this value is not, not zero. Um, in this case, the core ID is stored in the lock to track who currently owns the lock. All right, so then what we can do is we can go down here and we can change this to lock. We have the value, we have the lock, and do this. Put the lock here, 
Don't need the release. Releasing the lock is going to be as simple as storing a not zero to the lock. And then we can enable interrupt. So once that lock is released, so here we store that. OK. Uh, and then 96. Uh, here we're going to say while. And I forget. Rust, I think, has two different compare exchanges. Uh, Atomic U32. Fetch max. Oh, interesting. Fetch update. Fetch update, compare exchange, compare and swap. Compare and swap is the easier one. Uh, current new. And this will only store it. This will return. Always return the previous value. OK. So here we can do loop. Uh, and here we'll do uh, holder is equal to self.lock.compare and swap. We'll give it the, this takes the current value, the value we want it to be, which will be the core ID. Uh, let core ID is equal to I core ID. This will be get, get the core ID of the running core. Compare and swap with the core ID. And then if holder is equal to not zero, break, uh, we took the lock. Otherwise, uh, otherwise, if the holder is equal to core ID, uh, there we don't have the ticket concept. If the holder is equal to the core ID, then panic, lock already held. Uh, or deadlock detected, detected, and then we can print the location info. Uh, yeah, we can just say deadlock detected, and the location info will be in it. We'll get it automatically. And this takes an ordering sequentially consistent. So. Um, Attempt to take the lock. So we'll compare and swap. If it's not zero, we'll swap in the core ID. If we what we got was not zero, then we took the lock. I'm guessing it returns the old value. That's yeah, that would always make sense. If the previous value was a not zero, that means we did the exchange, and thus we break the uh, we can break out. Otherwise, if the holder, the current owner, is core ID, then we have a deadlock. Um. So here we disable interrupts if needed, get the core ID. We'll get the core ID first. Um, if this lock needs to disable interrupts or we're not in an interrupt, those are the two pass conditions, okay. And then spin loop hint, that looks good and this should be solid. So now what I wanna do is the bootloader, this is gonna return a core ID, this is returns U32. And we're gonna track. Uh, we're gonna have con or static core ID uh, atomic U32 is equal to atomic U32 new zero, and this is the um, current running core ID. The entire bootloader is protected with a lock, preventing two cores from ever running in the bootloader uh, at the same time. This is due to the fact that during the bootloader process, cores use a fixed address for the stack. Thus the uh, stage zero, ASM, has a state variable called uh, SP bootloader source uh, Stage zero and uh, called stack avail. Uh, called stack avail, which makes the stack and thus the entire Rust bootloader exclusive. Okay, 
Now, the, what that means is that we only have to increment the core ID at the end. That means that the core ID, while running, is actually core ID dot load ordering sequentially consistent. Um, we can just get the core ID. It'll be zero, and then at the end of the bootloader process, core ID is equal to this fetch add one ordering sequentially consistent update uh, the core ID count and get a unique uh, zero indexed core ID. And then we're going to pass that. Uh, we're going to pass that to the uh, to the 64 bit side of things. <clears throat> and that way, the bootloader and the kernel will always use the same core ID. Before, we kind of had this weird thing where the bootloader wouldn't use the core ID, but the kernel would. In this case, they'll always have they'll always have the exact same core ID, which means the deadlock detection will actually work uh, because the view of the core ID it'll be zero, it'll be zero while it's running. Then at the end, we'll increment it. We'll give that zero to the kernel, and then the next thread will come through. It'll be one once again exclusive. Uh, this will not be touched by two cores, and it will be updated here before we've released the bootloader lock. Um, and then we go into bootloader source assembly routines. And this we have a D word at ESP plus OX 2C. And this is the um, uh, zero indexed core ID. Zero indicates BSP. Yeah, it doesn't. I mean, it does, but we'll just say zero indexed core ID. Mm, I will say zero indicates BSP. I might get rid of the whole concept of is BSP. And then you'll just check core ID zero will be like the, the bootstrap processor. So at the end here, when we're loading shit up, RFP 14, here we're going to load RCX. That's the parameter. RDX. This is the core ID. And this is going to come from 2C. This is a D word. We'll load that into EDX. So I'll pass that core ID. Okay. And then this takes a core ID U32. Oops. Um, sweet. So we have a core ID. We get the core ID, that'll be zero, then one, two, three, four. At the end, we'll go fetch add. We'll pass that into here. That'll throw that on after whatever's on the stack, which is ESP plus 2C. That's the core ID at 2C. We grab the core ID into EDX, the second argument. We don't clobber EDX, then we jump into kernel entry. At this stage, we'll have a core ID, which is a U32. We'll initialize the core locals with the core ID. And then core locals, cores online, this will say core ID, or something like that, ID colon. Uh, here we can say, we have that set as a U size right now. We'll set that to a U32. And that won't be mutable, so I can give pub to that. Same with address, to be honest. Address can be pub. Yeah, we won't do that right now. Okay, let's uh, ID colon. This will take the core ID. Okay. Hmm. So here's where I think I have a problem. It's only for one lock. And it, it is when I access the allocator here. When I access this, I don't actually have a way of getting the core ID yet because I don't have core locals. Um, oh, and this takes the core ID. So, How do I pass that core ID to lock? And I think this is why I was thinking of 
switching to not use static functions because then I could actually pass in a context that could then, I could temporarily set one up that's faked out, but I have no way of returning a core ID right now. Well, this is really gross, but I can do this. I can temporarily set the GS base to the core ID. Um, set GS base to the core ID for early locks. Um, then this will get a core ID, which will be CPU get GS base as U32. So we set the GS base to the core ID. And I don't think GS base has alignment requirements. Let me see if it does. Uh, we'll go into uh, shared CPU source, set GS base, and this is I32 GS base. Um, or that. Can GS base be an arbitrary address? Can it can it have a one in there? I guess it doesn't really matter as long as it doesn't clobber them. Um, let's see a x86 MSR table. Uh, Intel manual. I think they have an MSR document that's separate. I just want to see if those bits are, here we go. Yep, MSRs. And, oh nice, it has no contents. IA32 GS base. C table 2.2, two. okay. And that is stored on the thread, so that's fine. Table two two. Okay. Those are the Apex. So these are architectural MSRs. Which one? What number is it? Ah, uh, one oh one. Oh, it's C zero one oh one. Here we go. If that is present, the base address is GS. Okay, it doesn't look like any of the bits are reserved. So we'll temporarily. So we'll have uh, get, set the GS base, get the GS base. This will be GS base, read MSR, that. This will return a U64. This doesn't need to be unsafe. Ah, uh, technically it should be. Because that could not be supported potentially. And then 170. We can say GS base. Okay. Oh, set GS base. And then here, get the GS base. And that means we set the GS base here. We're not in an interrupt. We do nothing on enter and exit locks. And we will. Um, in this early stage, we'll use GS base for the core ID. And then we'll set up a new GS base with the core local pointer, at which point we can use the core structure, fn core ID u32, and this is core ID. Uh, 174, hmm, unsafe it. Okay, so this is a new lock type, so hopefully we didn't f screw it up. I think we got it right, though. Okay. Sweet. So, it looks like that kind of works. And then here, I currently have this. This is a test of uh, getting access to the serial port and then panicking and then crashing. 
Okay. Shift C. Shift C in a loop. Sweet. So this should currently have deadlock detection. It doesn't look like it breaks. We had that issue before where this would relatively frequently break. Um, at this stage, we init all of their cores. Um, yeah, and I don't think I've seen this one fail. This is all the cores online. We're not waiting for all the cores to come up. We're just going immediately. And it looks to be working. Okay, I might make the APIC timer a little bit more aggressive. Uh, enable timer. And I think I'm just going to do this to make it tick very, very, very frequently. And then we'll see if we can use this to cause... Okay, yeah. So here's an example. I want one to come up where the, all the cores don't come up. But this looks like that's stressing it. This does look like it's causing the... Um... Okay. I mean, this is definitely tearing things down while, um, while they're booting, which is great. Because we don't init here, so we don't init the other cores. We don't init the other cores until the other cores have. Um, we don't init the other cores until we've taken all the locks. So all the other cores can be going while we're waiting for the locks, and then we'll init the other cores. Once we get exclusive access to all the things we need to do a soft reboot, we then init all the other cores. At that point, it doesn't matter if we kill them in the middle of them having a lock because we have all of the locks that we possibly could use, if that makes sense. So now what we're going to do is I'm going to grab two serial locks. We'll do under serial and serial, and this should deadlock, and this should be detected. Uh-oh. Oh, yeah, we can't, we can't print a deadlock on the print lock because we can't assert and panic. But we should be able to, uh, oh, we can't recover from this. Yeah, because we actually deadlock. So I think what we need to do is anything that uses the print lock in the interrupt handler needs to be, uh, it needs to try to get the lock. Because um, it can potentially deadlock. Shatter the print lock? Yeah, I think... The problem is, I need to... Um... If the print lock is held, I need to know if the other cores have that lock held. Um... And I, I don't know that. Let me, um, let me do this one. We're going to grab boot args... Uh, I think like soft reboot entry or so something. Uh, soft reboot address. Okay. So we'll try this. Okay. Uh, deadlock detected, and that's at 103.22. Perfect. You could store the core ID of holding core in a lock. I, I do that. I have the core ID in the lock. I now know which core holds it, which now means I can do a try lock. Um, and to get a try lock to work, the problem is it would. I if I can't get access to the serial port. Well, when I go for when I go wait for soft reboot. Um, good morning. How are you doing? So I can know if it's already being held, right? I can, I can try lock that. The problem is my panic here is a deadlock if it's the print lock or the serial lock. So both the serial lock and the, um, 
print lock, this would cause a deadlock in the deadlock detection. Everything else in here is fine, and this assertion, this assertion cannot cause a deadlock. Well, if the print lock is held, it kind of can, because the print lock could be held, and then we'd try and get the lock on the serial lock, but this will never fail. This will never fail on the print lock, so that's okay. It's not great. I would like to have this bulletproof if I could. But if I have a if I have this print deadlock, what can I do? Um ah, I have this lock. If panicking, screw the locks, but I might be panicking on another core. I can't. Fuck. Um... When I hit a panic. I mean, so my concern is when I have a networking stack, I will need to use the networking stack to download the kernel. And that means that I can't just kill the lock because that means someone might have been using that. Um, uh, Yeah, I have thought about using a, a channel, but I can't use that for networking. I mean, maybe prints are a special case. Um, I can guarantee that maybe the print... Yeah. So, like, one option, right? So, currently, I have that print lock that will lock prints so that prints are consistent print the whole print message will go out in one go um the problem with that is uh what what I, what I can do is that the serial the serial lock i can only obtain i could obtain the serial lock only when i print a byte right i could obtain the serial lock only when i print a byte so every time i write a byte to serial i would grab the lock and then I'd write the byte, and then I'd release it. And there's no way for that to crash or panic, unless there's catastrophic kernel corruption where the routine is fucked. But at that point, the value that's being written isn't a pointer to bytes. It's literally the byte to write. So we could grab the lock, and then that would guarantee that that lock will never be held. Uh, it'll, that will never deadlock, because it'll disable interrupts, and exceptions cannot occur in that window, if that makes sense. It'll just be impossible uh, for that to happen. Um, but we do have some things that read bytes from the serial port. Yeah. I mean, we could just say that this is acceptable and say that if you deadlock, if you, if you panic or... or or grab the print lock while panicking, you're just fucked. I could also, I could also grab the locks that I need. Hmm. Um. So what I can do, which would be correct, which would be not to shatter the locks, but, if I could ensure that no one else will ever access that lock again, a la replacing the lock with a none, I could then recreate a serial driver and reinitialize the serial port so it's in known working condition. And I think that's the correct path. The, the truly correct path is to init all other cores so that the, all other cores are off and reset and not doing anything. And then in my core, if I need to get the lock, 
I will... Yeah, I, I think that's probably one of the better ways to do it. Um... And then that way, anytime I'm panicking, I will have a very select few locks that I'll make sure that if, if I can't get access to any of the locks, I will tear everything down. So I would, I would try lock everything. If I cannot get the lock, then I would... Um, yeah, I could try lock a couple times. Like, that's defi definitely a valid way to do it. And I think it's the correct way to do it. Ugh, it's kind of weird, though. Um, I just, I really... I'm just gonna close everything for a second. Um, shared lock cell source this. What I wanna do is I wanna design this in a way that it prevents making arbitrary requirements for which locks you can and can't get. And I can now implement a try lock that could spin for a couple hundred attempts or something. Um, in fact, this should be try lock. And then what we can do is try lock will take a um, attempts. And this will take the number of attempts, basically the number of loop iterations. Here we'll just say uh, for this in zero dot dot attempts, get to this stage. Um, uh, yeah, we'll do this. Loop this. Else if, uh, if that were breaking, if that were panicking, else if attempts is equal to zero. Oops. If attempts is zero, then return none. This will be a sum. This will return an option. Um, attempting to get access to the lock attempts times. Technically, I should have that take like an option. Yeah. I'll take an option U64. If attempts is none, the lock is attempted forever, uh, the lock attempt is blocking. Okay, so then if attempts, if some attempts is zero, then return out, and then here we can do attempts.map x minus equals one. Uh, decrements number of attempts. I can't map like that, can I? Because the, um, if that is equal to zero, oh, sum, this way. If attempts is equal to sum zero, then in this case, uh, U64 cannot be dereferenced. You can't do this. You can't map like this. Um, can you do this? Does this map, does that update? Does that update the count? Or will that make a copy of X? I'm gonna say as mute. That definitely will do it correctly. Yeah, yeah, yep, it was making a copy, okay. So, if the attempts is sum zero, then we're out of attempts, otherwise it's none, or it's greater than zero. In these cases, decrement the number of attempts on getting the lock, 
And then this will have pub fn lock. And this will return a dupe. This will be on self. On self. And then we'll return. Uh, it doesn't take an option. And here we'll just do um, self dot try lock unwrap. Pass it a none. And then uh, get exclusive access to get exclusive access to um, the value uh, guarded by the lock. Okay. So now we have a try lock. And what that means is let's try it on serial. So I think what I want the ability to do is Can I actually boot on all cores? Do I need to be, can I ignore the BSP? What if I just, anytime there's a panic, I init all the other cores, tear them all down. I think if you init the BSP, the whole system reboots. I'm pretty sure you cannot init the BSP. Nah, maybe you can. Let me see. So here's what I'm thinking, is if I init everything, um, SP, uh, kernel source interrupts, uh, oh, decrement the, or increment that, and then here, let's apic, uh, here we can do core, apic, lock, um, and can that deadlock, if we have the APIC lock held, and there's an exception, I'm, a, I'm maybe okay with that. Yeah, maybe I do need to shatter locks. Yeah, that's really tough, man. That's really tough. Uh, and then this is as mute, unwrap. So this will knit all, all other cores when a panic occurs. And then we'll make one of the cores panic. In this case, we'll do if core ID is two. I think this causes a triple fault. It does not. Huh. Okay. Huh. The serial lock, this will init everything. And let mute driver is equal to serial new. I think serial port new. Um, 236. Yeah, serial port, that's on serial. And I should be able to do driver dot write B uh, shatter, uh, and it's everything. Let's see what we can do. No. Huh. Let's see if that one prints. Core ID is that. Get the lock twice. That causes a deadlock on the serial port. Interrupt depth should be fine. If I do this on core ID zero, I think this works. I'm confused. No. That deadlocks and then that panics. Oh, that's not an interrupt, it's a panic. Yeah, okay. Okay, and then this panics, fatal exception, or this does not panic. We gotta make that panic. 
Panic, Fatal Exception on BSP, Waiting for Soft Reboot, Enable Interrupts. We'll do this. Then Panic. That's only if it's the BSP. We'll say Fatal Exception, Waiting for Soft Reboot. Uh, don't want to inter enable interrupts yet. Okay. Fatal exception, waiting for soft reboot. That's going to go into panic. That'll go into kernel source panic. So it'll come into here. This will use print. So that can still deadlock. This exception print. I think that one we might make conditional. I really want this stuff to be perfect. I, I want there to be no possible uh, situations where it's possible to have a bug. Like, regardless of use. I, I really don't like this whole concept of like, oh, just make sure you use it exactly uh, correctly. I really don't like that. I don't want it to allow the wrong thing to ever occur. I don't want it to be like, oh, if you do this thing first, then it's okay in this one condition. So, grabbing a lock on interrupts. Exceptions make this very difficult. Panics are pretty easy. You sure it's not one of those hard problems in comp side? It, it is, it is a definitely a hard problem. Um, I, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's impossible to do it correctly in a generic sense, but we can potentially add limitations onto it like we did for our locks that we haven't specified can be taken in interrupts, we panic. Uh, not panic on a race, but we just panic. Now, a deadlock is not memory corruption. Rust allows deadlocks, so we're not, like, violating Rust at all by doing any of this. But, obviously, I would love for it to be correct. Um, one second. Mention my tibia characters. This. This. Okay, that should do the trick. Okay. So in panic, what we can do is, um, I think in panic, I don't want to, here's what I'm going to do for now. Core, apic, lock, unwrap, get access to the apic, uh, as mute dot and we want to send an init and we apparently remove that it's this okay uh at this stage we want to write icr this will init all other cores And then all other cores. Okay. On safe. And then here we can do uh, let serial is equal to serial serial port new serial dot write failed uh, filled to oh, serial dot write panic happened. CPU halt. I'll make that mute. Okay. So that should be panicking. That is, is that grabbing the print lock? No, it shouldn't be. Okay, let's try a different lock. Um, soft reboot. 
The A pick lock should not be held. A soft reboot adder, I think. Let's see if we see this panic. We do not. I mean, I'm just going to see what happens. Okay, yeah, that's nice. Wow. Wow. Um, that's what I need to know. What? You can get rid of this. We're seeing another exception here. How do I scroll to the bottom? There we go. Whoa. What is that exception? All right, what if I just halt? Did fatigue finally kick in? No, nah, we just have some weird issues right now. These are just kind of not fun aspects of kernel dev. We're trying to we're trying to solve a basically impossible problem. Um I think, yeah, Shattering Locks might just be the play. I just don't like it because it's not, it's not guaranteed to be correct. I have no idea why that serial port is failing. Serial to 400. Oh, yeah. That, the serial port to reinitialize Assumes that we can figure out the serial ports from the BIOS, and we cannot. That would make sense. That is actually a real, uh, a real crash. Because the serial port assumes that we can read from the BIOS. We can try P versus NP. Um... I mean, this is really only for the serial stuff. And it's really only for exceptions. Exceptions pretty much never happen. We never do the wrong thing. We have deadlock detection now, which is nice. Yeah, I think... I think... I think what I might do is just say... If you panic while printing, it's game over. Because I think I think that's fair. I think that's completely fair. Um. Oh, how do I do this conditionally? Uh. Deadlock detected, yep. And then... That we had panic. Here we have exception. Um, fatal exception, waiting for soft reboot. That goes to panic. And then panic can do an unsafe... Uh, CPU... Enable interrupts. And let's see if we can have anyone do that full init process. Let's take a look. We'll go into kernel source A pick. This will be the timer. And what we'll do is if 
any of the cores have seen the soft reboot, then we'll we'll tear it down. Okay, deadlock detected. Blah blah blah. Enable interrupts. Uh, panic. Panic implies waiting for soft reboot. Shift Z. Okay. Um, we're able to hit soft reboot request. Oh, that was for all the cores. All the cores are deadlocked. Uh, yeah, the soft reboot address we need. Well, that one's that one makes sense. Um, let's just put a normal panic in here. Panic. Foop. Foop. <laughs> Apparently. Deadlock detected. Oh, now we're hitting a real deadlock. Okay, there's the foo. Foo. Why is that so slow? Is this struggling? Let's see that first boot. Fresh boot. Got a panic at foo. That crashed. Those nits did not seem to go out. Yeah, I think we do restrict it to core ID zero. Okay. Um, if core ID is zero, uh, uh, here we can say uh, print BSP panicked waiting for soft reboot. That'll enable interrupts. That'll then... Oh yeah, our, um, that actually was probably working. Enable interrupts. Then, blah, 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 get this. Lock the APIC, send an EOI, do a soft reboot, and then soft reboot will go into mains. We'll get a soft reboot here. And I think I just I deleted the code here. I did to init. Just grab that quick. That. Okay. So at this point we have every single lock. Now we can init all other cores. So by this point we have all the locks. We're never gonna we're not gonna grab a lock at the rest of the part, so we'll disable all the other cores. So we're not waiting on them. Here we're gonna wait for the cores. We're gonna deadlock if another core has any of these locks that we're requiring, or we do ourselves. Okay, so now this should work. I don't know why it eventually gets like slow. Maybe it's because I have is BSP. I might do this. Core ID is zero. RG is BSP. Pretty much anywhere that I do this, I'm yeah I'm gonna remove this construct. Kernel source core locals BSP. Okay, core ID zero is whoever brought us online. It's the first one through the bootloader. Then is BSP. That's in CPU. I might get rid of that too. Uh, CPU. Um. Shared CPU? Nope. Shared CPU source. Okay, and then here we'll find the um, is BSP. Delete this code. Okay, now there's nothing that can determine if we're a BSP or not. This is great. We don't use this APIC base anymore. Like it. Okay. No, is BSP on 100 on main? Yep. Gone. Core zero is the BSP to brought us up. It's not actually the BSP, but for all we care. Okay, so why does that get slow? It seems like it never fails, unless that's a reboot. Oh, I think that's a, oh, it's triple faulting, I think. Um, let's see if I can get access to the terminal here, uh, sudo cat 
uh, dev, PTS, wherever the uh, terminal is that this will allocate. Serial, here we go, PTY, dev PTS4. And then hopefully, oh, we can't, uh, we gotta see if this works, Z, okay. Z. Z. Okay, so sometimes it is triple faulting. And why would that happen? How did you do bidirectional cat? I opened screen. But yeah, this has like so much corruption. It's really annoying. Here's what I'm gonna do. Um AD. We'll just print the boot count here in the bootloader. Um, do I have a way of printing a number? No, I don't. I actually don't know the boot count, but that is that is triple faulting. Okay, that's just fucked now. Off, on, text console Z. Uh, reset. There we go. So it triple faults in the condition. That looks like a race, kind of. Like when another core is coming online. Okay, so. And why would that happen? We init all the other cores. If all the other cores are off, well, oh. Panic. Is it a race if two things try to start doing a soft reboot at the same time? I think that might be what it's doing. Another program that can do that is a uh, CU. Is that short for cut? No, cut separate. What is CU? Is that an actual program? Is that a standard program or is that one you have to get? Um, so at this point I should have exclusive access to the soft reboot stuff. Why is this why is this crashing? This panic, this is printing. Here we enable interrupts. You know what? Maybe we shouldn't do that. Maybe we should just have a wait for soft reboot and not enable interrupts. And that'll just pull the serial port. Yeah, we'll do this. Um Yeah. We'll put this in main. Pub unsafe fn attempt soft reboot. Uh, and this one can return. So we get the serial lock, we get this. Then we'll soft reboot if we can. Uh, okay. And I think we'll EOI the APIC, which is fine. And then we will create attempt soft reboot. And we'll grab the serial lock for that. If it's Z, uh, okay, we'll temporarily get that. We'll grab a byte. If the soft reboot is requested, then we'll go into here. Then we'll hit soft reboot. Okay, so this works, and then it still it still triple faults. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is enable instead of enabling interrupts and panic because I really don't like that. We'll do create attempt soft reboot loop 
forever. All right, so we will try to soft tribute forever. That fixes it. Oh, fuck. Okay. What is that? What is that triple fault happening for? So what if I said only if core ID is zero? So we're only going to let. Uh, actually, we can do that here. Pub if core ID is not zero return. So we only allow soft reboots on core zero. Let's see if this fixes it. I think it does. So is it an issue of other cores? Is it a reboot if you init the BSP? And I think the answer might be yes. I know I've had this code. I know I've disabled soft reboots on everything except for the BSP on all of my kernel. And I don't know if this is the reason why. But this seems to be working. OK. Is there any way? that I can print all of this in one print. Is there a way to do that? Can I have conditional fields in a print with right? Can I? Can I have can I print multiple format args? Can I have like panic and then a format arg format arg format args this? Um I was going to see if this works. Because if this works, then I should be able to do them. I mean, if I if I wrap it in a nun, if I do a map, I'm okay with that. Can I find ASDF? Yeah, that's a string. Let's see if this works. I think this is valid, isn't it? Okay, and does that work? Panic ASDF ASDF. Okay. Um. So then I can do uh, if let sum. Here we'll do this. Else none. And this is format args. And then this is the message. Um, and then this can end with a new line. Else none. Actually, can I do this? Uh, just some semicolons. I have faith. Doesn't live long enough. Message. Mm. Let message is equal to info message. Uh huh. Let location is info dot location. Right. And I might need to as ref those. I don't know if I can as if on the same line. I don't think so. Wait, really? Yeah, we'll bind those. And then these we can as ref, I think. I think. Really? What is the type of this? It's just an option message, isn't it? Uh, it's an option ref arguments. I find that strange.
I guess due to the if let. Is that the issue? Okay, let's see if we can do this. Uh, location dot map x. I just want to see if this works. That'll fail. Same issue, the lifetimes. I don't understand. I don't understand how that's temporary if I have it here, right? Location. Why would that? No fucking idea. Okay. All right. This is an A ref uh, location. Um, yeah, we'll do location. This is a uh, location. And I thought all of this stuff is static. There's an option, a ref location. List lives for a. I mean, I'm pretty sure I'm just doing literally this function lives for a. I'm just doing what the compiler does. Uh, we'll say core panic. Um, you have no type parameters. Ah, I see. So I can't do that. And this can't be static, can it? Should be panic info. Okay, so it has to be this. This, we got a reference to location. Returns a reference to data owned by the current function. Is it this? Let's go down to just put this down here. Comment all the shit out. And we'll just go with just now line. We're going to do file.line. Can we do file.line? Can you do the map outside of the printf? Oh, that's, that's probably it. I think that'll do it. Is equal to location.map x format args. Oh, you know what? Format args borrows. I think that might be why it's confused. Because I think that format args needs to borrow. Let's just comment this out. Let's see if this works. Ah, uh, print. Oops. Yeah, because... Temporary reference created here. Because format args ref every argument. I might be able to deref line. Um, but not everything. Wait, actually, are all of these static for location? Uh, ooh, the file is not static. Kind of surprised that the file is not static. So I could, 
I could potentially call right and manually hold the lock on the print the print lock and do it myself. That's doable. Um, that's in kernel or share. Uh, Shared serial source this, okay. And let's take a look. That's not where I implement it. Where do I implement the writer? I guess I think I have a kernel source print. Yeah, I do. So that's where I grab the lock and then I call write format. So print is what is taking the lock. So if I don't use print here, I should be fine. Yeah. Let lock is equal to core boot args print lock lock. And then here I can I can basically go back to what we originally had. This. Uh, I want that BSP check. Right? Oh, I added the BSP check in the... Okay, yep. Okay. Here's where we were. So now what I can do is I can call... I guess I can call write, I guess. And then... Let writer is equal to print serial writer. This will be crate... Takes a mute. Uh, get a serial writer. And this will be get a lock on the print stuff. Just gonna look at that. We'll say lock. Okay, and then this takes a writer. Uh, oh yeah, use core format, right. Oh, we did it. Writer. Oops, right, writer. Right to the writer. And then, Put all this in a scope so that that lock gets dropped. Then we do our panic print, and this will be a print information about the panic. Oops. Right. And this should now work. Uh, Let this is equal to this. Doesn't matter. Our writes can't fail. There we go. So now you won't have any interleaving. Yeah, the panic message will always be very clear. Nice. Interesting. So we can get a panic before all the cores are online, which is fair. And then I'm guessing the BSP getting a nit is is where it's danger noodle. So okay, nice. So now there are two. How many locks do we use in lock no preempt? So. Um, oh, new, no, preempt. The serial lock we use, the trampoline page shield print lock, the APIC, the interrupts. Use all those in the locks. We'll never really have those locks open. It's really just the serial. It's if we, if we get an exception or a panic while printing, but I think that's relatively unlikely. 
all the other locks will pretty much never be held. Um, card to run. And this is behaving correctly, I think. Yeah, we're able to soft reboot this kind of indefinitely. We're not waiting for all the cores, and it seems to work just fine. So I don't think we're running into any issues here. Um, and then this is, we no longer enable those interrupts if the core ID is zero. So only allow soft reboots from core zero. And if that means, if the problem is if core zero deadlocks, if another core panics while holding a lock that core zero needs, which is really only, the only locks, okay. Um, carry run. The only locks that they share are, I guess these four are all shared. Trampoline page table, no one's using that. Soft reboot address, no one's using that. So those two are pretty much exclusive, only used by soft reboot. Print lock and serial are the only other two. The APIC and interrupts are local to the current core. So the, the BSP will still be running and handling um, soft reboots in that situation. So if, if we were to have another core panic, while it was holding its own APIC or interrupts lock, it doesn't affect us because we're gonna be able to get access to our APIC. What matters is if we get an exception, if we get an exception or a panic while we hold any of these on our own core or any of these on any core. And this will never be used on any core, this will never be used on any core. It's just the print lock and serial, to be honest. Um. So, what I might want to do, I think this is what I'm going to do. If let's sum lock, okay, first we're going to we're going to write a we're going to write a, an example of something that does not work, that catastrophically fails. So, we're going to grab the serial lock and then we're going to panic on core 0. Okay, so this will deadlock. This will be a real deadlock. And deadlock detected. I can still attempt soft reboots. Wait, what? At 125? On lock cell? Wait. We gotta do this. Track caller. Track caller. Oh, I bet that won't work. I wonder if that works nested, the track caller, track caller. Let's see if this works. Yeah, it does. Nice. Because the panic actually occurs inside of try, but this is showing me the caller of main 50. Okay, I'm going to be using that track caller a lot. <laughs> 50 here. I can't get my own APIC. I'm really surprised because here, oh, that's on the soft reboot address. Yeah, let's do this on serial. See what we can get here. Boop. Okay, yep, that's deadlocked. Good, that's what I expected. So what I think I'll do is I think any of the prints, I think all prints are going to be Um, I'm going to do this, try print, this, assert that we are not, um, core interrupt. Disable outstanding. I think I have a way, I have interrupt depth here. What I think I wanna do is I wanna panic if you ever try to print. Or honestly, I'll go all the way to write. No, we gotta print. If, 
There are, and this has, where's the depth? No, depth. Dot count is equal to zero. Mm. I think I have, I think I have an accessor of that. It's just unsafe. Nice. If the interrupt depth count, uh, actually here we can say, we can do it here safely. Pub fn, pub fn in interrupt self bool unsafe self dot interrupt depth dot, uh, actually we can just do self dot interrupt depth that count greater than zero. Okay. And then here I can say if assert that we are not in an interrupt before we take the lock. Uh, I guess panics are similar to interrupts. No, they aren't. Ah, uh, they kind of are. Yeah, I guess panics are similar to interrupts because we don't have unaligned. Really what we need is unwind. I actually, I don't know how hard unwind would be to implement, but if we could have unwind in our kernel where we could just actually go up the stack and drop all the locks in a clean way, that would be pretty nuts. Um, if, assert that we're not in an interrupt. Okay, so this, that still deadlocks. And let's do this. This panic will succeed because that's not an interrupt. Oh. Panicked on other cores. So the other cores are printing in an interrupt. Shift Z. I actually don't know what the other cores in that case were printing for, unless they had a fault. Um, I guess that assertion will deadlock us, kind of. What what I want to what I want to do is I want to implement a way of shattering the print lock, but only in panics. Here's what I'm going to do. We're going to have print panic. Panic will not use print. We do not want to print in an interrupt ever. So we'll just say that printing in an interrupt is not allowed. Oh, then I do want that. Uh, if we ever attempt to print while in an interrupt, Sorry, what are you doing? So that will prevent us from printing in an interrupt. Then, and that's just to prevent deadlocks. So someone can manually instantiate a serial writer and print in an interrupt. But if you're doing that, you will only cause a deadlock. You won't actually cause unsafety. So I'm fine with that. I'm fine with just having the checks on these paths. So in this case, assert that we're not in an interrupt. And we'll say, um... Uh, prints are not allowed in interrupts. And I guess the print locked, the print lock will never actually have, except for an exception. So I'll have panic. So let's make an exception work. Let's, uh, let's make it so that we can, we're going to grab a serial lock. And then we're going to, or we're going to grab a print lock for now. So not the serial lock yet. We'll grab the print lock. The serial lock is going to be pretty, pretty rare. I think we called it print lock. Okay. So we're going to grab, grab the print lock, and then we're going to cause an exception. And this will deadlock. Perfect. So now what I want to do is when we come into our interrupt handler, 
I want to make this a panic. So on a fatal exception, we're going to panic this message. And that will go into the panic handler. And pa this won't cause print. This will cause panic. And panic will get its own serial writer um, and attempt to write out. And it, it will get this print lock, and that'll fail. OK. So we still have a deadlock. Now what we're going to do is we're going to do try lock. And we'll try uh, we'll try we'll try a thousand times to get the lock, which is not too much, but we'll just try. Okay. Okay, let me just get rid of this lock. I shouldn't have the serial lock. Let's try this. There's the exception. Try lock a thousand. Does my try lock not work? Let's, let's just put a one in here. I think try lock's not working right now. Unless the lock's that slow, but it's not. Okay, so we'll go into lock cell try lock attempts as mute decrement that. Otherwise, if the attempts is zero. Is that else if hurting me? No, I don't think so. Trying to get the lock, decrement it. Am I not decrementing that correctly? Does map? Map doesn't do, oh, map doesn't do anything. Um, uh, what, what is the thing that you have to do to apply something to a variable? Um, it's not map. Um. Oh, let's see. I think they added one, right? They added a map where... Then copied, cloned, expect none. Oh, these are new coming through. Expect none and unwrap none. Okay. Oh, those are nice. Then you won't have uh, unwrap, or you won't have like assert is none or something all over the place. That'll actually be pretty nice. Okay. How the fuck do you do this? I mean, I can just map and reassign it. We can do this. Uh, and then this is an else if. That, minus one. Okay, let's see what we got here. Can you open your task manager? I'm I'm on uh I'm not on Windows. Okay. Why is that not working? Are we partnering now? Not yet. I still will have to make that application and stuff. But I we have we actually have to do like two more streams, I think. I don't think it counts when you straddle two days. So we've only been getting credit for like one day, even though we're straddling two days. Um, what am I doing here? Why is that not working? Attempts is equal to attempts.map x minus one. If attempts is zero, return none. Why is, why is that not working? Why would that not work? Let's see this, if it's some zero. I'm so confused. What the fuck? What? What? 
if I if I send sum zero, how much RAM do you have? 64 gigs. Attempts is attempts is we literally pass it sum zero. Is that panicking? No, print lock disables interrupts. This is the only thing I could think of. What the fuck? The mind boggles. How is that not returning? Write doesn't grab a print lock. We don't have the serial port locked. We have the print lock. Cause a panic. Then we get to here. Print lock. Print lock is no preempt, so that'll pass. That'll pass this check. And then... Oh my god, this is some... This is some Confucius stuff going on. Print lock, that. Try lock. We're getting close. We're getting close to right Nick Dev. I really want to be done with this stuff too. <laughs> this is just the this is just the tedium. So a lot of kernels don't have these problems. And the reason why a lot of kernels don't have these problems is they just don't care. They just say if you deadlock, fuck you. Bye. And we're trying to make it so we can, we can do things that are really bad for the system. And we want to make sure that this survives. So we're trying to make this incredibly bulletproof. Such that even in like the craziest panic deadlock race condition printing while panicking on another core that's panicking with the print lock held. I want to still be able to get print messages. What's my GPU? I've got two 1080s in SLI. On a Linux machine, so it's pointless. <laughs> um, I don't really care about desktops. I just put 64 gigs RAM in all my desktops. <clears throat> That's like my bare minimum for a... Uh, what's my power supply wattage? I have no idea. Probably like a thousand. Is it like power supply doesn't really matter. I'm probably not running more than 400 or 500 watts on this PICU. Okay, so are we getting to this stage? How do I know if I'm getting here? Uh, I don't. I don't know if I'm getting here. No, we do, because if I get rid of this, we know we're getting here. Yeah, so, uh, we grab that lock. Why, why is sum zero not equal, why is sum zero not equal to sum zero? Am I going fucking crazy? Let's add it, let's add it here. Okay. Unless we're panicking there, but this disables interrupts. So we should be passing that. Yeah. This enter lock, that should be. F That's fine. Okay. Then I put it in a loop. That works. If I put it on a after compare and swap, that works. Oh, are we taking the deadlock? Oh yeah, because we're hitting deadlock detect. I'm being stupid. Uh, else if, uh, I guess on try lock, I will disable the deadlock detection. Okay, that was pretty obvious what that was. Okay. 
Um, so I think what we're gonna do is if, if attempts is sum and that. So uh, only perform deadlock detection on um, non-try based locks, okay? That way we don't end up panicking at panic. And then in this, else if attempts is equal to sum zero, return none, uh, ran out of attempts, uh, return failed to lock. Okay. Now this will return. Really? Oh, is none. If attempts is none and we have a deadlock. Okay, so this will now, boop. Okay, so this will ignore this lock. So this will uh, attempt to get the print lock, which makes the output not interleave with other cores. However, if we cannot get this lock, we just carry on. Worst case, we just get a bit of uh, interleaving on the output. Right? That sounds fair. 10,000? I don't know how much that is. It's probably instant in quotes. I mean, honestly, we might just might as well just do zero and just say, if, if you can't immediately get it, don't even wait for it. Okay, because that lock doesn't matter. Oops, that lock is just so unimportant. Um, it's just it's just for making sure everything's not interleaved. Okay, so then if I were to do a print, now I can try and do a print, foop, inside of an exception handler, and this should get really mad at me. Yes! Oh, deadlock detected. 245. Really? Oh, we got rid of the assert. Assert that core in interrupt. Assert we're not in an interrupt. We keep adding and removing this, but we'll just keep it and we'll say um, print not allowed in interrupts. Use try print. Uh, and then the serial port, okay, yep, print not allowed in interrupts, use try print. And then here we can make try print, which will make a serial writer. We'll say, if let sum lock, uh, actually try print, we'll just try lock, sum zero, and that'll just ignore interleaving. Um, use try print. We'll fully format that. So this will fail. Print not allowed in interrupts. Use try print. And then this is going to try lock. Um, allow one attempt for getting the print lock. The print lock is only needed to stop interleaving of prints. It's not critical at all, thus we can simply ignore not having the lock if we cannot get it. Okay. So if we can't get that lock, there we go, and then that means we can change this to a try print, and we'll do this, boop. Okay, so that'll print, and it will fail open. So at this point, we cannot grab the print lock in a panic, unless you explicitly grab it, in which case I'm okay with you getting fucked over by there. If you use the print macro, it'll let you know, do not do that, in a way that doesn't fail. Um, honestly, I, yeah, I could, yeah, I think I want this to block. I could have it say, if you're in an interrupt, automatically do try print. Do try lock automatically, maybe? And then you just don't have to know that. Yeah, why not? Let lock is equal to if core in interrupt 
else. Um, panics will be separate from interrupts. If we're in an interrupt, we will use try print. Well, I actually kind of want like an in exception. Do you use tmux? I do not. Never been the hugest fan of those style tools. I've just never had a need for like screen or tmux. Um. I think I might change this to not be in interrupt, but in exception. And then I think I might have on the fatal path, the unhandled path, I think I'll say in exception. I'll set in exception. At that point, the core is going down catastrophically. And all of these, it's returning back to execution. And the handler is unsafe. Thus, the handler is responsible to make sure if it returns success that it was handled. Um, increments, the interrupt depth here, grab lock, uh, grab the dispatch, get the handler out of the interrupt table, just in one go. Then we call the handler. Um, technically that's kind of racy because they could remove it on, an, uh, not really, not on one core because that's a core local. So... We have to execute through here. We go into handler. Okay, yeah, I'm fine with this. So that's gonna panic. There we have try print, and then here we can say we can get the lock, and we'll do in exception. Um, blah 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 blah. Let lock is equal to this. And we'll say if in exception. If we're in an exception, try lock sum zero. So in this case, that doesn't exist. Um, and yeah, that's in core locals. We'll do in exception is an atomic bool. Uh, tracks if we're in an unhandled exception. Uh, fatal exception. We'll say that. Fatal exception. Okay, tracks if we're in an unhandled unhandled exception. These will always result in a full panic and disablement of the core. This can be used to uh, know if you're running in a context that will never return back to normalcy. <laughs> return back <laughs> uh, to execution. Um, okay. This can be used to know if you're running in a context that will never return back to execution. And I don't think Rust has unsafe fields yet. Do they? Yeah, you can't do unsafe fields yet. I really wish Rust had unsafe fields. That would be really cool. Um, pub fn fatal exception self bool self .fatal exception uh, load ordering sequentially consistent pub unsafe fn set fatal exception self and this will do store true oops all the way Okay, then here, uh, fiddle exception missing, uh-huh, exception, fiddle exception, atomic bool, new, false, starts out as false, oh, and that, we need a semi, yep, uh, Accept shin. Okay, and we'll grab atomic bool. We did it. So this, um, 
if we add a print and interrupts, this will deadlock right now. Uh, whoops. Uh, print. Whoop. This should not print, and we should deadlock. Uh, print not allowed in interrupts. Yeah, we still have that assert. Get rid of this. If we're in a fatal exception, try lock. Otherwise, grab the lock. Okay, so this will deadlock. Deadlock detected. Beautiful. Oh, yeah, and we can, we can get the deadlock prints now. Oh, fuck yeah. Now things get interleaved. When we're panicking, things will start getting interleaved because we're going to try print stuff. But now what I can do is I can say if if we're in fatal exception, otherwise if we're not in fatal exception, then we're going to go into interrupts here. Uh oops. At this point the interrupt is fatal, unhandled and we will not return back to execution. Uh, set in the core, uh, we'll say, yeah, set in the core structure that we were in an exception uh, for code which may execute during an exception. It is critical. Um, actually, I might have exception handlers. I might say an exception is different than an interrupt. Uh, and to do that, we'll do this. We're going to say this. Increment the interrupt depth. Here we're going to um, set if we're in an exception. If number is less than, or is less than 32, um, core set exception. Uh, whatever I called it. I didn't call it that. I know I didn't. Set fatal exception. Oh, we'll just set exception. Here we'll say in exception. Exception. Uh, fatal. This is now exception. Tracks if we're in... Uh, tracks if we're in an exception handler. Exception handlers are unique as the locks may be deadlocking as opposed to a normal interrupt which will never occur while a new no preempt while a yeah while a while a no preempt um, as opposed to a normal interrupt, which will never occur while a no preempt lock is held. This can be used to alert code to, uh, that may run during an exception to relax, uh, relax requirements on locks or potentially, uh, to alert code that may run during an exception to use try lock instead instead of a non instead of a blocking lock and we can enforce this fuck yeah these locks are getting so good we're going to do this here we're going to assert that if you have if you're not using try lock and you're in an exception bye bye so this will say, um, in exception. And that we need to do the same thing. Exception depth dot count. Fuck yeah! Interrupt depth. Uh, we'll change this. This will be an exception depth. Current level of exception on every exception entry. And document on every exception return. Here we're going to uh, print this. Um, and we'll say 
exceptions are unique in that they may occur while a lock is held. Um, while a uh, no preempt lock is held. Code which may run during an exception must be sensitive to uh, must be sensitive to this fact and should not use uh, and should not use uh, blocking lock operations. Okay, exception depth because we will have we'll likely have nested exceptions in this OS and we'll get to that an uh, exception if the exception depth Oh, uh, then here, an exception will just be this code, and we'll have the same thing here. S interrupt exception G. So we'll get a reference to that. Um, oh, you know what? We're going to change this a, a squidge, a, squ a squeege, a, a smidge. This will give an auto atomic ref card. Whoops. Guard. And this will do increment. And this will be enter exception. Uh, begin exception. Enter. Yeah. Enter interrupt. Guard. Increment. So that returns a guard structure. When that guard is released, we are no longer in that state. Okay, sweet. Interrupt depth, uh, 232. Increment, that's there. Set exception on 236 on interrupts. Yep, so if that exception is equal to sum core enter exception else none and that'll be held around that will be that guard will be held which means it'll get dropped when we return out of the exception handler so uh, we don't have to track we don't have to decrement that ref count in every single return path we use the scoping and the drop handlers in, of rust uh, to do that for us um, I gotta manage my tibia character quick but enter exception and this will be enter interrupt Um, and this will be uh, exception uh, ref, and this will be interrupt ref, and those will get automatically dropped when they go out of scope. Now, I might need to make that, hmm. I guess if we're panicking, I don't need it to go out of scope. It'll only go out of scope when we return the only place where we return is if we have a handled exception. Okay. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Nice. So we grab that ref count. We grab this. Set, um, increment the exception ref count if this was an exception and not an interrupt. In that case, decrement that counts. Say that we're in an exception, and now we can add another check to our lock, which will be an exception, which will then get fussy. Um, let's see. Oh. Okay. I'm trying to get my characters in the right spot. All right, this should do. Okay, this, 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 this. Okay. Okay, should be good. All right, um, okay, so we increment the exception ref count if there's an exception and not an interrupt. The interrupt ref count we always increment because we're technically in an interrupt. 
And then that, get rid of the semi. Okay, now I can get rid of this fatal exception shit here. In exception. If we're in an exception, we're gonna try lock. I'm actually not gonna do that yet. Uh, we're just gonna say if false. If false, in exception, is not a member of that. Okay. Where are we using that code? Core local 60. I have a bad habit of not reading the... Um... Oh, in exception. Oh, that's for the trait. Uh, 37, exception depth, private field. Oh, that's in main. Interrupt depth dot count. We can get rid of that. That doesn't matter. Okay. 226. The core locals. Uh, we have an exception depth. Oh, exception and interrupt are the same length. That's kind of kind of nifty, actually. I like that. I like when my columns line up. Okay, so now interrupts doesn't have that, so we're gonna have, um, or lock cell doesn't have that. This is going to have set to shoot if we're currently in an exception, uh, which indicates that a lock uh, cannot be held, as we may have preempted a non-preemptible lock. Okay, an exception. Now, what I can do is down here, I can assert that either attempts is sum or uh, we're not in an exception. Um, attempted to take a, ugh, attempted to take a, um, Blocking lock while in an exception. And this will uh, make sure that there are no uses of blocking locks in exception handlers. All right. So if attempts is sum, which means we have a timeout, or we are not in an exception, then we can continue on. Otherwise, we have a problem. Now we can go into the bootloader. We can modify that trait, whatever implements the trait, and make sure that returns a dummy. In this case, in exception is false. Um, just thinking about this section of interrupt handling has given me PTSD from bad driver PRs that Linux would constantly complain, uh, warn scheduling while atomic. Yeah, we're trying to make this as bulletproof as possible. So these assertions here, are very interesting in that if you say that a lock is never used during an interrupt and you use the lock during an interrupt, you'll get a panic. You won't get a panic on the deadlock. You won't get a panic on a race condition that might happen one in a million times. You will just fundamentally, unconditionally get a lock because it's like, hey, you told me you would never use this during an interrupt, so I haven't set this up to survive interrupts, and thus, you did something wrong. So now we will fail very catastrophically even if you attempt to get the lock. Even if the lock would succeed, even if there's no deadlock or no race or no core is even remotely close to taking lock, it'll still fail because you told it different than what, uh, what the lock is designed to do. It fails very close, and I love that. And this is the same thing. Uh, if you're in an exception ever, in an exception handler, and you... Um, and you're using a blocking lock, something that could infinitely deadlock, this will prevent you from doing it. This means that is it is impossible to deadlock, with the exception of the serial lock, and we'll, we'll get to that. At this point, it is impossible to deadlock ever in this system. If you get a deadlock, it'll print a message, or you could get a deadlock due to preemption due to an exception, which we couldn't block the interrupts of, and thus 
the lock is held when the exception happens, in which case we will yell at you for using a blocking lock operation. So it requires that you implement your code using try lock. And your try lock code could panic in a much cleaner way uh, than the deadlock detection or something if we can't get the lock. And that means that basically any anything that any code that executes during an exception has to be able to fallibly uh, or has to be able to continue execution or has to be able to deal with the fact that the lock may fail to be obtained. Isn't that fucking cool? We're, inf we're enforcing this stuff real good. Reminds me of how locking is handled in pro Plan 9. I appreciate your uh, brutalist philosophy. Yeah. I just want things to fail regardless of races. So if a race could occur, I want it to fail. I like that emote, ELA. Who's ELA? Who is that? Is that a is that a global emote or is that a streamer? Streamer. I think that's a streamer. <clears throat> What's he known for? What does he stream or she or they? I spent too much time doing panic formatting. Oh my god, did you make it work? Ma my panic. <laughs> I see. I see. I see. Oh, I see. But you need you need an output buffer. You're, yeah, you store to a buffer, right? One of the best Dark Souls speedrunners out there. Oh, shit. Oh, you don't need the buffer. Oh, the buffer is just for the attempt. Okay, yeah, yeah. In here, so what you do is you implement, uh, you got cursor, and cursor allows you to write. write. You have write implemented for cursor. You have display implemented for mepanic, and mepanic is a wrapper that will perform write. Ah, so this will create a formatter. I see, I see. So basically, this will combine all of these into one formatter result. Well, not format result, but it'll write to the same formatter. And then that's just a wrapper on panic that implements display. And then on here, OK, shit. I think I, I think I might just stick with my way. I don't know. Your way is like, your way does allow me to use my try print macro, which is a little bit more, uh, uh, decreases code duplication, which I like. It, it means more things will use kind of the same generic thing and we can fix and change semantics in one place. Okay, we're not in an exception uh, temporarily. Okay, and then we got GS base there, and then here we have in exception. Oh, we do that. And here we can do if in exception. Same thing here. In interrupt. I'll probably make these one liners, but this should now work. Um deadlock detect ooh, deadlock detected. This is at interrupts. Ooh, kind of hard to say. Let's get a better uh, RNG output here. Okay. Um, because this should be broken, right? That's what I want. I want this to be broken. Um, I grab the print lock. I then cause an exception, and then that exception occurs, and then print. I think I have a print in here, right? When the exception occurs, I think I print. I print whoop. So what I want to happen is I want this to then call lock. If false, it'll do this. It'll call lock. And then I want that to cause a panic. That's what I want. 
and that's not what I'm getting. Let's see if I can panic right now. Um. Oh, you know what? I feel like I don't know how ifs work. These are semis. It's releasing the lock. Okay. So then it never... Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, and then in this case, we can wrap this in a sum. Okay. This hopefully will panic. Okay. It is deadlocked. Um. Can I can I panic right now? Why can I not panic? Cause I'm. Is it cause this panics? Cause I'm panicking on a panic. This. But I should be able to avoid that. In this case. So this is what's killing us, is this check. Assert that attempts is sum, or we're in an exception, or we're not in an exception. And this works, okay, so that means this. This means we're in an exception. If attempts is sum, or we're not an exception. So this is saying that we're in an exception and then we're acquiring a lock. There is some lock that we're holding in the panic routine. Oh, that's for the, this, this lock. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Map X, see? It's working. Um, X dot dispatch, get the handler. If we could not get the lock, uh, and then here we'll say some try, try, well, in this case it doesn't matter because it's a local lock. If we can't get the lock, we can't get the lock. And then here we'll get dispatch off of That'll give us a lock cell guard. Option interrupts. Um, wait. What was this before? It was X dot unwrap. Oh, yeah, 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 because that, um, and then x dot dispatch um as ref okay get that ref it wait a minute is it just this one that needs it i gotta i probably should think about okay so uh, attempt to get the um, dispatch handler for this exception. If we cannot get the lock on the interrupt structure, then we cannot call the dispatch routine. Okay, so we try to get that lock. And now the question is, why couldn't we get... Why couldn't I get a panic in that state? Um, and we're still having issues. Let's do a print here. There, there's two. There's two nested uh, options. The field is optional, or the interrupt structure is optional, and the lock succeeding is optional. Okay, so we have something else that's killing us. Panic, woo. All right, let's try panic, woo. Use flatten? What the fuck is flatten? Oh, so we got woo, okay. I see. 
Oh, that's that just came out. That's super new. Does that work for an arbitrary level? So is flatten the way to go now? I mean, wait. But but it's I mean, I can do map. I can I, I I still have to be able to access this safely. I can't flatten. There's nothing I can flatten. We've got a none of um oh you mean flatten here? And then I'm gonna have to xref that. That'll flatten uh I might have to azref that. So we get azref on, yeah. It's not, it's just not the right shape. It's not exactly the right shape. I do understand where I can use flatten and th this is not that particular case, unfortunately. Okay, so let's see what we get. We got a panic, woo! Okay, let's see if we make it past here. We should. Okay, woo. So we can now get past that, and then why can't we get here? I can panic woo, right? Um. Ric Flair, woo! Also, maybe if Riot used SGX, then their anti-cheat would be interesting enough to hack. Yeah, that's pretty fair. Oh, I, re I realize you're the same person who wrote the Android fuzzing tutorial. I definitely remember reading that on my journey to writing my first USB control message fuzzer. Oh, hell yeah. SGX is not really broken with speculative execution. I mean, the concept of not being able to leak things out is kind of broken, given your processor is not up to date. But you can require, before you let your Enclave run, you can require microcode is up to date. So someone would have to use an ODE against your program to even get the code. And then at that point, they can only leak. You can't, you can't really influence it. But you can easily make an enclave that requires latest microcode and just say, sorry, if you have old microcode, you can't use this at all, flat out. And then at that point, you need a CPU O'Day. And at this point, there's really no speculative execution bugs that can't be mitigated. <laughs> you can require no hyper-threading enabled. You can require um, latest microcode, and at that stage, there really aren't any more CPU bugs that we know of, and there's very limited surface for there to be more CPU bugs, if, if they exist at all. There's very, there's very little that could be done there. So, I, I still think SGX works fine. You just have to restrict users, and gaming companies cannot do that, because they can't, Gaming companies need to be able to have people run their code on potatoes and old shit that's not updated. They're still releasing 32-bit games for God knows what fucking reason. Because I haven't owned a 32-bit processor in the past decade and a half. <clears throat> Shattering my hopes of fucking up SGX. Yeah, it, ju it just comes down to being able to restrict the environment to latest microcode and disable hyperthreading. But at that point, you can only really leak things, which is kind of interesting. But like with, I, I think the, the biggest impact of side channels is potentially allowing access to the binary. And once you have access to the binary, you could probably find a bug in how it handles uh, syscalls or how it handles external data that it gets, right? So, 
Difference uh, consumer may notice in the 32 and 64-bit game? Well, 32-bit games are limited to using 2 gigs of memory, which in this day and age is almost no RAM at all. Um, so ga games that are like RAM heavy or have long load times uh, end up hitting disk for pretty much the entire time. Well, obviously it's hitting RAM on the kernel side of things because it's cached, but uh, you still pay that penalty. Um, just not having 64-bit kind of sucks. That reduced address space really decreases some of the some of the things you can do. They can only use two gigs of RAM. Can't use four gigs of RAM. So it's based on how the kernel is designed. Some will allow three gigs of RAM depending on the kernel, but they won't be able to use four gigs of RAM. I guess actually a 32-bit app might be able to do it. Yeah, large address space aware, yeah. But at that point, you're still, like, 4 gigs is still small, in my opinion. Um, okay, what was, I, what was I doing here? So I'm getting, I'm trying to panic, and for some reason my panic is then deadlocking, which makes no sense. That try locks. That try locks, and then that means that the serial port is open. Really? I think the serial port is the only possible thing that could potentially cause us issues. I'm rather confused. Try lock comes zero. Let's see. If I don't... Um... If I can't get the print lock, I can ignore it. There's panic. Panic will go into here. How is this deadlocking, question mark? Let's get rid of the timer. Let's not enable the APIC timer and we'll not bring up other cores. We'll be single core for now. So I think, I think this issue will still show up. It does, perfect, okay. So that means I can rule out all other cores being a problem. I can rule out actual interrupts. We grab the print lock, we then write. That causes a fault. That causes us to get ex uh, execution here. That'll enable, that'll set that we're in an interrupt. We'll set that we're in an exception. This, what I should be able to panic at this stage. Panic, whoa! And I don't think I can for some reason. I cannot. Okay. So, what does that mean? What if I don't grab this lock at all? Okay, I won't grab the lock. We'll panic. Okay. So then I'm failing to get the serial lock. Well, what if I get rid of this? Who has the serial lock open? No one. Um, right, we'll call right. That'll get the serial lock. Have you checked microformat? What is microformat? I haven't seen that. Um, let's see, why, why is that, why is that deadlocking? Where is that possibly deadlocking? Okay, um, I can pull up HTOP on another monitor, and I can see if I'm at 100% CPU usage. If I am, if I'm at 100% CPU usage, then I know, and I am, okay. So this is how we're gonna debug today. Reset, okay. So I can do a CPU halt here. Okay, and now let's see if this has 100% CPU usage. It does not. Okay, that means we're getting execution to that stage. <laughs> Are we getting to here? 
That's how we debug here. Okay, uh, we're at 100%. Oh, fuck, because these locks need to be tri lock. And we can't, we can't panic because those are fatal. Those locks are fatal. So if we were able to get the lock, uh, and this is a sum sum. Somebody once told me we've got some nested options. Can I do as mute on the outside? No. Fuck, how do I as mute the internal side? Ref mute binding? So, try lock's gonna return an option. That'll be whether we got the lock. Does this mean serial writer may fail? Yes. We're, we're gonna change this, right? But we're gonna change this stuff. But yes, right now. Um, expected lock cell guard. Found enum option. Ooh. Okay, if we do this, this is, that's the ref cell guard. And then we don't have right on lock cell guard option. Found enum option. Oh. I have to, well, well, as mute that on the outside option. No, that's not gonna work. Fuck, wouldn't that? That is an option of whether we got the lock. Is there no good way to flatten that? I, I know I can map it, but I think this is cleaner. Try lock sum zero. Okay, and then four, or if let sum serial is equal to serial dot as mute. So that's for the serial driver. Um, uh, we can do ref mute syntax here, I think. That's the lock cell guard. What the fuck? Oh, mute serial on that line. Okay, yeah, I missed the line then. I was about to say, that made no sense. Thank you. I often don't read the compiler output. You may have noticed this. Okay, uh, attempted to take a lock, a blocking lock while in an exception. Okay. Why is that happening in a loop? Serial, that does serial. Okay, so that's not a blocking lock. So now I can get that message. So in the interrupts, I don't know why that's looping though. Why would that be looping? So that'll attempt to get the lock and then if it could get the lock, it'll write the bytes. Panic, whoa. Um. And that's the interrupt handler. Okay, well, where's the failure? Luckily, it tells us. 32.16 in main. Oh, that's going to be, um, uh, that's going to be, yeah. Uh-huh, and the attempt soft reboot. Okay. Try lock. Um. Psalm zero. And this is in a loop. So that's fine. We will try to get the lock. Um, and then here we'll map it. X unwrap read byte. Mm. Sum. Wait a minute. The fuck? So that's an option. Serial port is an option. Read byte is also an option. 
So this is option byte. Yeah. Uh huh. Oh. Um. We gotta as wrap that. No. What the fuck? Oh yeah. Uh, as mute on that one. That's what I think I had before. And then mute x on this. Okay. We're struggling. And then if some sum that. And here we can flatten this. That one we can flatten. We can say if sum z byte. There's your, there's your flat. Okay. Whoa. So in this case, we got a panic. We got whoa. Shift z. That's going to fail. But... Um, but we were able to get that message, which is great. That's fantastic. So if we cannot get access to the serial port, then we're not going to be able to check that byte. And then, what's up, jump out? How's it going? Okay, so now let's add a print to here to our exception handler. We're gonna add a print. Yeah, there we go. Print, whoop. Here we go, print. Uh, I feel like that did not build and run. I got rid of the, oh, there's a whoa up here, okay. Okay, here we go. We got a whoop, and this should say, attempted to take a blocking lock while in an exception, and that is at 259. So, yep, and that's because that's trying to take a blocking lock. So in this case, if we are in an exception, then attempt to take the lock. Otherwise, just uh, blockingly take the lock. Then, this will now succeed. There's our interrupt. There's our exception. Fuck yeah. So if we're in an exception, we will attempt to take the print lock. And the print lock doesn't matter, right? Print lock is not critical. It's only used to prevent uh, overlapping writes. Thus, if we're in an exception, and thus we got preempted potentially during an interrupt, um, potentially during having the lock held, uh, um, we can ignore if we will only attempt to get the lock. Okay, so this is a pretty catastrophic environment. Uh, I'm taking the print lock down here. I take the print lock and then I write to memory and then we're still able to get our trace and whoop works. We're able to do that print. Fucking nice. Uh, get rid of the whoop print. So that's going to panic. That'll panic because we unhandle uh, the interrupts not handled. Enter an interrupt. Enter an exception if, an ex if it's an exception. Okay. And then we get that message, even though we have the print lock held. Now, with the serial lock, we won't be able to do that. Um, this will still deadlock. Or this won't, this won't deadlock but it won't print to the screen, and we can't control Z it. So this is now the hard part. So let's try, let's, um, let's do the print lock one. That's gonna cause us to panic. That core is then sleeping. If I uh, Z, if I try and Z it, let's see, reboot. If I Z it, we get uh, attempted to take a blocking lock while in an exception. So at this point, our panic handler, which only acquires the lock on print optionally or serial optionally, uh, the panic handler should always be able to work. Um, now, what that means is we can go into 49 on main. This is here. Uh, try lock and soft reboot. Well, at this stage, we could actually shatter these locks. But let's try lock, unwrap. Okay. Uh, and this will just go down the list. Z, 
54, 23. Yep. Uh, try lock. So you just can never use, you can never use a lock. Um, try lock. In any situation where you could ever potentially deadlock, we don't allow you. That's so fucking cool, man. Um, dot unwrap. Did I put the unwrap in the wrong spot? Or did I not add an unwrap 61? I think I put the unwrap in the wrong spot. Uh, try lock on the trampoline page table unwrap. Um, unknown field here. Soft reboot dot zero. That's the table. Try lock unwrap asref unwrap dot table. Oh, this one I fucked up. Double unwrap that bad boy. Okay, so now shift Z. There we go. We got a soft reboot. That means our whole soft reboot path. Wow. That is so cool. Um, okay, so that works now. So let's grab an APIC lock. And let's see what happens. We're going to grab a lock on our own APIC. We're going to lock that shit up. Uh, we're going to call it APIC. So now we have the print lock held. We have an APIC lock held. And we're going to cause a fatal exception. Shift Z. Fuck yeah. Unwrap failed. Here. And this is expect. Um, could not get access to APIC during soft uh, reboot. Physical reboot required. Bam! Let's add a fucking message. A nice ass message. Oh, and we can still print there. We're like panicking in the weirdest fucking places. Yeah! Woo! I guess you can keep reattempting. Fuck! It allows reattempting. Ah, uh, there's our double fault handler. This will allow us to triple fault eventually. Oh no, it'll keep resetting the double fault handler. So we're. We're recursing right now. When we run out of stack, we get a double fault. We get a new stack. Um, and then we're in this state again. We can actually keep retrying this. Obviously, you'll never get the APIC back because it's on your own core. But the APIC will almost never be held. Now, in this case, let's grab the soft reboot address. Fuck yeah. Fuck. We're making this so aggressive. We're testing all these locks. To see if we behave correctly, but we should. That failed because we had the APIC. So the first one, then we had the APIC lock. So this failed. Expect. Fuck yeah. Uh, failed to get access to the soft reboot address during a. Um, failed to get access to the soft reboot address during a uh, soft during a soft reboot, a physical reboot required. Okay. Yeah! Couldn't get access to the soft reboot address. Fuck yeah. Okay, and now we're gonna do expect, failed to get access to the trampoline CR3. Uh, and we'll do this during a soft uh, reboot, physical reboot required. So when we fail to do a soft reboot, we'll give you a nice little message letting you know we couldn't do it. All right. Z, yep. And that was the soft reboot address. Now we can grab the trampoline page table. So let's fucking grab this shit. Hell yeah, let's grab it. Let's go. Uh, couldn't get the trampoline CR3. Okay, and then if we get rid of this, this is back to normal. 
Oh, those messages are so good. Yeah, soft reboots. No problem. Let's bring up some cores. Let's bring up some timers. Let's just let's just start doing some stuff. So now everything. Uh okay, yeah, we got an exception. Oop, attempted to take a blocking lock while in an exception. Okay, cool. I didn't know that. Well, luckily, we know at 130 in APIC RS that we take a lock that can be hit, disable timer can be hit during an exception, and we need to try lock this sum zero. And then here we can say expect failed to get interrupt lock uh, to disable APIC timer. As mute, remove the handler. Okay, let's try it again. Uh, well, that just succeeds now. Oh, yeah, because while that wasn't a race condition, it could be, theoretically. So we force the developer to be able to handle the fact that it is possible that the lock can deadlock. This kernel, if I'm not mistaken, at this point, it is impossible for this kernel to deadlock. <clears throat> like a true no message deadlock. Obviously it can hit a deadlock condition. Uh, here I'll show that. So here's what happens if we cause an actual deadlock. We grab a lock twice. We get a message, deadlock detected at 126. We took a lock again. Now, we can only get a deadlock if we actually grab, if we grab a lock twice in the same code. The other situation where we can get a deadlock is if an interrupt occurs while a lock is held. To prevent that, any lock that can possibly ever be used during an interrupt gated by an assertion any interrupt that could ever be used during an exception uh, during an interrupt requires that interrupts are disabled. And that means it's impossible to have an interrupt come through that grabs the same lock that you have because by owning that lock, you have disabled interrupts provably for the lifetime of the lock. There's one final exception, which is actual exceptions, which may happen while you have a lock held. In that case, any code which may execute and grab a lock when an exception happens, must be able to, uh, must only use non-blocking lock attempts such that it can handle it and give a nice message itself. Um, do you think you can make two different types of lock guards shared and unique? One's read only and the other is read write. Um, uh, you mean like a like a read writer lock, like a standard read writer lock, where you can grab multiple read accesses to something, but only one write access? And that way, for all the things that I'm reading, yeah. Um, so read writer locks are actually. I've never been a huge fan of them because they require another lock in the lock. Um, you're forced to have like two spin locks to implement a read writer lock. However, um, I think for some of these structures, I think that will that'll improve our survivability for some things. Um, well, let's see. What would get a read only? So these would be read only locks. So these ones. No one's going to access these things, but in theory, they could. Um, actually, if someone's accessing these, it's mutably to uh, write them for the first time. The APIC lock does need to be mutable. And the reason for that is it's not safe to use the APIC if someone else is in the middle of using an APIC. Right? By, by forcing a real lock on that, it makes sure, in theory, right, in almost every condition, pretty much every time you ever use the APIC, it's safe to just use it. Um, because there isn't too much state, but there are some stateful uses of the APIC. Um, actually, is that true? Some you like latch in the high part and then the low part, but in the case of a fatal exception, in the case of a fatal exception, you can always reuse the APIC. 
Um, and then here we destroy the core locals. Here we unknit all of the cores. Destroying the core locals will disable... Um, uh, that'll disable the APIC timer because it will get deleted. And then we init all their cores to turn them off. And then soft reboot and jump back to that. Um, I'm trying to think if I have any read writer locks. So a lot of these things, right? <laughs> the only things that actually can be shared are boot args. Well... Arguably in the interrupt case. So in this case, this one probably could be relaxed to having read access to the APIC would allow you to modify the APIC. It's a little sketch. There are some situations where it's not correct, and that's why I'd say I don't think it's ever correct. These ones could absolutely be reads. Um, in fact, these could be put, instead of using a lock, we could actually put them in atomic U size. But I do like using a lock because then I can have them be a nun value. But that's really it. Um, the serial port has to be a real lock. The print has to be a real lock. So right now we don't have any read writer locks. So I think when we get to the point that we have a legitimate use of a read write lock, then I think we'll add that. We'll probably extend the lock to do that. But right now, we don't really have that, with the exception of those two fields, um, which I'm not, I don't think those are worth it because there's never going to be parallel accesses to that. Anyways, this is pretty bulletproof now. Um, okay. So. This means now, um, we'll put this on a new line. Drop that. That kills core. Okay, beautiful. Um, okay. I'm going to hit the head. I'll be right back. I got my uh, I got my happiness pop tart to celebrate. Oh yeah, this is so fucking cool, guys! Wow, what flavor? I think these are blueberry right now. Oh, delicious! Are are pop tarts a worldwide item? Or are they like a U.S. only thing? Or like U.S. EU? U.S. only? Oh my god. Uh oh. Pop the, uh, uh oh. U.S. only? 
Never seen a pop tart in Sweden. They're just so good, man. It's just a shitty pastry. It's a shitty pastry that reliably tastes the same. <laughs> it's illegal to put that much sugar in. There's no sugar in here. It's uh it's a uh, uh, it's mashed blueberries with health. It's good for you. It's good for you because it's a uh, fruit. There's fruit in here. <laughs> <laughs> the the <cocoonas. laughs> All right. Okay. So, I think we did it. I think the only thing that I might change is I might change it from Trilock where you give it a thing. And I might just have it. Just attempt the lock. We're going to do this. Um, try lock internal. And then this will have... Um, and this will be like lock internal. Non-public. Non-public. Um, try lock bool. And if it's a try lock, assert that it's a try lock or we're not in an exception. Okay. Now, attempts, get rid of this whole fucking concept. Um, if, if it is not a try lock and that, otherwise, if it is a try lock, then, uh, Could not get lock, return none, disable lock, okay, 133, so we have lock, and we have try lock, um, if the lock is already held, returns none, option, try lock, or lock int, lock internal, it is true. We're using this is a try. This is not using a try. This is a try lock here. Bam. Uh oops, lock internal. Technically I can use try lock. No, it can't. Try lock is false. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh int lock is false. Lock int. Okay, so uh, on a lock, we will not do a try lock and we'll unwrap and we'll return the guard. Otherwise, we will return an option uh, and lock int with true set, which is the try lock. Um, attempt to get exclusive access to the contained value. If try lock is set to true the uh lock is only attempted to be the lock is only attempted once and if it fails a none is returned if try lock is set to false the this will spin Forever, wait. Um, this will block forever until the lock is obtained. Okay, so if try lock, if try lock is set, or we're not in an exception, then we can continue at this stage. If we're not using try lock, then we want to do deadlock detection. If we are using try lock. Then, and we didn't get the lock at this point, then we want to return that we didn't get the lock. Okay. Sweet. Now we have to fix up all the users of it. Uh, but if you want to spin, I think spinning is going to be rare, so you might as well just spin in your own code. That's my 
view is if you want to handle multiple attempts of getting the lock, then you can do it yourself with your own loop. Okay. Try lock and then. Boom. We're getting there. Print. Try lock. Hey! Hey! All right, did we break it? Probably not. Okay, there we go. And there we get our exceptions. Wow, I like how the register states are identical on that reboot. Fuck yeah, that's the determinism that I was looking for. Oh yeah, it's the same register state every single time I boot. Fuck yeah. All the stacks, all everything's at the same spot. It's the opposite of Astler. Do nested track colors work as you expect them to work? Yes, they do. Trizzy with the sub. Fuck yeah. Thank you so much. Glad you're enjoying the party here. Where we write code all day. I think next stream is when I can apply to be a Twitch partner. So I'm going to have to make some emotes. I can't fucking wait to do that. <laughs> I don't know how many emote slots I get. But I don't care. Whatever it is, it's going to be fun. Are you partnered, Twizzy? Uh, Trizzy? Twizzy. <laughs> Five at the start. Nice. I've heard that Twitch actually has really good comms. And now I have to go to TwitchCon. I have to pretend like I'm a big-ass streamer. And I definitely need an ego of someone who has 50 million followers with my couple couple thousand followers. I think that's a really important aspect of becoming a beginner partner is making sure that my ego is through the fucking roof. <laughs> Five at the start, that's a lot of emotes and all the sub badges. And the sub there are so many sub badges. Because there's like six different sub badges for every tier of sub. Open a merch store. I, I think people would like my Falkervisor shirts. I made those way back in the day. I think it's one of the first things that shows up. Yeah, these guys. These shirts are sick. Super soft. Super good. Hell yeah. <laughs> Take the primes already. <laughs> I'll probably maybe I'll have someone make a logo for uh for this project, chocolate milk. I could probably go and contact the girl who made uh this. I saw a guy at a con uh, wearing that at a conference. Hell yeah. There are only like 40 of those out. Every single person who has one, I know quite well. Bang pal, thanks for the resub. Whoop, whoop. So I think you can find the creators through here. Yep, about the designer, Rachel S. So I could probably have her make a slight variance of the chocolate milk. Uh, for like a t-shirt or something. <laughs> Probably a couple hundred bucks. Like, who cares? I'm sure she'd be down. Oh my god, that Christmas tree. Oh, I guess this is her art. These are all the things that she has made. There's a waffle cone? Dude, I... I have a project called Waffle Cone. Like, explicitly waffle cone. Holy shit. <laughs> you just found your emote artist? Hell yeah. Dude, I need this. Oh my god, there's a waffle cone. Holy shit. There's a waffle cone. Holy shit. <laughs> oh, it's so good. <laughs> the 
They have different size ones. They have massive ones. These ones. <laughs> yeah, look at this shit. <laughs> it's as big as a fucking adult. <laughs> God. <laughs> yeah, I think that I think that's the right size. I think that's perfect. <laughs> oh my god, that a pineapple? The hamburger? <laughs> I have a small hamburger. Oh my god. I feel like the avocado is better than the pineapple. Pineapple is pretty good. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, that's so good. Oh my god. She makes all the good ones. Are those her designs? Are the all of these hers? I'm just going to click on a few. Yeah, holy shit. Yeah, she she's like the master of this shit. God damn. Imagine a sushi roll blanket. <laughs> you just get like a piece of seaweed. <laughs> it's like a fake seaweed. It could have like some rice. The inside could be like fluffy rice. And the outside could be like a seaweed. <laughs> You could probably represent rice in a, yeah, you could probably represent rice in like a, just little pockets. You'd put like, it'd be like a, a shaped cotton ball sewed in with like a fuzzy um, outside. That's totally doable. Be an interesting gift for people who love sushi. Yeah, it would. I think that'd be dope. God damn. <laughs> oh man. Okay. Don't forget to save her collection. Oh or save her contact. We'll have to get in contact with squishables, but I'm I'm sure I'm sure we can make that work. Be like, hey, I'll pay you to make a design. Feel free to use it for your company. We'll do like split rights or something, but I just need access for it. Putting up for a free project and for t-shirts. And we could probably make that work. She probably has a non-compete because she works there. So she probably couldn't do it on the side, but m maybe. I don't know. It, it's, it's hard to say. I might have to deal directly with um, Squishable for that. In before I get a lawsuit against me, because I use the Squishable logos for, like, all my YouTube videos. <laughs> okay. Um. Oh, yeah. I changed what I wanted to change. This is perfect now, isn't it? And this will be enable a pick timer. I have no idea what frequency I have that running at right now. I don't know about split rights. Yeah, that probably wouldn't work. Oh, yeah. Let's hold it. Let's hold Z. Let's see if it ever fails to soft reboot, and it doesn't look like it. And we can see sometimes only a couple cores come online. It seems pretty damn resilient. Yeah. Sometimes that R R10 register changes. I think it's safe to say that this works. When H pet, probably not doing the H pet. I'll probably only use the APIC timer. Uh, we probably should calibrate that right about now. We should calibrate the RDTSC and the APIC timer, and then we can, uh, then we can actually have time in seconds. So that'll be something we want to add. I'll, I can use the pit to program both of those. Um. 
you have the CPU ID 15 leaf, but it's kind of too bleeding edge. And I think it's Intel only. I don't know if I want to rely on that CPU ID yet. I think it's a little too risky for the biznu. So I, pro I probably won't end up doing that. But yeah, it, are there any circumstances where this doesn't work? Okay, let's panic on all the cores. Okay, will we be able to survive a panic on all the cores? Boop. Oh, yeah. Oh, easy. Oh, oh, fuck. Never mind, maybe not. Um. And why would that happen? Hmm. 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 Reset. This. Okay. Um. I, uh, mm. I know where this can happen. I know where, where this can happen. This can happen if one core comes online, grabs the print lock, the zeroth core grabs the print lock, it's blocking on the print lock, interrupts are disabled because the print lock is a preemptible lock, that then causes the timer to not come through, that means I don't get my interrupt for um, the soft reboot through. Totally real. Basically, if I am, if I'm waiting on another core, th these cores deadlock, right? They deadlock the print lock, so the print lock's fucked off. But. I'm now blocking on that, and my interrupt can't come through. I think, I think we might change the APIC timer interrupt. I think we might change this to be a non-maskable interrupt. And that will force that interrupt to always be able to come through, and it's effectively an exception at that phase. But... It means that it's a reliable, it, we get that interrupt always, regardless of if someone, regardless of if locks can be handled or not. And that's fine because all of our interrupt stuff handles locks. Um... I can't poison locks on cores that died without unwind. Or having a database of what locks they have held, which is pretty sophisticated. Um, I do have... I can. I can do it. I can do it. Um... For any shared lock, what I can do is when I get to the end of panic, right? Because those cores panicked, like this core one panicked. When I get to the halt part of panic, um, oh, I'm hitting uh, this. Since I do that in a loop, I need to do if core ID is zero. And then here we can do unsafe, do that. Anyways, um, what we can do, um, when I go to halt with interrupts disabled, which I, which will be the case at this stage, um, when I hit this panic. On core zero, we want to attempt soft reboots in a loop. On this core, 
what I could do is I could release the lock if my core holds it. Because we know I can basically say unsafe lock.release and then the core ID. And it will release the lock if that is the core that currently has the lock. Does that make sense? Because at this point, I'm about to halt. This core is donezo. So I could say, hey, since I'm done, um, release the lock. Uh, and here we'll do disable interrupts. Um, disable interrupts might be necessary if someone just straight panicked. Uh, disable interrupts and halt forever. So at this point, interrupts have been disabled. We're about to halt forever. So this should work. Uh, and we can't control Z here because here's what I can add is unsafe. Yeah, buddy. We'll have to have a database of all of the global locks. Um, so that guard still exists as the variable, but I can do this. Unsafe FN. Uh, unsafe function relinquish self releases a lock if the core if the calling core is the owner of the lock and this is unsafe um, this is to be used when a core is going to stop executing and can be used to uh, release the lock. Well, we can't necessarily do that. We can't necessarily do that because we don't know if we're returning, if we're f freeing the lock when the like internal part is in an initialized state or not. It is unsafe, so we can think about it. In the case of a print, we could be like mid print. I think actually serial is fine. I think serial actually is fine. Um, there's no internal representation of serial that would matter if we're in mid print. We might have just completed some in instructions. Maybe we just output to the data, but there's no latched state. You don't know the state in which you took the lock. But since this is unsafe, since relinquish is unsafe FN, I could use this on locks, on structures, which are guaranteed to always be in a valid state. Right, like there's no state of which releasing the lock is dangerous because the structure has like no intermediate temporary form, if that makes sense. And then that way I could actually use relinquish on it is risky. It it requires that you understand. Just relinquish all the core locals. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. So I mean, I think this is fair, right? If we currently are the core that's holding the lock, it's it's um can be used to release the lock. It is up to the caller to know a that the core will never access this uh uh the core will never access the um, lock cell guard, it was returned, and B, that's the structure being locked can never have an intermediate representation, which is, and B, that the structure being locked can never have an intermediate representation, uh, we're releasing uh, 
Yeah, is this what I want to say? Cole never accessed the Oxal Guard. It was returned. And B. Yeah. Can never have an invalid representation. For, e for example, a device which may be partially initialized when the lock is relinquished is undefined behavior, right? A, a device which may be partially initialized when the lock is relinquished is undefined behavior. I don't know if I'll ever be confident enough to use this. The serial port, that is true. Um, I don't know. Do I just make do I just make the timer interrupts NMIs? Because I think I can survive NMI based timer interrupts. Yeah, let's let's not do this. Um, I think what I'll do, so everything's in a try lock, right? And when I get, everything can fillably get to, um, attempt soft reboot, right? We can have an exception. Let, let's go through the whole path. So let's assume that every single lock on the system is held. Every single lock on the system is held and an exception occurs. An exception occurs. We enter interrupt. That's fine. We enter exception. That's fine. We attempt to get access to the interrupt handler table. We cannot because it's locked. So we don't call the interrupt handler. Then we panic. Panic will cause execution here to happen. We try to get access to, oh, uh, we can put this back in. This will help with uh, SPU uh, outputs, but we will try to get the print lock. We won't be able to get it. Here we'll call write on all of these things. That will go into writer which will try to get access to the serial port. That will fail. Um, we were putting that in the wrong file anyways. That will fail. Uh, but open. Nothing will get written to the screen. We'll get to this point. Core ID will be zero. We'll go to attempt soft reboot. So in any situation, if every single lock on the system is held, we can still make it to attempt soft reboot in any condition, any exception, any interrupt, right? We went through every lock that can possibly be hit and all of them by the nature of our, uh, of our implementation requires that you use try lock. Um, I guess interrupts, yeah, in an interrupt, you can't access, yeah, we have that logic pretty good. But then we get into here, uh, temp soft reboot. If the core ID is not zero, we return. Um, we will get the, get access to the serial port. If we can't get access to the serial port, we can never have the soft reboot. What if you really want to wait on print instead of just failing? I think I'm fine with failing if it means I can soft reboot because I can print debug. Um, it, oh, in the, um, in this, you're saying here, this should have the same code that, uh, that this has, right? I should have the same sort of thing here where basically I get exclusive access if I can, right? Um, and this will be uh, attempt to get access to the lock. If we can get exclusive access, then we, uh, if we can, if we can do a blocking request, then we will. Otherwise, we will attempt a lock, in which case we might end up missing console output during a, an exceptional condition. I'm fine with that. 
Here we're gonna grab the uh, serial lock, try lock. Here we're gonna grab the serial lock here blocking. Here we'll grab if let sum um, lock. So in this case, yes, we will lose things that go to the screen, but only if there's no other option. Um, write the message to the screen, or to the uh, serial port. It's, yeah, it's only from an exception. Right. If we're in an interrupt, then it's... Imp so remember our proofs? Um, if we're in an interrupt, it is impossible for the serial lock to be held. Because we can't... We can't lock the serial because it will disable interrupts. Locking the serial port will disable interrupts, thus in an interrupt, this will never deadlock. In the case of it not being, if it's non-interrupt at all, if you're just doing a print, then this is fine as well. And if you are in an exception, we'll try to get a lock to the serial port. If we can't, we'll go out. Now I'll show you what I'm gonna do next. So, we're gonna try and, we're gonna try and destroy this. So we're gonna add one thing. We, I think we only need the serial port and a couple, couple other variables. So what we're going to add is if we cannot get access to the serial port and we've been requested to do a soft reboot, we will init all other cores, taking them offline, and then we will reprogram the serial port and we will make a new serial driver. If that makes sense. And then at that point, we know that the serial port is up and running and functioning as, ex as expected. It's not in some intermediate state because it got fully reset. I think this is really good. We'll lose the, we'll lose the panic message, right? We'll potentially lose the panic message. It'll be like relatively silent. But what we could do is when we get to this phase, when we get to this panic, Here's where um, we could actually say if there's a panic on core ID zero, tear everything down, make a new serial port driver. That'll allow us to print to the screen, guaranteed. Um, and then we can attempt soft reboot, which will go, and that has to be able to read from the serial port to get the shift Z to know that the request was there. In which case, it'll hit here, the core ID will match. Um, it'll try lock on the serial port, which will succeed. In fact, we'll actually pass it a serial port, I think is what we'll do. So we'll pass this serial port, all of these locks, we're gonna move all of this out. So this would be like, this will probably be like prepare soft reboot or something. Prepare soft reboot will like reinitialize hardware to known good states. Tear, it will, it'll tear down drivers that it can. And, um, yeah, I think what we'll probably do is we'll probably we'll probably make sure that there's like a, a disable implementation for all drivers. So when we get to it, when we get to writing a network card, when we hit this soft reboot, we need to have an ability to go through all the drivers on the system and make sure that we disable all of the cards or whatever that were being in use because we don't want the NIC to have DMA program to write into some random physical memory when it gets a packet and then we soft reboot, we repurpose that memory for something else, and a DMA comes in out of fucking nowhere. So it's important that we have a way of shutting down every single device we ever program. So we'll have to have a device list, and that's easy. We'll, we'll have a, a trait that's like initialize and uh, disable. And disable will be like, in any context, this must be able to disable the device. It's like, this, the device may not be in the state that you enabled it to be, you must be able to handle that. So you have to be able to like reset the device and then disable it or something like that. And that can be part of our spec uh, for the device model. Um, so this is only gonna really, right now, the only thing that we require, we need access to our own APIC in a panic. If we can't get access to our APIC, um, I could probably reset it maybe. I could potentially set that up to reset the APIC. Um, basically, 
any device that we want to use in a soft reboot, we should just reinitialize. If we need to use a nick during soft reboot, we should reinitialize it. Um, which sucks, but we can't guarantee. We we'll, like try to get a lock to it. If you can get a lock to it, it's fine. It's in a good known good state. If you cannot get a lock to it, um, then replace the driver with a new one. I think that's going to be the play. So does that make sense? I, I'm pretty sure we're like very close to having probably one of the one of the most like resilient kernels out there. I don't I don't think I know of many kernels that provide these uh, strictness. It makes sense, but it feels wrong. What do you mean by that? Resetting a device has no effect. It's as if we booted from hardware and the device is in an unknown state. That's exactly how we'll treat it. We'll just say this device is in an unknown state, reprogram it. All the other cores are off. All the other cores are off. All the devices, every single device that has ever existed has a reset. It's always possible to reset. So anything we'll ever write a driver for, we'll be able to reset. I feel like you're trying too much and checking too much to handle panics. Um, the system is known to be in a very bad state at this point. That's a, if I can survive it, I want to though. And I know I can, and I think that's my issue. I want soft reboot to be bulletproof. The, the cost of a physical reboot is like two, two to three minutes on some of my servers. So that means if I write some code that's broken and I ship it up and I lose my ability to soft reboot, and let's say it's a bug that takes me 20 to 30 resets to figure out, if I survive, spin until the user hit Z, yes. I, if I lose the message, I'm fine with that. If I lose a message, but I can still, still soft re reboot, at least I can add messages more. I can add more messages the next attempt and reboot and get a new kernel. And yes, survive is just, yep, spin until a soft reboot. I want it so a soft reboot is always possible. More specifically, I want the soft reboot to be incredibly resilient. Obviously, you could map in the whole kernel with unsafe code and trample it. But what I want is that using safe code, it's impossible for a soft reboot to ever fail. You don't need to check so much to get the system in a spin until the user hit Z state. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'd say I haven't really done anything yet. I've, I've made my locks. I've added try lock to my locks. I've made the locks panic if you use them in a wrong context. We've done like a lot of stuff, but ultimately we've added like 20 lines of code to this code base. So I don't think we've really done anything, to be honest. I don't think we've really increased the complication of anything in this. We checked very little, to be honest. <clears throat> like, here's the path. Fatal exception comes in at any stage. We attempt to get this lock. If we can't get it, we do nothing which means we don't invoke the handler, which means we go to panic. So we check one lock, then we panic. In panic, we try to get the print lock, which is only a useful lock in making the print output look less garbled, such that we can do separate prints and have them show up atomically. That one doesn't matter at all. And then here, we'll attempt to get access to the serial port, and if we can't, then we'll pass on. And that's it, that's, that's the only code in the code path that attempts to do anything right now. Then we go to attempt soft reboot, and then that does need some structures because it needs to, um, attempt soft reboot is what actually checks the serial port. But I think what we'll do is attempt soft reboot. We'll probably reinitialize. Yeah, I think what I'll probably do is I'll probably change attempt soft reboot. This will be what's used in the timer. And then um, this will check to see 
if something is present on the serial port. If there is, it'll reboot. And it'll be in the timer interrupt. And then on this case, I might want to check for another Z or like have a force operand or uh, a force input parameter to this. Um, and here I could tear down, what do I need? I need the APIC, which is fine. I should have access to it. If I don't, I'm fine with that panic. I should never really panic or reboot while having the APIC lock. That's just never gonna happen. These two as well, I'm not worried about these at all. The only thing that I'm worried about is the serial port. The serial port is very likely to be in use by something else. And I think that's what we're seeing right now. Oh, we have the print lock, which is disabling the interrupts. So now, I want to make this fire NMIs, which is undefined. If I'm if I'm not mistaken, it's undefined. Um, um let's see. I think for these timers, let's look at this the table. So the timer apparently doesn't have an NMI delivery mode. Um, but if I'm not mistaken, it works. It's, it's like undefined CPU behavior, but if I'm not mistaken, it, it does actually work. If we set, set those bits. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna set the NMI bits very delicately. Uh, it's uh, four, we're gonna write a four shift eight. And we're just gonna see if we hit one. I bet, I bet we will. Um, and we gotta make sure we don't IRET in our path then. Four shift eight, this is on uh, APIC timer. Let's do, uh, let's just whack it in here. Four shift eight or Put it in parens. So that's going to make it a non-maskable interrupt. Uh, okay, maybe that doesn't work. On AMD it does, but I guess maybe Intel doesn't have NMIs on that. Let's put this, let's go into the halt state. Oh, that was eating all the Z's. Yeah, I need to have that capable of draining that buffer better. Well, it's not my fault. It's actually Vert Manager's fault. It has a bunch of buffered Z's, and I can't really drain them in a meaningful way. Okay, so this works, and then... That means I'm not getting those interrupts fired on those NMIs. Fuck. Okay, well... Then we won't use NMIs. So then this leads to a hard problem then. How do I get... How am I gonna get an NMI when that occurs? How do I handle if I disable interrupts permanently? And we, we tried we tried letting other cores init the system, I think. Because that sends an init to all but self. Yeah, so that faults. I, I feel like we can't set an init to the BSP. Well, I can send an NMI. Yeah, I can send an NMI to the BSP through the APIC on an, on an, uh, yeah, that's what we're going to do. Free moon, thank you for the raid. Hell yeah. How was your stream? Hope it was good. Okay, so we're going to do a, I'm going to actually change up my music a little bit here. Uh, at least I'll turn it up. 
Jamming. Okay. So when a core panics, we're going to want to get access to our own APIC. Else. Uh, first, we want to make sure we disable interrupts. Halt forever. And here's what we're going to do. Notify the BSP that we panicked. And to do that, we're going to do um, let APIC is equal to core APIC as mute unwrap get access to the APIC. Oh, we got to do this lock. Let APIC is equal to APIC dot as mute mute. Or go run. Then here I can do an APIC dot unsafe. I'm going to write to the ICR. Oh, and this needs to be a try lock. Um, if let sum APIC is equal to APIC, then we do this code. We'll do a write ICR. And this will allow us to send a message. And we actually need to know what core to send it to. We could send it to all but self. Um, issuing IPIs. So we use the ICR. Yeah, and here I can send a message. Only 8 bits there. Um, for the X2 APIC, I think it uses all of that. Let me ch t take a look at that. Extended APIC, ICR operation, and X2. Yeah, it, the whole thing is destination because it's a 32-bit APIC ID. Okay, so we need to know the APIC ID. Only, yeah. Yup. Yup. So we have the destination field, delivery mode. So here we can send. Uh, we'll send, send an interrupt to all but self. Uh, all excluding self, three shift 18. And we're just hacking right now. We're just trying. Uh, I have to assert one shift 14 or destination mode. Oh, yeah, I forget that. Physical versus logical. Let's take a look at uh, saying an IPI. This also has physical logical. Okay. And then we're going to say, I guess, physical, which I think we can then send to zero. I think it's guaranteed. I don't think you can reprogram the physical APIC identifier. I need to learn what uh, logical versus physical is. And then eight will do, uh, we'll send an NMI, which is a four shift eight. So this should send to all but self. Uh, we'll make this mute. Yeah, is equal to core APIC try lock. And there, we'll actually probably want to panic or something. All right, let's see what we get. Yeah, hey everyone, I died. Exactly. That's what we're doing. Um, right to this. I'm going to do this only on one core. If core ID is two. Let's see what we get. Okay. Okay. Uh, we got probs. Let's see, prints, we're in panic. There, we no longer have that lock. Reset. Why am I not seeing that panic message at all? If I get rid of this, I should be able to see Apex seventy eight nine. Ooh. Hmm. 
Timer interrupts. Oh, yeah. Um, and this will be a expect could not get a pick for timer interrupt. And that's that's just a straight panic because we can't EOI. Why am I only sometimes getting that? Am I losing that output? Am I? Mm, is that what it is? I'm. Um. I don't have that serial port during this stage. I'm getting an exception. Yeah, that's probably what it is. Um. Okay. So let's see if we can. And why is that happening? Reboot. Okay, well that doesn't work. We're gonna just send, we're gonna send it to zero. That's gonna send it to the BSP. There we go, that's an NMI. Got an NMI on core zero. Yep, so there we got an NMI. And I think, yeah, interrupt two, that's an NMI. Beautiful. So we are telling core zero that we got an NMI. And let me see the physical versus logical. Um, that's going to be really important. Uh, let's just grep for logical. Uh, to and from other logical processors on the system. Logical destination register. Read write. I might need to know where the BSP is. Determining IPI destination. Here we go. One all or subset. Destination mode. Physical or logical. Okay. Physi in physical destination mode, use to specify the APIC ID of the destination processor. In logical destination mode, a message destination address. I see. Physical destination. Um, specified. The destination processor is specified by its local APIC ID. Um, either single destination 00 through FE or broadcast FF may be used for the physical destination. Okay, so let's see. Local APIC ID. Uh, system hardware, not software, hardware assigns a unique APIC ID to all of them. Hardware assigned APIC ID is based on system topology and includes encoding of socket position and cluster information. On MP systems, blah, blah, blah. The ability to modify the APIC ID is model specific. So some processors you can, some you can't. Because of this, operating system software should avoid writing to the local APIC ID register. Okay, so it's recommended you don't change it. The value returned by these bits in CPID is always the initial APIC ID determined by the platform initialization. This is true even if software has changed the value. Wow. The processor receives the hardware assigned APIC ID by sampling pins A11 through A12. Wow. Those are like the physical lines and then they're latched. Wow. And then that's used as the initial APIC ID. Wow. Dude. That's so cool. Okay. Now, I would suspect this is after a reset. Dude, that's so cool. After it's been disabled. Um, and this is where I saw that uh, an init reset of a processor, blah, blah, blah. After receiving an init through one of these mechanisms, the processor responds by beginning the initialization. 
of the core in the local APIC. The state of the local APIC following an init reset is the same as a power-up or hardware reset, except the APIC ID and arbitration registers are not affected. So this shows that if you init like we're doing to turn off the other cores, we don't have to reinitialize the APIC because they that in fact initializes it. So I think it's probably safe to say that the initial APIC ID uh, is always gonna be zero for the BSP. And I could add an assertion in there. Um, in theory, it could be programmed, but that seems like it's highly frowned upon. So now I have a problem where Um, I'm having a problem where someone has a print lock held. Let's get rid of those and let's see if we always get the exception. Yep. So we're losing the exception message. Fuck yeah. Okay. So what we're going to do, the IPI will always happen. Oh, dude. Fuck, this is so cool. And that NMI is like, yo, dude, I died. Real, real bad. I fucked up. I made a mistake. I panicked real good. So we can fallibly get to that point. Um, I think on the NMI, that's the signal. Uh, and let's make sure I don't do IRETs. So NMIs are very interesting. You can actually mask NMIs, even though an NMI is a non-maskable interrupt, and that's why we're talking about moving... Uh, these things to use NMIs rather than interrupts because we're in a situation where the processor has disabled access to the um, the processor has disabled access to interrupts and thus we can't get our interrupt handler to cause ourselves to check the serial port to then see if we should cause a soft reboot. So what we're gonna do is if any of the cores panic, either the cores will panic because they had an exception or something, or they will continue execution, in which case they will release the lock. Send the uh, pointer of the panic info over the core zero. That's what I think I'm gonna probably get in that ballpark of doing. What I think I'm going to probably do, um, I'm probably gonna create a new serial port. Um, yeah, I don't actually know how I'm going to do that. I think what I'll do is I'll lock the existing serial port, if it exists. I guess I can't prove other cores aren't using it. Fuck. Um, and I can't init all the other processors. Yeah, I think I will need to save that information. Um, yeah, I should be able to send that over. Um, yep, because we'll get our panic. Oh, and we got to make sure we don't IRAT here anywhere other than exiting. Perfect. So NMIs are actually masked until an IRAT instruction executes. So when an NMI occurs, NMIs are disabled until the next IRAT instruction. Not IRAT repopulating or setting flags. Literally the act of executing any IRAT instruction, regardless of what flags are in mode or environment, that is what it blocks uh, on. It's actually really interesting. It makes sense. You don't want recursive uh, NMIs. So we'll panic. We'll send an NMI over. We're going to be like, yo, I'm dead. So either the BSP is dead, in which case it's out, or an AP dies, in which case it's going to hit up it's gonna hit up the local BSP and be like, hey, I got probs. I got real probs. We got to talk. So I probably will have a shatter on APIC to allow us to get that lock. Um, and then we'll be able to save the reference to the panic info to a physical slot. And then we can panic with that panic info. Can we call panic? Can we make this pub? We can. That means I'll be able to actually call panic with our own panic info. So let's, let's try this. Const panic. Um, uh, pending. Atomic u size is equal to. And we could actually make this a locked structure. 
Um, so we can either put a pointer in here, do a panic, we can use an atomic pointer, uh, but I kind of want to know what core it came from, and I don't think I get that from the APIC. Um, and do I need an EOI? Do I need an EOI and an NMI? Um, when a fixed interrupt has been dispatched, the completion of the handler routine is indicated with an instruction signaling the handler in EOI. That is a fixed interrupt. That is not an NMI. A write to the EOI register must not be included for an NMI. Yes! I love when I have concrete not reading between the lines. This is atomic pointer new zero. This will be pub. Um, yeah, and how do I make other people not have access to this? Hmm. I think I might just make it local. Ah, static. Thank you. I always type const, man, and it just, like... Oh, it fucks you up. Core pointer null mutes use core sync atomic atomic pointer ordering. Here we're going to have an atomic pointer to a, a panic info. Okay. Then at this stage, we will write it first. Panic pending store. Uh, we're going to store uh, panic info. Um, ordering sequentially consistent. Check this out. We're going to actually do this. We're only going to print information on a panic on core zero. If the panic occurs on a different core, we won't actually even print anything at all. 42, panic info, not fun on the scope, uh, info. So we'll save a pointer to that. Ah, yeah, that's fine. Um, as const this, as mute this. Okay. So we're going to send that over. Um, save the uh, panic info for this core. Okay. Then what we're going to do is we're going to get that panic. Yeah, dude. We don't even have to change anything. Um, then here, let's panic info. Um, hmm. Let our info is going to be info, and this will be a, a const panic info. Let other info is a const panic info uh, panic pending dot load ordering sequentially consistent. Fuck. Um. I guess we'll just do this. I think other info is actually kind of nice here. Uh, the panics for info in our info, other info. Um, our info. I think we can just do this. I'll uh, we'll just put out, put this out front. Ref this. Let info. This will be a panic info. This will be a uh, ref deref info. Okay. 
Uh, get Rust access to the panic info. Uh, oops, and that's unsafe. If info is null, continue. Skip uh, potentially null info. If it's null, continue. Otherwise, grab the info and print it. Now, this is still going to have issues. OK, so here's an example. We had an interrupt E. We had a page full on core 2. And then, yes, it's so good. Now we just need to get serial port access. So at this point, we're going down fatal. Yeah, write that, I, write that to there. That's going to cause an NMI. When that NMI comes through, we're then going to, um, we're then going to, uh, serial is equal to serial port new. This is serial. And we got to change this API a little bit. Um, it's already unsafe. So, okay. Um, fuck yeah. We're gonna need to override everything to use our serial port, but that's fine. We can write our own writer implementation. Um, so I think that's what we'll do. What if other cores write to serial now? Well, other cores are gone. They will be gone in a second. We're, we're working on it. But I do have that in my mind. Uh, we're gonna do this, right? Um, self. All right, this core apic uh, try lock expect failed to get apic during panic dot write icr. Um, and that can be a none as mute unwrap dot write icr. So this is a knit all other cores. Uh, at this point, no other cores are running on the system. That's not necessarily atomic, but we gotta we gotta be better about that. Anyways, tear down all the other cores on, on the system, and then we'll create a new serial port. This is gonna crash because creating a serial port is gonna um. This might not even boot. Yeah, creating that serial port is uh, going to crash. Um, let's do this. I just want to see, this should work in some conditions. There we go. There it didn't work. And then it got stuck. Um, why did it get stuck? What can cause that? Um, that can happen if we... Are we panicking in our panic handler? Um, see, um, boop. So sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. Oh, that triple faulted. Attempt soft reboot. Oh, that's getting stuck. It doesn't print anything, it gets stuck. Okay, that's what I think is happening. Okay, so we're gonna go and we'll make a new serial port. Um, and then I think our soft reboot is gonna be a panic. I think that's how we'll implement soft reboot is you'll just do a panic. Um, because panic is what's gonna be bulletproof. We'll make panic bulletproof then we don't have to rely on other things being bulletproof. Okay, so we'll make a new serial port. Serial dot write uh, b waffles, and we want to see this is not going to work because we're going to have an exception. Perfect. So we're going to go into uh, sp shared serial source. This is deref in four hundred to do this. We're going to have a. a we're going to have BIOS data area, uh, BDA OS dev. 
And I think we're going to give it the base of the uh, BDA. Yep, base is at zero. So this is going to be a BDA base. Um, this also assumes that, uh, okay. Only ever be called once, marked unsafe. And then here we're going to um, BDA base is the uh, address of the, is the virtual address of the BIOS data area. Um, this is at physical address OX400. However, it's up to the caller to make sure that BDA base um, is the virtual address which uh, represents this. Okay, BDA base, this is going to be a, a const u16. BDA base dot offset. Okay, main's going to fill in the bootloader serial port. Uh, OX400 as const U16. Done. Now, when we make the new serial port here, on panic, uh, we will give this SP kernel source MM um this kernel fizz window base plus OS OX 400. And then we'll wrap that up and we'll say as const U16, we're still hacking. So I'm not too worried about this. Um, boot args colon colon looks gross, but that's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll format this once it works. Let's see if we got waffles. In that case we did. In this case, we get waffles! Yes! In the freezing case, we get waffles. You're making a serial port again at 40-ish? I shouldn't be. Those were the only two instances that I ever created a serial port. Serial port. Otherwise, I would have a, a failure to create it. Okay. So this is uh, create our emergency uh, serial port. This... Um, we disabled all other cores, so we reinitialize the in serial writer. Create print serial writer here. I I only create a serial port in those two places. Uh, so we reinitialize the serial port. 41 in panic RS. Yeah, yeah, this code's going to change. This is not done. And that's not making that's not making a new serial port. That's just making the writer that has the trait. <clears throat> um so in this case we're going to say uh, we disabled all cores so we reinitialize the serial port. Um to do this. Okay. So we reinitialize the serial port to make sure it's in a sane state. We can actually replace that lock. We could shatter it and replace the serial port, or so we can either shatter that lock and implement an unsafe shatter, or we can um or we can make our own serial writer that uses our local serial port. And then we'll write to that. I think we'll make our own. This will be emergency writer or something. Um, oh, and here's what we'll do. Uh, let's old serial is equal to core boot args. Um, I can't 
guarantee that lock on it. No one else is running. Yeah, no one else is running at this point, so I can do this. Uh, lock the old serial port so nobody can use it anymore. So that will basically kill it, just in case we accidentally print. Um, this is just to prevent accidental use of the old serial driver since we create a new one. Right? So we grab that lock. All other cores are disabled, so it's not like the lock will get released by anyone. So lock the old serial port, throw it in the trash, then we reinitialize the serial port. And then here we're gonna make um, emergency serial. <laughs> emergency serial. And this will take a uh, serial port. Use core, uh, use serial, serial ports. Uh, so this is now this. We create a new serial port. We should bounce check this and we'll get to that. Create a new serial port. And then this will do uh, self.0. Write string as bytes. Okay, and there's our emergency writer. Okay, let's mute serial is equal to emergency serial, serial, uh, wrap up the serial driver in our writer. Okay, perfect, and now write, we don't do writer. Serial. We'll say e serial emergency. E serial. Okay. Emergency serial. Serial. Okay. Bam. Doesn't need to be mute. Bam. All right. Now we should always get the print regardless of the state. Got it? Got it? Got it? Yeah, this will just always work. All the other cores are off, and we have validated. Yeah, we, we've shut down all other cores, and we validated. Um, uh, we've m made a new serial port. We've fully reinitialized that, so it doesn't matter what state that lock was in. Uh, we'll always be able to print here. And we get the old print that caused the panic. Dude, this is so fucking nice. Um, so fucking nice. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Uh, set text with uh, 79. Okay, and then we'll probably put a message along with this. And, and, and these for info in um, uh, off core panic and then uh, core number zero panic. I don't know. I, I want to have like a way of having a banner here or something. I don't know what I want to do for these messages that syntax is kind of wonky i think this actually doesn't look too bad go through each one then we have the info and we have the um message and this is um panic reported by other core something like that and then this is going to be like the uh, panic. Um, this is a local panic or something like that. I don't know if that's confusing.
Um, oh, I don't need to make a serial port. Oh, I'm not. Okay. Print lock. Doesn't matter anymore. Gone. So on a panic, if you're not the main core, you disable interrupts. You store your interrupt, uh, your panic info. You then ship that. You notify the BSP of the panic. And then you halt forever. So your dependencies are that you can get an APIC. If you're panicking, your only dependency is that you can get access to the APIC. On the BSP, it only needs to get access to its APIC. It'll create a new serial port driver. The old one it will throw in the trash. And then we'll write this message. Um, dot, dot, this, this. Uh, panic. I don't know, maybe a pipe message. Let's see how this looks. <clears throat> panic, local panic. Uh, put a new line there. Um, panic at this. And this also guarantees that all um, locks are atomic. Or all panics will get atomically printed. There, there'll be no spew or overlap or grossness there. Good morning, Big Rick. How are you doing? Okay. So we have a... Panic reported by another core, and you know what? We'll just um, write e serial. Um, we'll just do this. Yeah, that creates some space. We'll do this up here. Create some space, uh, in case we're splicing uh, an existing line. Print some three new lines. Then our panic info, discard the result of this. Okay, here we go. I'll scroll to the bottom, reset. Fuck, that is clean! And th yep, that scrolled off. Panic reported by other core at that. Uh, interrupt, blah, blah, blah. Registers that exception. Fuck yeah, and then we have the local panic. In this case, we had an NMI which was caused by um, a remote panic. And I don't know if I want to handle this or not. Like, part of me is tempted to just have the NMI just be like this. That might be a little confusing. Um, yeah, here's what we'll do. In interrupts, we'll say if... Um, uh, enter exception, and then at this stage, check to see if this was an NMI. Other cores send us an NMI when they panic, thus we should panic to get the related message and uh, bring everything down. Okay, panic. Uh, if number is equal to two, uh, NMI signaled that uh, another core has panicked. And this will only do on core zero. If core ID is zero and that panic, re um, uh, signaled by other core uh, that a panic occurred. Uh, panic occurred on another core. Here we go. Brr. And there it is. So at that panic occurred on another core. Okay, and then the message. Yeah, we don't really need the one-liner this anymore. Let's just do this. At this location 
file column and then here message this you know we'll just put that on its own thing put an extra new line there we go let's see how this looks yeah interrupt e blah 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 at this so local panic at that at interrupts.rs 2479 which will be here panic occurred on another core and then this is the panic info from that core fuck that's so clean oh that's so clean <laughs> that's so good <laughs> Now panic on the BSP? <clears throat> I can do that. I mean, I did. That, that's literally a panic on the BSP, right? We're literally panicking on the BSP when we get an NMI. Nevertheless, we can just do that. Uh, we'll do the fault. Here we'll do a fault on that core. And here we go, local panic. There's no remote panic. There's no remote panic at all. That pointer is still null in the global. Fuck yeah. Isn't that clean? <laughs> and we guarantee that that serial port is uh, fully controlled by us. Now, soft reboots don't work, right? Because we can't, we can't shift Z. That's really clean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dude, this is... We've got some features in this kernel which are really, really, really nice. Um, we should be able to like panic in pretty much any scenario now. Like in that case, we were panicking in an en NMI. We were panicking, that's in an interrupt where an exception occurred that then caused all interrupts to be blocked and we were able to get here and get full control again because everything is forced to be try. And when we get to panic at this point, we make sure that there are no more tries because we will just make it happen. Obviously, we have this try lock, which is to prevent uh, mistakes. Um, dude, that's so good. All right, let's get uh, soft reboot working. Okay, so now what we can do is loop if... Um, if eserial.0.read byte is equal to sum b z, uh, write, let the, eh, write, eserial soft reboot requested. So now we should be able to hit that. We should be able to get z's. Um, that's, that was eating stuff off the buffer. We, we, can't, we can't really consume that in a meaningful way, unfortunately. We would have to, like, sleep. We would have to, like, read a byte and then sleep and then see if there's another byte. We do read in a loop in our serial driver. When we create a serial port, we try to drain it. Um, here. We try to drain all the bytes, but the byte... We drain the byte, there's no more available, while there's one pending that hasn't been filled in yet. So we would need to add like a sleep here to handle that. It's actually a relatively hard problem. So, but yeah, Z, 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 Z. Okay, so we're able to see those messages. Once again, exclusive access to the serial port regardless of the state or locks of anyone. Dude, I, I'm so excited for this. Uh, structure for holding the emergency serial port, which is reinitialized and uh, prepared for exclusive access during this uh, panic. Now, okay, soft reboot requested. When this happens, what I want to do is, uh, I guess, soft reboot. We've already init all of our cores. It's already happened. Get exclusive access to the A pick. We don't need that anymore. 
and that's going to get the soft reboot address, the trampoline page table, and we're going to jump into it. I think we can just use that. Yeah, we will. Um, so we'll say unsafe create soft reboot. There we go. Yeah, it, it just it just works. Of course, it fucking works. It's so it's so incredibly resilient to disruption now. Like it just this could happen at any time. The a core oh fuck. Uh failed to get access to the trampoline CR three. That is uh oh. It it at least failed in a clean way, which is good. Fuck all that resilience talk too. Um, that can happen. Fail to get access to that. And what was the message before then? Soft reboot requested. Local panic. Panic. Z, Z, Z. I'm actually curious what causes that. Okay, it reproduces, which is good. Um, Soft reboot. Who uses that? Okay. Well, this is easy. We know that it has to be trampoline CR3 related. So we know that the only possible places that could cause this issue are these places. Uh, 54 in bootloader source main. Aha. Uh -huh. Yes. Yes. I know what it is. Um... All the cores when they're booting will come through here and they'll attempt to get access to it and then they'll try and fill these things in uh, if requested. Um, and that means it can technically be locked when someone is going through that boot process uh, and we init the other cores. So we, we basically did a soft reboot request. We init all the other cores. One of the cores happened to be in this code um, where it was setting up all of this stuff. You tried to soft reboot during another core booting, yes. But that's a pretty fucking clean failure for that condition. <laughs> so, to fix that, um, here's what I can do. And I did think about this earlier. I do want this to work. Uh, and let's see, let's make sure that this fails reliably. So if this doesn't fail reliably, then it's going to be really hard. It seems to be, yeah, it's pretty quick. It happens after, like, yeah, pretty quick. Well, that's where RW lock would help. Um, technically, that bootloader side of things actually wants exclusive access to it because uh, it's potentially going to fill it in. Now, I could have it get a read-only lock and then promote it to a read-write lock when needs to update it um but honestly i'm not too worried about that because i have another solution that works um well the bootloader could theoretically panic in that window um And I get the tramp table from here. Yeah, so I have that up for a while. I think a read writer lock might actually be correct here. Or atomic pointer. Atomic pointer does work, but it. I don't like using null as uninitialized, but it, it in this specific case, it probably makes the most sense. Uh, do you contribute to the Linux kernel as well? No, I do not. Kernel entry, let's go here. 
So what do we need? The soft reboot address and the trampoline page table. That's it. And both of those, yeah, we're gonna we're we're gonna turn those into U sizes. It's just correct. Um, actually, atomic U sixty fours for both. So this is in SP shared boot arg source. Uh, address of the soft reboot entry point, atomic uh, U64, zero means on initialized. Okay, and then this. Oh, that we actually have a uh, real page table. Um, yeah, I guess. Do we have drop on page table? I don't think we do. I yeah, I don't think so. Um Okay, atomic u64 card run. Um this holds the the physical address of the base of the trampoline page table. And I don't think we actually implement drop on our page table, so we should do that. How did you learn Rust? I just read the Rust book, and then I, um, from that point on, I just developed projects with it. But I did actually read the Rust book cover to cover before doing anything, which was actually really weird. That's normally not how I learn, but honestly, it worked exceptionally well. I'm really happy with that. Atomic U64, new zero. Soft reboot. Atomic U64, new zero. Okay, no longer using fizz args. Our fizz adder. Uh, 91 in main. Yep. Let the trampoline table is this dot fetch add. Ordering sequentially consistent. Page table kernel entry. Okay, assert that and this is zero. Ninety one. Ah, soft reboot address. Uh, we can do boot args dot soft reboot adder dot store as u sixty four ordering sequentially consistent. So there we just store it unconditionally. Done. One oh three. Oh, load. That fits fit one line? No, it doesn't. Um, 231. It's a good resource for learning C++. I actually don't know of really any good resources for that. I don't, I don't do any C++ work. Never really have. Okay, trampoline table. What's this? Um, boots args trampoline table dot store trampoline table table dot zero ordering sequentially consistent. Okay, save the trampoline table address. Trampoline page table? Jesus. What a fucking name. Okay, 260 on tramp table. 
Yeah, that we'll just put up here. That, assert that's equal to zero. And then at this stage, um, get the address of the trampoline table. We need to make that unsafe. That cannot be pub. Otherwise, people can clobber it. Uh, tramp table as U32. Okay, uh, fizz adder 26. Wow. Uh, 105. 257. Try lock uh, 49 on the kernel. Load. Ordering sequentially consistent. Dot load ordering sequentially consistent. Wow. Well, this is gonna go into um, panic anyways. So I'll put this in panic. Uh, holds a pointer to a, a pending panic when a uh, non-core, zero-core panics, it will uh, place its panic info pointer into here and uh, NMI the core zero and then halt forever. Okay, uh, let's go grab this code, attempt soft reboot. And that'll be attempt a soft reboot uh, by checking to see if there is a command on the serial port to soft reboot. In which case, I think we might just kind of, we might just panic. Okay. Mismatch type, soft reboot. Oh, load with two Ds. Load. -d -d. You could actually store conditionally of zero for uh for this pointer. I don't really care. I'll take whatever core panicked. If they panicked in different ways, I'll only get one anyways, so I might as well debug them one at a time. Use page table fizz adder. Oh, I had a check for is none. All right, let me check that. Okay, looking good. An A pick. Temp soft reboot. This is in panic. Oops. Create panic. Okay. Uh, now forty three. Whoops, panic. Forty three. Virtual address, 56. Yeah, we'll fizz out of that shit. Dot zero. Oops. No, it is the trampoline CR3. Yeah, this is the fizz adder. That is. Okay. In the bootloader, I had a check for is none. Um, yeah, this is just an assertion. This is just a sanity check. Like, the, we shouldn't have, we shouldn't, we set up multiple things in this, and I'm just validating 
I'm, I'm gating it based on one of them not being set up, and then, um, where you store tramp table. I store it here. I just write it, write it in. Here I grab it, but well, that's it. The only spots that I use this are um, here where it's zero, here where we load it, here where we store it, here where we load it. We'll see it in the diff. I mean, this is literally every offset. <laughs> uh, 54. Oh, I, t I broke something. Cargo run clean, cargo run. And this diff is going to be pretty unusable, to be honest. Okay, local panic, Z, Z, Z. Okay, holding Z. Looks like it's living. Looks like it's surviving. And it should at this stage. The only place where we could possibly fail is if we cannot get access to the A pick. If we don't have access to the A pick, then that is the that is the final um, nail in the coffin. Uh, and where do we do that? We do that in panic, I think. I'd like to say this is obviously correct. Um, except for when two cores panic at the same time. Yeah, I just get one message, but I'm fine with that. If two cores panic at the same time, either they're panicking both in the same way, in which I fix the bug and they both stop panicking, or I fix one of the bugs, and then the other one still panics and I get that message on the next reboot. And I'm fine with that dev cycle. I think that's better than having like a linked list or a chain or, you know, all the different panics here. So... I don't really mind that. I'm, I'm given the rapid dev cycle. Since we have this soft reboot, I'm fine with only getting one. Yeah. Um, okay. So right now, failed to get a pick during panic. This is the only thing that is fatal. Um, soft, soft reboot. Uh, uh, physical reboot required. No, this is so rare that I'm just, I'm not even going to, like, make a way for this to work. Having an array of atomic pointers. Yeah, I just don't know how many cores I'm going to have. Like, I'm going to I'm gonna have, like, hundreds of cores in some situations. And also, they're not necessarily all panicking in order, so I'd have to go through the whole thing. It is doable. Max 256. Well, I'll have, I'll have more than 256 cores on some machines, too. But, yeah, I mean, it would only... It's pretty small. It's only 2K in global, so I could easily just have, like, a, a fucking <laughs> massive structure. But... But, yeah, I think this works. I could also do a linked list. Because the uh, I could actually do a linked list on the stacks. The cores could have um, the cores could allocate a tuple with a, a forward pointer, which would be none, and then they could update the end of the list. And since it's they could store it on the stack, which is fine because the uh, because they're halting forever. <laughs> so we could we could actually make a linked list on the stack. <laughs> It would just have, like, a pointer to the, the core data. A dead stack is static. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, yeah, I, I would say it's safe to say that this works. Um, the only situation where this won't work is this. Uh, let ASDF is core apic lock right here. This will fail. Um... Okay, that shouldn't deadlock though. Um 
Okay, that'll fail. That'll cause the panic. Oh, that's... Uh, we grab the A-pick in... I think we're hitting a timer thing here. You panicked and panic. Yeah, I think that's what's happening. Oh yeah, yeah, you're totally, you're totally right. I see, I see what you're saying. A uh, panic here. There's just, there's no good way of doing this because I can't. I don't want to initialize the serial port until this is done. So, yeah, at, at at this stage, it's just get get fucked. <laughs> the the APIC, no one's really gonna ever have the APIC open other than to issue a command. So I'm not really too worried about that. Oh, we got a message from a GM. Sup? <laughs> GM sending me messages. Trying to see if I'm botting, because I'm fucking playing the game 16 hours a day when I'm streaming. Oh, nice. He was talking to the server owner about some stuff. Hell yeah. Okay. Hello, dollar sign GM name. Oh, I'm, to I'm totally sending that message. Thank you. <laughs> He'll appreciate that. <laughs> this is too good. Okay, uh yeah, that's that's just gonna that's gonna hard fail. Um I think the A pick, I'm I might I might not have to have that in a lock, but I think we'll we'll hit that when we hit it. This is so good, man. We're 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 panicking and tearing everything down while like cores are booting up and they're like halfway through the bootloader. I would say that's pretty uh I would say that's pretty strong, which is awesome. Um, uh, oops. Where's my Discord at? Alright. Fuck, dude, that works so good! Wow! Dude, we can just do whatever we want now. There's- the- the sky- the world is my sky is my oy oyster limit. Sky is limit. God, that's so nice. Oh. And nothing here is relying on like crazy ordering with the exception of this. This has to happen first. Um, this must happen first. But yeah, we have deadlock detection. Time to clean this up. Yeah, that's what we're going to do. Um, so we've got deadlock detection. If we, if we acquire a lock twice, we have deadlock detection. If we use a lock during an interrupt, it is required that that has been marked as a lock that will disable interrupts when the lock is held. Thus, we cannot have a deadlock when an interrupt occurs. When an exception occurs, we only allow the use of failable locks which then means that all of that code will have to be able to do whatever. We know that panics work in every single exception case, with the exception of if you have the APIC lock held for your local APIC. But in every single situation, it's possible that all the locks will fail along the way, but we'll correctly ignore all, the, all of those locks, raise the panic, we'll hit the panic handler. The panic handler only depends on one lock. Yeah, this is like... Pretty fucking good. <laughs> if I do say so myself. <clears throat> um, God damn. I, uh, man. 
this this kid is incredible. I don't think I've ever had a colonel this resilient to faults. I don't think I've ever had a colonel that comes back this hard from failure. Um. So let's uh, let's reboot that machine. Let's get this going. I hate this website, man. It's so slow. I know they're doing a lot with their 100 megahertz ARM processor, but uh, brutal. Okay, clear. This is on real hardware. Coming up. Okay. Um, so we're just waiting for this to boot. Thoughts? Will it work just directly on hardware? Any bugs? Any bugs running natively on hardware? We don't have the test code on there right now, right? Yeah, this is real code. Okay. Yes, it will. Write some curl script that uh, makes the necessary request. Yeah. So I can use IPMI tool to reset it. I just always forget the command, but IPMI tool works pretty well. It's just all command line, but the, the formats are pretty complex. It's like five commands. Okay, local panic, local panic. Oh no, you got my secrets. I, uh, I covered my screen with my hand. You can't see it. Soft reboot, oh, not working. See? I told you. I bet it's that init, maybe. No, we init everything. Hmm. I should be disabling the timer. Let me see. I might not be disabling the timer anymore. I was at one point. Let's take a look. Ah, uh, panic. Yeah, I grab all my co locals and I throw them in the trash. That'll cause the APIC timer to get dropped. Oh, that'll fail. It'll fail to drop the APIC because we have it locked. So this will throw all of our core, core locals away. Wait. No, the APIC we don't have locked. Blah, blah, blah. Let me go up here. And we floop soft reboot requested. We see that message. So we get to this stage. Um... It's potentially the way we're traversing back down. Now, it doesn't look like a triple fault. That looks deadlocky. Uh, I think my biggest concern is that the APIC is not... That those interrupts are not getting disabled. Maybe this is panicking. Write that. Mask off the timer entry. Try lock interrupts. That lock is not held. Remove the handler. That would panic if that handler were already removed, which is not the case. What else? We're dropping everything in core locals. Um, we just dropped this whole structure. Um, these are fine. Boot args are fine. We'll drop the APIC. We'll drop interrupts. Which is fine. That'll just drop a bunch of pointers. Drop our free list. Drop these auto uh, auto-atomic refs, but that, those don't have a drop implementation. Um, okay. And we could potentially cause an exception here. 
All right, so let's let's disable that code temporarily, and we'll see if that fixes it. But I do want that code. Um, we do an IRET, so we will unmask NMIs. Maybe I have more NMIs pending? Well, no other cores are panicking, but I do think there's a, a potential situation where I could have multiple NMIs pending. Okay, so we got rid of all that. I think NMIs are blocked, but they might be pending. I'm trying to think if, if other cores... If other cores panic and they send that assertion to me, or send, uh, send the NMI to me, and I'm handling another NMI, will that get buffered and cause an NMI to come through when I go to reboot? I disable, inter uh, interrupts are disabled when I jump back to the bootloader. I switch back to the table. I think I tried this on hardware last night and I had this issue, so I think it's a pretty large issue um, okay, let's see what we got. Okay, that's not working. Okay, so let's never enable the timer. Let's just rule that out. Let's see if it has anything to do with having interrupts enabled or the timer enabled. But it shouldn't. XMMs in the kernel. Yeah, I need my floats, man. All the floats. All about floats. Having access to floats is pretty awesome, in my opinion. Use it all the time. Uh... Yeah, we gotta figure out why this is not working. If this works, then it's probably we're not disabling the timer, which makes no sense. Okay, Z. Oh, shit. This looks to work, which is great. Looks good. Local panic. The other cores never end up coming up. Okay. Sweet. What's awesome is that if we carefully add things back in very slowly, we can still use the soft reboot. So this now has exceptions enabled. Okay. So this is with exceptions enabled. So let's enable the timer and then disable the timer. And then we'll see what happens here. It still works. If I disable the timer, this works. Okay. And then if I enable the timer, this will not work, but I don't want to test it because I'm fucking scared. So we're going to do a uh, core apic. I might just pass in the apic. Yeah, we'll just do this. Core apic as mute unwrap dot disable timers. Disable timer, I think. Um, lock. A uh, try lock. Uh, map x x dot this mute okay this will disable the timers at the end ok 
Okay, that's not working. Um... Somehow that timer's still running. It pick is locked from before. I don't think so. Hmm. There could be a uh, pending interrupt. Maybe I need to EOI it. Uh, oh, this is a broken kernel. Uh, let's quickly let's quickly make this a fixed kernel before we boot, and I think we missed it. Oh, we just barely missed it. Fuck. All right, we'll reset that. This is uh, this one will boot. We can let that boot in the background. And then here, I think what I might need to do is... Unless that's accessing something, it shouldn't. We shouldn't have the interrupts lock. But it's possible this is failing. Let's see. Because that is a panic. Um, if that fixes it, because right APIC doesn't fail. Yeah, unless it's like catastrophically bad. Um, I suspect this one might work. I don't understand how that lock would be held. Z, Z, Z. Okay, so that is with that. And then here, we'll enable the timers back. Then we'll get back up to the panic. Here, we're going to disable the timer. Let's see what we get. Dead. Um, maybe I, maybe I need to EOI. I'm gonna fire off an EOI. X dot as mute unwrap EOI. We'll just do that. We'll disable the timer and we'll fire off an EOI, which is good. That means that um, means that this was not the culprit, which is great because it shouldn't have been. So the only thing we're doing differently now is we're disabling that interrupt and then we're sending an EOI. And that'll cause whatever interrupt that might have been pending to get deleted. All right. Z, no. The fuck? And am I? We're getting to the this print. We're seeing soft reboot requested, right? We are. We're actually getting into the bootloader, which means the soft reboot is happening. Yeah. If we're getting to the bootloader, that means the soft reboot actually happened. And all that means is that something stateful. I wonder, I really do wonder, 
if it's because I enable X2 APIC mode and the processor expects uh, or like one of the Maybe some of the early boot stuff expects that it's in APIC mode. Okay, so the way that we can prove that, okay, we don't need the EOI, so I don't think we do. Um, we'll get that rebooting, and then we're gonna make one change really quick. We're gonna go into APIC, and we're gonna disable X2 APIC mode. here CPU features x2 apic is false and if this is the case then it means that this hardware <coughs> whatever the pixie code is or whatever we're possibly using expects that the x2 apic is disabled it's pretty fucking nuts but we might want to save off the initial state and then when we drop the APIC, we can uh, write that initial state back in, just in case we relocate the APIC and it expects it at a certain base. So we'll just uh, put it back to its normal node. If this fixes it, which I suspect it might. No. Hmm. Um, oh! Uh, I need to I need the software disable the APIC. That's what it is. I need software to disable it. That's all. Okay. Um. Okay, that makes sense. So this will be the um original IA32 APIC base. Uh, original state of the IA32 APIC base, um, uh, and we'll restore to that when we drop APIC, and then we'll also have, oh, we'll just, dis we'll software disable it, and then we'll restore that, and I think that's allowed, I think this does, the Intel spec, I think, does allow that we can turn off the X2 APIC. And there's an X APIC mode, blah and blah. Okay, let's see. Um, this is boot time. Enable zero disables the APIC. Enable one enables the APIC. That's apparently a reset. Um, this. Sending extended to one puts us in an extended mode. Illegal transition extended zero. Uh oh. Uh oh. That's illegal. You fucking serious? You can't. You Um, the only valid X2 APIC transition using this is the state where that is disabled by setting enable to zero and that to zero. And the legacy are preserved across the transition. Okay, so the APIC ID and the legacy APIC ID are preserved. Transition from X2 APIC mode to APIC mode is not valid. And the correct, uh, the corresponding Rumorser causes a uh, general protection exception. A reset in the state places the X2 APIC in X APIC mode. All other are initialized as described in this. Okay. So in this case, if I do both, that puts this in disabled. Setting EN to 1. That's a reset.
But I thought the manual said that we can't do that. I thought the manual said I can't disable and then re-enable the APIC. <sighs> Have you ever made an app run without making or using a kernel or OS? What do you mean in that context? Okay, um, when that is disabled, it's equal to without that, cannot generally, when it's set to zero, processor APICs based on the three wire APIC bus cannot generally be, generally be re enabled until a system hardware reset. The three wire bus loses track of the arbitration that would be necessary. Certain APIC functionality can be enabled, performance and thermal monitoring. Okay. So what the fuck is a three-wire APIC bus, and what processors have this? With an FSB, it may disable or enable this by setting and resetting that. A hardware reset is not required to restart APIC functionality. If software guarantees, no interrupt will be sent to the APIC. if software guarantees that. Okay. When that is set to zero, prior initialization of the APIC may be lost and the APIC may return may return to a state described here. And then here's the SPIB, so, uh, the SPIB uh, for software. Professor, I have a quick question. What's your question? Temporarily disable this by clearing that. The state of the local APIC in this disabled, okay. After it's been software disabled. It'll respond normally to those. Pending those are set. Can still issue IPIs. Reception of any interrupt or transmission of any IPIs. Mass bits this. Um, so I think as long as I software disable this, I think we're fine. So we'll do this. Well, we know that, uh, here we'll do CPU features. X2 APIC is false. Disable the X2 APIC for now. Then, on a destructor of the APIC, which we'll get to by doing this, destroy all the core locals. Uh, locals, okay. That'll destroy all the core locals. And then on the drop handler for APIC, um, self dot will disable it by doing this um so we wrote over that then we're going to software disable the apic uh and we'll write a zero software disable the apic by writing a zero to the uh, APIC enable bit in the spurious interrupt register. And we'll just write zero to that whole fucking thing. Bye bye. So let's see if it works here. Works there. Okay. And then let's reboot that and see what we got. Although it's still only an issue. If we have that timer, disable that, software disable the APIC. Let's take a look here. Let's take a look. Um. The reception of any interrupt or any things that are in progress when it's disabled are 
completed before the APIC enters the software disabled state. Mass bits of all LVT entries are set. Attempts to reset these bits will be ignored. Okay, sweet. So that will mask off all interrupts. We don't even have to disable the timer in that case then. We just software disabled the APIC, I'm pretty sure. Now we also, we reprogrammed the pick. We disabled the pick. We might have to re-enable the pick. Yeah, um, let's... Yeah, let's re-enable the pick. I bet, I bet that's what it is. So we'll disable the A pick and we'll re-enable the pick. Here, that code is, um, we disable the pick by masking everything, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so we'll enable the pick. And we don't reprogram it at all, so we'll enable the pick. We'll write zeros to both of these. That'll uh, unmask all those interrupts. So now the pick can work again. Disable the A pick. Then we don't need to disable the timer, I don't think. Oh, if state that timer. Uh, self dot timer. So technically, this we want to do here. Okay, uh, I know that's tabbed and fucked and everything. Here, we'll fix it quickly. We're racing this boot. There we go. What the fuck? Uh, where you're making a kernel here that is optimized for a specific application. Have you ever made an app that handles the entire thing itself? Uh, in terms of like making a more generic kernel that can run anything? Uh, will this hypervisor require AVX512 to be able to use it for fuzzing? No. Um, so, I have no, I have no crazy hardware requirements other than an APIC, I think is the only hardware requirement that I have right now. So an APIC must be supported and that's it. It's pretty lightweight. Am I moving the pick? The APIC? I don't think so. But yeah, we know that everything works. If we enable the timer and then disable the timer here, this works on hardware. And since that works, it means the APIC is actually in a fine state. It's something about the timer. I wonder if it, the previous timer had something. Do you plan to use processor trace for coverage? No, I don't like processor trace at all. Okay, let's see what we got here. I think this this one works, and I don't know why this works. And the others don't. Well, let's see, we changed a bunch. We were actually re-enabling the pick, which might not be what this wants. Yeah, so this works. So this works. Okay, so what if I... What if I enable the timer and then disable the interrupts here, or disable the timer here? We'll do the same thing, but we'll disable the timer. And we'll do a print. Maybe we're not EOIing that interrupt correctly. Here we'll disable the timer. And then, then we'll cause the fault. Z, Z. Okay, this works. Now, maybe I just need to kill some time here. This will kill some time. I 
I feel like an interrupt has probably come in by then. We'll add some more. We'll just do we'll do a loop. We're just trying to add a delay here. Um, for this in zero to dot hundred. Actually, we'll do a thousand. That's pretty significant delay. I just want to make sure that it's not like a timing thing. It's going to be 4,000 prints. I think it's a sufficient delay. It's safe to say that the interrupts would have happened by now. And then it doesn't work. Okay, so it's a problem after an interrupt occurs. So once an interrupt comes through is where everything breaks. So that is the problem. Um, let's try it here. And this one's fine with it. This one prints faster. This one works. Something about that state is not right. Mm. How are you gonna gather coverage from fuzzing? Many different ways. I can use timers, I can use interrupts, I can use branch trace store, I can use uh, non, uh, non-readable executable pages, you can use breakpoints, hardware breakpoints. Uh, there's, there's like a million different ways to gather coverage. Getting, getting coverage is relatively easy. Um, I'm likely gonna do uh, non-readable executable pages. Probably, yeah, that's probably gonna be the model I go with. It has perfect coverage and it doesn't require um, binary knowledge. Uh, the operation and response of a local APIC, and this is as follows. Normally respond to these. Okay, so we'll take NMI. Pending interrupts in these are held and require masking or handling by the CPU. Okay, so let's see if we're getting timers. I think that's an easy that's an easy test. It's not it's not break it's not break it. And then go back to this and we're just gonna print on an interrupt when we have Uh, actually, on the APIC, on the interrupt handler, on timers, we're just going to print a message. Okay. Uh, print APIC timer interrupt. And we'll print the... We'll get this. We'll get a timestamp counter just so we have some uniqueness there. Let's run this here. Okay, well, that works. It's a little spewy. Um, and then we'll print the core ID as well. Yeah, we currently enable those. Okay, this. Interesting. Interrupt eight double fault recursion. Whoa. 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 Let's uh, let's take a look at this then. I think this is recursion. Maybe interrupts are staying enabled somehow? For page pace coverage, you just fill the entire page with CCs. And then every time uh, instruction fetch happens, you fill in the bytes with uh, the instructions. So you have a length decoder 
where you can decode the length of an instruction, and then you place that instruction, uh, you, you place the original bytes back at that instruction location, and then you continue execution, um, and then slowly you kind of scratch off and cover all of the space, but it just only requires you to have a length decoder, which is really nice. Okay, we're trying to Z it. All right. The hardest part is you need to monitor page tables so that you uh, you hook the page tables when they're created or added. But that's in that's pretty easy because uh, <clears throat> you can just map out the page tables. Okay, so this is happening. And this is going to be stack exhaustion, I would suspect. Let's take a look at where that RIP is. Um, stream term. CD, we're going to go into, what do we want to do? We want to check out the objdump m intel d build kernel x release kernel that exe vim dash okay so we got this going and then we can look at this address oops uh 4c 6e writing to the stack okay so How big are, do we make these stacks? Actually, it shouldn't matter because all the cores are halted. We're enabling interrupts somehow. We're enabling interrupts somehow. Uh, this is the only place we can return out. We're gonna assert um, Um, because I shouldn't be able to get an another interrupt, so I shouldn't have this possible. I guess maybe, maybe the stack is valid and it's not recursing, and the uh, knit is tearing things down. Like maybe that init, I need to have a small delay after the init, because the init is not atomic. The init that we're doing is not, it's not necessarily atomic. So we'll do uh, for this in zero dot dot 10,000. We'll init the shit out of the other cores, and we'll see if we get this. Okay, reset, disease, that's triple faulting. I think that was triple faulting. Hmm. Coverage may hit twice the same instruction. Yeah, that's how pretty much all coverage works. Tracking the amount of coverage you get per instruction is, uh, m most people don't have frequencies of how often things are covered. It's just too expensive to store. There's really no mechanism that allows you to do that, unfortunately. But it's not the most useful information anyways. Um, you can just periodically reset your tables and then kind of reset and go from there. Um, so you can kind of mimic it. But tracking the counters for every single instruction would be prohibitively slow. It, it just it wouldn't be really feasible. I think 90. So this is going out of bounds of its stack. Well, we have the interrupt levels. Let's take a look at those. So let's add a print here. Print int depth is core and I need to get access to that the interrupt depth 
We're gonna make a pub just for debugging. We're gonna say interrupt depth dot count, I think is what I have it. Yeah, buddy. So this will show the depth, which should only ever be one. Wow. Okay, interrupts getting enabled somehow. And then we're getting timers inside of our interrupts. That would make sense. So just binary coverage works fine in most cases, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just it's just too expensive to get that information. At that point, you're better off using an emulator. If you if you want to capture that level of information, just use an emulator. Um, in a real hypervisor, your only advantage is really to just have speed. So you want to have as little overhead as possible. You want to keep your overhead probably under like five percent on the actual uh, target. And so you, you're pretty much forced to use some more basic coverage mechanisms, but it's fine. Like, coverage just doesn't matter that much. At the end of the day, uh, even if you miss random coverage events, like if you do random sampling where you interrupt like a thousand times a second, you break in, you record where execution is currently happening, and you log that, that'll get you like 95% of the way there. Um, it's usually just plenty sufficient. So, I don't know, it, it's pretty strange, but just doing random interrupts and single stepping actually works really well. So, and it requires no awareness. You don't even need a length decoder. It, it works in any environment, on any operating system, on any target, on any architecture. As long as you have a way of getting timer interrupts, um, you can get pretty much all the coverage you need. Uh, and that's probably the first thing that I'll implement. I'll probably implement a timer-based coverage uh, system, and then I'll probably do um, a single stepping after that. So basically what you can do is you can interrupt, and if the code that you saw is new, then you can single step um, 100 instructions, and then every time you see new coverage during the single step, you reset your single step count to 100. So you basically single step until you no longer are seeing anything new, and then at that point you go back to randomly sampling until you randomly see new coverage, and then you log that and continue and go from there on. And you might be wondering, well, isn't that really, really bad because you're gonna miss interesting coverage events? Well, here's the thing. If your fuzzer is not frequently hitting something, um, then your fuzzer is not really going to be able to find it, if that makes sense. So, like, your fuzzer needs to be knocking on the door uh, constantly of whatever branch. So, if you're, like, one branch off, you likely have seen the coverage of the block that you haven't gotten past. And thus, you can pretty quickly, um, like, basically... The odds that you miss something are pretty low because your coverage-guided fuzzer is basically dead-ended on unseen things at that point. So either you're frequently hitting the unseen things because it's an easy condition for the condition to pass, or, like, I don't know. You're always, like, right there knocking on the door, effectively. Uh... Obviously, you can have weird things where it's like just one block that's a very short amount of time, but likely, if there's some code that is hard to cover and is important enough for a coverage-guided fuzzer to pick up, it likely avalanches into a lot more code. And if it avalanches into a lot more code, then it's really easy to detect with random sampling. And if it doesn't avalanche into crazy interesting code, then you probably don't care about it, and you're probably not benefiting from logging that coverage. If that makes sense. So, like, yes, in theory, I could code an application that would theoretically stress this environment, and it would cause the fuzzer to miss some bugs, because I would engineer the program to have a bunch of buggy one or two block things all over the code base. But real software doesn't really work like that, and real bugs typically aren't a couple small branches. They're typically a, a much larger state uh, or kind of more like complex conditions to cause the crash. So, yeah, it's pretty interesting. 
I don't know. Processor trace is way, 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 way too overkill. It's a lot of fucking work. Uh, it requires that you have... Um, it, it, it doesn't work well on operating systems at all. You can make it work on operating systems, but it's very difficult. You need a full instruction decoder. Um, well, I guess you need a length decoder and then <coughs> uh, branch decoders. It doesn't work if the address space is ever changing, unless you hook all page table modifications. PT just doesn't work very well in an operating system context. You get the indirect jumps, which is nice, but for anything where the code is changing, and in the context of an operating system, anytime a CR3 swap occurs, the code effectively changed, you would need to reload new tables for your decodes. You'd need to cache all your decode information. If processors are spawning and spinning up super fast, you're probably making a lot of dead decode tables. Um, basically, without OS enlightenment, without understanding exactly what modules are loaded and at what addresses and when they get loaded and unloaded, uh, processor trace is pretty much useless. <clears throat> it's just not... It's too strict. You can just use branch trace store to get something very similar. Um, but still, I, I just don't think coverage is really that important. <clears throat> if the difference of missing a couple blocks is the difference between your fuzzer working and not working, uh, your fuzzer is so useless that it probably is not worth running. Like, it just... If you're if you're relying on some random coverage edges to pick some random fridge ed edge cases up and you're not able to observe them with random sampling because they're so rare and so small of blocks, it's probably time to improve the fuzzer and, and make your fuzzer better. Certain MSR bits not being supported. Oh, yeah, the um, processor trace is pretty bleeding edge still. Uh, it's only been out for a couple years, and for using it in a VM, it's only been like two or three, I think like f five or six years for some of the oldest silicon, but um, I don't know. I, I looked into processor trace in my first hypervisor and at the time, and that was like a couple years ago, uh, and PT was not supported in any hardware at that time for uh, VMs, and now it is, but I think that's only been for like the past three years, and it's been I think some of the more bleeding edge processors so I think some of the Xeons don't support it support it because Xeons typically lag desktop processors so I think it was like Xeon starting from maybe two or three years ago probably support it maybe the first gen uh scalables which honestly I wouldn't really use anything older than that um but yeah how are we getting interrupt depth man I don't know. It's just too much work, to be honest. Too much work for the reward. You're better off investing in your fuzzer, in my opinion. Unless someone has done the PT work for you, in, in which case, it's no extra work. Uh, but if you're writing it yourself, it's, it's not worth it. Okay, so why are we getting... Why are interrupts getting enabled? Here we enable interrupts. And that's going to cause the interrupt count to get updated. Let's add some prints. And I don't think this is related to multiple cores. Let's go to a uh, single core and just make sure. Oh, one, one. We're going to make sure that this is not related to multi-core, which I don't think it is. Whoa. Whoa. Huh? Okay, there's something fundament fundamentally strange here that I'm... That's what I would expect. Okay, let's go to two. Apply, okay, force off. Turn it on. Let's see what we got here. Really want to get to writing the nick. 
Okay. This is just not enough contention, I guess. Okay, let's go to four. Off, on. Huh. There we go, and it's all borked. How is that happening? Timer interrupt. Interrupt depth one. Then one of these went to two. Um. Okay, let's take a look at interrupts getting released. That's gonna be in uh, core locals. Enable interrupts. Here we're gonna assert that self dot interrupt uh, in exception or in interrupt assert we're not in an interrupt uh, and that'll be on self whoa enabling interrupts in an interrupt okay so. We'll see if we're hitting that. Um, what? Is that hitting infinite recursion on this assertion? Yes. Ah. Uh, yeah, because I can't do a print there. Whoa. Dude, that's so weird. I'm going to try and pause this if it does that again. Okay, let's see what this is doing. What happened? It's somehow just getting stuck in a recursive interrupt. Interrupt depth. Okay, let's print that interrupt then. This will be the interrupt number. Now we'll just do this. Uh, number. I'd be very curious to see what that number is. Scroll to the end. Okay. Okay, that double faulting. Um. Reset. Just waiting for it to spew again. <laughs> Come on. Why is it feeling in such a weird way? I'm doing something really stupid. Our depth. And this is. It's crashing. Uh, let's reload this so we can see where it is. Uh, 9797. We're trying to call panic. Okay, we're panicking in a panic. And that is on... That's trying to get access to the APIC. I see. Um, can I get, can I get better information in Obj dump? Can I get line numbers? 
I don't know if you can. Deco dwarf equals decoded line. Disassemble. Display dwarf info for the file. Yeah, it's not quite what I want. Intermix source code with this assembly. Oh, dash S right there. Dash big S. Let's take a look. Is this going to work? I'm pressing X to doubt. Average dump. Help. Help. Yeah, that doesn't work. Full contents of all sections. Do I need to dash G? No, I don't think so. Maybe I have to D first and then S. Maybe the ordering matters. Maybe it doesn't work on this format. Womp womp. Womp womp. All right, so we'll go to 9797. Um, well, it is just panic. It's at the very top of panic. After we check, do we even get GS yet? No. Whoa. This is an unconditional panic. Right? That's calling, okay, that calls panic format. Okay, and that's when the stack finally dies. Yeah, I think we're just recursively panicking. And that would happen if the A pick is currently locked. I think we're enabling interrupt somehow, but I can't. I can't actually print that. I have no way of no, uh, knowing whether or not that happened. But core locals, for some reason, this seems to be enabling interrupts. Let's get rid of this. Let's not enable interrupts in this case. This should. We'll get like one timer or something. We should be able to get one timer print. Oh, we never actually get to that stage. I guess. Okay. If OS is one, disable interrupts here. Fetch add one, fetch sub one, check for overflow. Oh, that's gonna, that's gonna recurse right there. Um, dash L, include line numbers. Shell. Given it couldn't intermix source, I'm a little skeptical that this will work. Nope. Yeah, it doesn't seem to work. All right. Um. Ah, uh, okay. Let's see. What is causing that? This is this is pretty nuts. Disable interrupts. Fetch at that. That'll call disable interrupts on the core. That'll go to here. That'll update the disable interrupt outstanding. Set it to a larger number. Okay, then here, enable interrupts. That'll get put to zero here. I'm going to see if I can panic here. Woo. I don't think I can. I'm pretty sure I can't panic there because that's something that the panic handler is going to use. Yeah. Okay. So. Well, I guess that means that we can see that we're hitting that. Interrupt depth. EO on timers.
Uh, so I can print in here. So I'm going to print. Enter exception. I'm going to print the flags. Um, CPU uh, R flags. Okay, and we'll go, we'll close some of these files. We really just care right now. CPU core locals, boot args we don't care about, main we care about. Okay, so these are the only ones we care about right now. Here we're going to uh, get the current RFlex. And thanks for the biddies, Napalm. What have we missed? Uh, we made a really good locking system. Um, I'm trying to figure out why. I, I think I'm enabling interrupts during an interrupt, which is a little bit of a problem. It's probably a really, really simple bug when we get to it, but i got to figure that out. Uh, this will be a get the current R flags. And this will be R flags. Actually, we can do E flags. Um, push FD pop into register. Let val is a U32. This returns a U32. Val. Bam, bam. Okay, get the E flags. Do you dump the stack when it panics? I do not. Uh, 243 on interrupts. 243. E flags. There we go. Uh, oh, can't. Oh, that makes sense. Uh, yeah. Push FD. We'll have to make two different variants. Get the current flags. This will be a, we'll have an implementation for both modes. Uh, feature. Actually, this is a uh, CPU target config target CPU is x86 64 okay nice nice we can get the flags now why not uh, dump the stack yeah I don't know the cause right now but I I don't have a I don't really have a good way to symbolize the stack either CPU flags cannot find function what? Target. Uh, what is it? Uh, we use this in shared uh, core requirement source. Okay, we're gonna go into here, and we'll try and find this. Target arc. Oh, target arc. Okay. Uh, push FQ, pop into racks. Bam, done. All right, let's see what our flags look like. And I should just get the interrupt flag uh, wiki. Wiki flags, I think it's like eight or something. Um, it, oh, it's nine, it's at nine, okay. Uh, we'll print the flags and one shift nine. And we'll see at that stage if we have them. Oh, uh, we gotta scroll this to the bottom. Okay, here we go. Okay, interrupts disabled, good. That's what I would expect. And then let's go to after. And then we'll go here. We'll say int two, int one, and then int three here. I suspect int three interrupts are gonna be enabled. And I have no idea how. Means my ref counts would be off, which is pretty nuts. No, that is not the case. All right, I'll hit the head. I'll be right back. This is strange.
Oh, you don't see in three printed. Oh, yeah. You're totally right. Thank you. I got a bowl of Fruit Loops here, too. You're totally right. Okay. Now, is this only a problem because I'm doing a print? No, it shouldn't be. So, I enter an interrupt. Enable, enable interrupts is zero. Or... Uh, the interrupt request... Request... What did I call it? I thought I called it requested something. Core locals. So... Enter an interrupt, interrupt depth increment, in interrupt, disable interrupts. Oh, yeah, if I take a lock, yeah, it is an issue. If I take a lock, it'll increment the lock, and then the lock will get decremented back to zero, which will enable, enable the interrupts. I did think about this the other day, but for some reason, I thought it was a problem that I'd have to fix, and then... I thought that it wasn't a problem I had to fix because of some condition, and I think I was wrong. Oh, hell yeah. So the problem is, here, here's what happens. We enable interrupts here, and that is a request to enable interrupts. It's not guaranteed, but at that stage, it will be guaranteed. It will decrement the interrupt disable outstanding, the number of requests to disable interrupts. If the previous value was one, we just decremented it to zero, in which case we actually enable interrupts. It starts off as one. So we create the core locals. This will decrement it down to zero, causing enabled interrupts to actually get enabled. Then, if we have an interrupt and we acquire something that takes a lock, the shared lock cell source this, a lock cell will um, a lock cell, depending on if it disables interrupts, which all the inter all of the locks that we ever will use in an interrupt will, if it uses disable interrupts, we will disable interrupts by saying enter enter lock, and enter lock will go our, to our implementation here, that will simply disable interrupts, and then exit lock will enable interrupts. So this would increment it to one, this would decrement it to zero, interrupts would actually get disabled, we get a nested interrupt. So what we need to do is on, basically upon entering a, um, upon entering an interrupt, we need to increment that ref count, and then leaving an interrupt, we need to decrement it. Um, hmm. Or, or we can disallow enabling interrupts when it goes to zero if you're in an interrupt. So here's what I could do. Um, I could either increment the count. Oh, I can't. Hmm. 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 Okay, here's what I'm gonna do. Core in interrupt. If we're in an interrupt and uh, if we're not already in an interrupt and we decremented the interrupt uh, request uh, outstanding, to zero, we can actually enable interrupts. And this is actually correct. We have no way to decrement that down without enabling interrupts 
unless we either add a new API around it where we increment and then decrement, but we don't enable. So this will fix that problem. You gotta scroll to the end. Okay, everything's online and we have no issues. Um, do we? Did we get rid of all our prints everywhere? I feel like I didn't in kernel source apic. Yeah, print timer interrupt. Oh, if we're n not in an interrupt and OS is one. There we go. Now we should get timer interrupts. Yep, and no depths greater than one. Okay. And then if the depth is zero, when we return out, it was already enabled and then the bit will be set, if that makes sense. So if we enter an interrupt, and if we have an interrupt, interrupts were enabled. We then have, we know that the count is zero because interrupts are enabled. We do stuff inside the interrupt that increments it all the way up, all the way back down to zero. And then we re never actually enable interrupts because we know that the IRAT will restore the previous flags atomically, and then it will re-enable the interrupts. Oh my god. Okay. I bet that's our issue on physical hardware then. It's so weird. I thought about the the other day and I think I convinced myself that due to the interrupts being disabled by the IRET that it wouldn't be a problem, which is just totally wrong. Um, or being re-enabled by the IRET, like, managed for me. It's totally wrong. Okay, let's see what we got here. Z, okay, that's broken. And why is that broken? So we have the timer interrupts. Those are coming through. Cores are online. Z, bootloader starting. Okay, now this is replicating what's happening on hardware. Okay. And that's good. I mean, it sucks, but it's good. Enable interrupts. Go to here. Let's try this. You're doing one enable interrupts per core? Yes. It'll be for their own cores, enable interrupts. They have their own separate ones. Okay. So I can... I can shift Z. I can shift Z from a panic. So I can soft reboot from a panic, but I cannot soft reboot from not in a panic. Okay, and that's pretty easy then. That means that for some reason, soft reboot is broken, but only in the context of not being in a panic. So let's go into, that's gonna be an APIC, timer interrupt, attempt soft reboot. That will go into panic. Attempt soft reboot. If the core ID is not zero, then we'll return. Otherwise, read from the serial port, do a soft reboot. Okay. We should have no locks taken when we hit that phase. We got here, we read these things, and then we jump back Oh, we never init the cores. We don't init the cores in this case. Yeah. We got to do this where we init all the cores. And we'll do 100. And we'll do that unconditionally here. Init all other cores. Oh, we don't have the APIC when we do this, so we have to do it before. So this will init all, all, all of the other cores. So init all other cores. Okay. And the 100 is just to give a little bit of time to make sure that all the cores have shut down. It's really hacky. What we should do is actually bring the other cores online and count how many reset, which is kind of weird, but... Okay, reboot, Z, 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 Okay, sweet, now this should work on 
physical hardware. Let's uh, A pick. X to A pick. Oops. Um, we'll use the X to A pick now. Disable the pick. At the end, when we drop, the only thing that we're actually going to do is we're going to software disable the A pick. Because we know that that dis disables the timer. So we don't actually need to do this stuff. Deregister that. Uh, timer. So the act of disabling the APIC will uh, mask that timer. Okay, here we go. Sweet timer. Timer colon, delete. Uh, this just takes a mode. Here we enable it, and then when we drop it, we will disable it by writing a zero. Okay. Never use remove handler, we never use disable timer. Hmm. Okay. Then here, let's reboot the server. And then it hopefully will work on hardware now. Totally makes sense. Here we go. Reset. But yeah, uh, we did read that manual correctly. That it did say that um, the mass fits for all LVT entries are set. Um, unless it doesn't call that an LVT entry for the timer. Oh, it is. LVT timer. So all of the interrupts will get disabled. So by resetting the APIC, um, this will also cause all APIC LVT interrupts to be masked. Thus, we don't have to... Disable the timer as it'll get masked off. If someone enables the timer, they should have programmed the timer. So let's see. This is on hardware now. Z, Z, Z. Yep, we fixed it. Hell yeah. Oh my god. Dude, that bug. That bug had me unhappy. I was like starting to get really scared. Turns out it was a catastrophic bug, but luckily, it wasn't violating any assumptions or anything. It, we were just doing something wrong, um, but the model still works. It didn't violate the model. I was very concerned that my locking model was potentially not correct or safe in all conditions. All right. So, when we drop a pick, that'll happen. Here we'll say, allow unused, unsafe. I guess this is just unused. Or dead code, maybe? Yeah. And then here, let's see. On real hardware, if we cause an exception, there's the exception, and we can... Oh, we can't shift Z out of the exception. Uh-oh. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, let's try it here. It works there. Okay, now we're back to being confused as shit. Hmm. Hmm. What causes that? And it's not the serial session being dead. Reset. 
so if we cause an exception, that just doesn't work on the real hardware. Why? Hmm. Okay. XMM5 looks different on hardware. Yeah, that's expected. The value in there shouldn't matter. It's just a uh, general, well, it's just a register that holds the data. Technically not a general purpose register, but behaves the same. Okay. So this works. We're soft rebooting. Mm. But it doesn't work if we cause the exception. Let's try it on a different core. We're going to cause this an exception on another core. See what we got. I can Z out of it here. Let's see here. Exception, another core. Core 1. Z, no. That's so weird. Let's see if it's a problem with panics. Um, let's try a panic instead. Uh, Panic, buy, buy. So we'll just call this the panic. And we'll see if that does the trick. If the panic also fails, then we have one common path to be debug. Oh, and we'll do it on the same core. We knit all the other cores. Um... Okay, there's the panic. And interrupts are disabled right now. In the... Okay, if I Z this, we get there. All right. Something about, like, Pixie... Something about the Pixie implementation on this machine... Seems to really not like being in this state. Maybe I need to return out. Maybe I can't just directly do a soft reboot. I might have to execute the IRET. But I don't think so. Um, I disable interrupts in my stuff, so that's not what it is. But it is getting to the bootloader, and there's something that's happening there. So let's go into bootloader source. I guarantee you it's in Pixie. It's just strange, but that's probably where uh, the issue is. So I'm going to add some prints. Um, And I removed all the prints, didn't I? So I have to do uh, boot args dot serial dot as mute unwrap write b downloading kernel and then this is kernel downloaded 
and this will just say PE parse, but I'm pretty sure we do not get here. Uh. Oh, lock. 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 So lock the serial port. We'll then print a message to it. We'll see what we get. Bye-bye. And then there we get all the messages. Okay. Now we got to get this going on hardware. I don't, I don't know. It's really tough to say where that's failing. I could actually just add a lot more messages because we're... With these basic messages, we actually have a plenty of space. Uh, but I would suspect that the issue is Pixie-related. And I think there's something about the Pixie driver... That's relying on something about the environment to be very specifically already established. And I don't know if that's the pick being enabled. I don't think so. I just don't, I don't understand what would be different about causing this during a panic. So it works if we're in an interrupt, but it doesn't work if we're in a panic. And in this case, it's a straight panic, so interrupts are enabled when we do that panic. Bye-bye. Uh, Z. Downloading kernel. Yeah. Is that Pixie? So I don't really get what that would be. What would cause that? Um, the panic is going to have interrupts enabled, but that's fine. It has, I don't think it has anything to do with the interrupt state. Panic will go into panic. Panic will... I guess I should disable interrupts, just in case. Uh, core disable interrupts. Uh, request that interrupts be disabled. That shouldn't be it, but nevertheless, when we hit the panic, then we'll go up there. I think there we disable interrupts as well. We'll just, fuck it, doesn't matter, we'll put it here too. But something is different about what we do here. We knit everything. Create our serial port. We write all the stuff to it. And then we jump to soft reboot once we see a byte on the serial port. That matches that. I... Hmm... The only thing I could think of is like an EOI that I need to send. Maybe it is that disable interrupts. No, it shouldn't be. Nevertheless, now we have it, but I, I don't think that's it. What OS is this? Uh, the one I'm working on or the my environment? I'm running just Debian here, and this is an... Uh, operating system I call uh, chocolate milk. We've been working on this on stream for about three or four days now. Um, okay, so that's working. Disable interrupts. I wonder if I'm getting a timer interrupt while this is coming through. Maybe I need to EOI this, but I, I don't think so. All right, here we are on hardware, Z. Okay, those changes didn't fix it. And that's fair, I wouldn't expect them to. Um, okay, so if I do a CPU halt here, let's see. If I do a CPU halt, so I halt instead, I don't have any locks. 
And then I'll soft reboot by Shift Z. And that'll go through. Uh, we killed the serial port, but that old serial port will technically work. This is pretty undefined behavior. Uh, maybe it won't work. Uh, I think this will work, actually. Z. Blah, blah, blah. Grab that lock. Okay. Oh, yeah. We have the old serial locked. Um, let's not grab that for now. It's hacky. But we're hacking around this. We're going to see if this does anything. It's having that serial, isn't it? Are we panicking on something? No, I don't think so. Okay, so now this isn't working. We can't Z in that state, but we can in this state. You say this is your own OS? Yes, this is. Z, okay, so that works. And so what we need to do is halt that. I'm so confused. I have no locks. Interrupt should be enabled. How is that different? It is not equal to zero. I'll happen here. We have our interrupt handler for the A pick. Able the timer, write the apex, okay, blah, 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 blah. Where's our handler? Where's our timer handler? Enable the timer. Maybe I do need to disable the timer. I don't think so, because that should get masked off, but let's see. Let's try it, and we'll enable the pick as well, just in case. Um, this is enable the pick. Enable the pick. So disable that, and then we'll disable the timer. Might as well. Uh, self dot disable timer. Okay, let's see what we got here. Okay, I don't know why that breaks here if we have that halt. If we have this halt doesn't work and I don't understand why I think I should be getting interrupts and panic but for some reason I'm not um that disables interrupts that'll keep them print I'm gonna print if we're in an interrupt Uh, and this will be core in interrupt. So we're using an old serial, but it should be fine here. At that, bye bye. We got to here. Maybe it is the whole uh, emergency serial stuff. Let's comment all this stuff out. And that core e serial, where's that at? Oh, down here. Uh, what? Z. So that print doesn't work. That print's deadlocking. Yeah, that print's deadlocking. Why? Uh, 
Let's take a look. Colonel Osaurus, Prince. I think Prince should fail open. If we're in an exception. If we're not in an exception, it'll try and lock. We're panicking. We're panicking here. We're not in an exception. We'll try and get access to the cereal. Enable timer. We can't get access to that. I think... If I disable this timer, do I see that print? And I think I do. I think... No, I don't. Okay. If I get rid of this... Are the other cores coming online and printing? There we go. That's what it is. Um... So they're printing, and then I init them, and then I can't print, but that's fine. I mean, I'm getting to the bootloader, which is interesting. There's something different about the environment for this uh, Pixie driver. That's entirely what it is. So none of this stuff really matters. Here, we want that to panic. That timer off. We want this panic stuff to go back to what it was. Um, you put that there and this. Okay. So it should work. Yeah, that works. And why does, let's try this in hardware. Downloading kernel. Okay, let's try this kernel. Have you heard of Temple OS? Yeah, I have heard of Temple OS. Um, boot that. And that works, right? PE parsed. Okay. Yeah, I think it's the second we go into the Pixie hardware. So we have drop now. That disables the timer. We mask off the APIC entry. Um, okay. And we re-enable the pick. Now, maybe I need to reprogram the pick, but I don't think so. Z. I don't fucking know, man. Okay, let's add some more prints. SB bootloader source Pixie. We know that we're failing in Pixie. Not too surprising. Um... We do uh, this, we can say uh, detected pixie. This will be uh, ipix or pixenv. Pixenv valid. Pixie valid. And then here, I uh, got. DHP ACK. Got file name here. And then down here we've got the opened. Yep, Pixie open. And then we got Pixie reads here. That'll be a couple prints in a loop, and then here this will be close. Okay. Send us boots, crates, boots, G. Okay. So this should, this will spew a bunch of stuff. Okay, nice. So reset, and we'll see how this goes on real hardware. I suspect that this Pixie stack on this hardware. Uh, 
really doesn't like something about what we've changed. I think I disabled the X2A pick. No, I allow the X2A pick. So we'll see. Maybe it's a problem with the X2A pick being enabled. We tried that earlier, but we had another bug. So. <laughs> but we're able. Yeah, but we're able to jump back. It's something about the interrupt. It's something about the interrupts changing it. And I have no idea why. Why would it be different in the panic versus not in the panic? Well, we're going to see. Want me to debug this for you? Oh, this is going to be impossible, man. Got DHP act. Okay. And that failed. Yeah, it's kind of what I suspected. It's on the Pixie Open. Oh, we can't get the file name either. Oh, that's get file size. Got file name. Yep. So we can't get the file size. We basically can't send. We can't send a packet over the network. Ugh. Yikes. Yikes. How is that, how is the panic any different? If we don't do this, it's fine. This works, and that means everything about our, everything about our configuration works fine in this environment. Okay, let's do that. We got a reboot. Ugh. Debugging problems that are not my problems are really, really, really rough. So annoying. So this will, it's a problem when we panic and when we panic, I just don't understand what's any different about the panic state. Make a new serial from that, blah, blah, blah. Oh, that's not working in this state. Oh, it is, okay. <laughs> it's not my own bug. It's not Z, so that works. What the fuck? So if I do a panic, it no longer works. Um, Z, how would this be different if I had a panic? If I have a panic, come through here, I load panic pending. I init all the other cores. Write that, okay, so that's. What if I just have my panic CPU halt for core ID zero? Okay, let's see what we have here. All right, let's try this. Okay, this works, nice. This means we can just keep moving the halt down the line. Oh, hell yeah. Oh, and now it's easy to debug. Okay. Here. 
Is it knitting the other cores? Is that the problem? Z. 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 Nope. Is it getting access to the old serial port? No. Is it creating a new serial driver? Z. Nope, it's not that. Okay, is it here? Z. Okay, that's not it. Let's go. All right, let's see if we can do a write. Is it is it gonna fail after we do the first write? Z. Z. And do we have that right? Oh, are we not panicking right now? We're not. Pa we're not panicking. Ah. Okay. This. Put this here. Put this back. Put this back. We know that this works just fine. Reset. Okay. Cool. Put this back to panic. We're gonna panic. Bye bye. This should work in this case. And this should have bye bye. Um, oh, it won't print the message. Oh, that eventually gets stuck. Ooh, why is that stuck? Let's see. Uh, CPU usage is zero, so it's halted. Halted and interrupts are disabled. Okay. I think that's just if I hit Z too fast. Just for this test right now. But it seems to work every time here. Okay. Now here, Z. Okay. Z. Okay. Z. All right. So we should be having that panic. Now let's see. Now we can actually figure out what the bug is. Let's go past the inits. See what happens when we init. That's a lot of inits, but I don't think that's the problem. Z. Z. Whoa. It's the inits. Why though? Um, maybe I just need a delay here. I I need to I need to make a busy delay, and we we talked about this earlier, where I'm I'm doing this in a little bit of a hacky way, but we're gonna do a um. Uh, we'll do fn delay amount. This will take a u32 assembly. Uh, we got a label. I'm gonna deck this. Jump not zero, two back. Um, oh, move racks, zero. Deck racks, jump not zero. 2B, this will take an input register, which will be a mount, which can be a U64. Uh, say a memory clobber, and a racks clobber, and a CC clobber, and this is volatile, and Intel. Okay, I bet this is what it is. It's these inits, man. I think the other cores are still running. Delay. Okay, we'll loop uh, for this in 0.2. We'll, actually, we'll just init once. And then we'll delay for a, 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 a while. Um, unsafe. Move racks, 0 which is the amount, decrement that, jump non zero while that's looping, okay. So we'll init all the other cores, and then here, 100,000, or 100 million, before we do anything else, so that'll wait a little bit longer. Deck racks, jump non zero, okay. And halt. 
All right, let's see if this works. Here it should. Oh, nice. That is not working. Okay. Reset Z. Delay. Then we halt. But this works? What? Z. No. Get the APIC lock delay. Right ICR. Okay. Okay. Let me do this in a loop. I'm going to look at my CPU usage to see where it's getting stuck. Z. So it gets stuck the second time around. Reset. Z. And we can only do it once. Okay, well that's nice. That mimics what we're seeing on hardware. What is that? Oh, we're not hitting that loop. Okay, uh, halt. Uh, panic happens. I don't think a panic disables interrupts. Or there's something I'm missing. Ready, complete uh, kernel and rust. Yeah, absolutely. It's not like the game rust. This is different than the game. Okay, so now we have that delay. We're gonna we're gonna try this on hardware now with the delay. It works in the emulator. Z. Yeah, that works just fine. We have the panic. We get the panic, and then we come through here. Well, we init all the other cores first, and then we lock the old serial device, set everything up. I just don't know what would be different about this and real hardware. Unless real hardware, I need to be, I just don't know what's different about being in an interrupt frame. Uh... I'm not using a stack. Okay, there's our panic. Sweet. Z. Nope. What the hell? What if I don't do multi core? So we'll try it. We won't bring up the other cores. We'll still init them. Something's broken. There's like no reason here. Um, I, I just, I don't understand what's different about it being in an interrupt frame. And being in this panic. Is another core grabbing a lock on something? No, I don't think so. If we're in interrupt, we have in interrupt. That's really the only difference. If we're in an interrupt, it is in it. I think, I don't know what the issue is, but I think I know how to make this work. And I don't understand why, but here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna fake this out and tell it that it's in an interrupt. 
even though it's not, when I, we hit panic. This will change the behavior on locks. It, uh, it shouldn't matter. Get the interrupt. Okay, so now we're in an interrupt. According to our, uh, like our kernel thinks we're in an interrupt. That still works on the virtual machine. Let's try it on hardware. We're not in an exception when we get a reboot. Unless it's something specifically about panic. But it shouldn't be. Right, to panic pending, we load that. Unless this one, no, but we're still getting into the bootloader. We're not deadlocking or anything. I don't understand how being in the interrupt would change anything. Ah, oh, it's so weird. I'm trying to think if I've... No, I, I have... Okay, so that's Pixinv. And then that's broke. Okay, so that doesn't fix it. Shit. Well, it's not a fix. That was just a test. If we go into panic, we have a... Um... How is it different if we're in an interrupt? We disable interrupts if we're in an interrupt. But I don't think this is interrupt related. You know what? I think it might be core disable interrupts. I wonder if it is EOI related and the EO uh, the while I'm in the panic handler I get an interrupt. Yeah, we'll disable interrupt here. Disable interrupts here, and we'll see what this does. So this will disable interrupts. We say that we're in an interrupt. I think we are maybe getting an interrupt while in panic. Yeah, we definitely don't want to be able to get interrupts while in panic. That's that's an issue. Now, I don't think it's the issue. If we had an interrupt happen when APIC is held, then we wouldn't EOI. I think. Maybe. M maybe? Try serial. Okay. Nope, still broken. What the fuck? What is going on? Why does it work? I can't I can't wait to figure out what this bug is cuz it's going to be it's going to be brutal, man. It's going to be brutal. Um Why do you decide to only have network boot? I really only do network booting for um, all my operating systems. It's it's just so much easier to work with than uh, disk boots. Disk boots add more restrictions on your bootloader, and you also, uh, I mean, I'm not gonna run a floppy or a USB every time I'm gonna boot my OS. So that's the that's the biggest reason why is it just makes uh, the development cycle a lot faster, and if the development cycle is faster, I get more done. So, I, man, I have no idea. 
CPU halt, enable interrupts. And this works. I, I, I have n no idea why. No idea why. Mm -hmm. I, I don't get that. I don't. If we're in an interrupt, it works. If we're not, it doesn't. What? I don't understand how hitting panic. Here we'll panic. We'll go right into panic at the very top and we'll CPU halt. When we hit a panic, we'll just halt. Z. Z. Okay, this is fine. Alright. So we have something here. This is working. Let's move this down to here. Oh, we did this, and it was an init issue. It's when we sent init. And then when we move this after init, then we have problems. Uh... We disabled multi-core, but I think we've had that disabled for a while. Get rid of this serial. Oh, we're not causing a panic. No, we are causing a panic. This should be hitting bye-bye. Let's see, scroll. Oh, it won't be printing. But... We should be theoretically hitting that. Getting past that init. Here we're going to create a new serial port. Still fine. Here we're going to write to the serial port. Yep, there's the blank lines. Okay, then we're going to write panic information out. If it's null, we won't. There's our bye bye. And it's working. Just fine to this stage. So we're fine here. Now, is this the first time we've had multiple cores disabled? Is that what it is? Um, I think it's because we're not waiting for those cores to come up. I think we need to write uh, ACPI parsing. And we need to bring up the cores more correctly. OK. If I move this halt past here, now that halt's not reachable. Does this break? No, this still works. Which means this is fine with a single processor. OK. So let's grab this delay. Um, we'll make the delay pub. OK, check this out. Uh, while. Uh, we'll just do this, uh, panic, delay, we'll wait, we'll, we'll wait about a second, um, so this will delay for a second before we panic, and this will still work, doop, there's the panic, blank, panic, okay, now, we'll bring up other cores, There's the panic, and we work fine. Yeah, um, the issue is something related to sending the init signal while the other uh, processors are coming online. 100%, uh, that's what the problem is. And the reason why the panic, that's why the panic or the exception failed, because the, they were automatic and it happened instantaneously after, um, they happened instantaneously and that's why they behave differently than the interrupt, because even the 10 milliseconds it takes for me to hit Shift-Z delays um, that init. Uh, yeah. 
So we need to bring the cores up one by one, and we need to prevent enabling interrupts prior to all the cores being online. So I can also do this. Well, it doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, this, this fixes it. And if I go to like 3 million, that's probably sufficient. Just need to give enough time for the other cores to come online. Yeah, and this works. Okay, so... <clears throat> Okay, um, that makes sense. I, I, I have talked about a couple times before that we're not initting the processors correctly. So this will break. Uh, yeah, there we go, it broke. And then if we put the delay back in, we'll put, we'll put this delay in, and then we'll reboot it and we'll try it a, a billion times. But it, um, that's definitely the problem. And that's why you don't see a problem in the VM is because those inits are emulated and so they behave slightly different. So what we're going to do is, wow, we wrote a lot of fucking code today. Holy shit. Okay, um, yeah, so uh, we need to write an ACPI parser so we can get access to we're going to write an ACPI parser so we can get a list of all the processors on the system. Then we'll bring up the cores one by one. And then we won't allow anything to execute until all the cores are online. So we'll basically block until all cores have been up and initialized. And then at that point, we can enable interrupts um, and continue execution. So for some reason, if we init, if we send an init, before like the processors are up or something, we're having some serious problems. Uh, and maybe it's because we're knitting multiple times potentially. So we need to figure that out. How far are you? We're, we're doing decently, uh, or we're decently far here. Um, we're about to write some nice parser to parsers uh, so we can get rid of all these prints that we added in Pixie. This whole file, we can undo everything. And then in bootloader, I think we opened that file recently, so I think we can undo everything in here. Correct, we can. Cargo, uh, whoops, cargo, ah, history C, cargo run. All right, let's see. Okay, now we won't have the, oh, it won't get a new bootloader. The soft reboot only reboots, only replaces the kernel. It doesn't replace the bootloader. So we'll let that reboot. Okay, this, nice. Local panic, bye-bye. Soft reboot requested. And then we start and we bring everything up. So that's what we should get on real hardware now. <clears throat> and yeah, we need to write stuff that will walk ACPI tables. So to do that, let's take a look at the ACPI specification. I think it's on like 5.0 or 6.0 at this point. Um, 6.3. Okay, so we're going to use this ACPI spec. And ACPI is basically how all of the like power controls are done on the processor, how you go into like sleep states. Uh, you actually can't shut down your computer without ACPI. It's been around for a long time, and it's pretty fundamental to... Um, how everything works. But, um, okay. Uh, sorry, reading the Discord. Okay, so yep, this works. We can uh, soft reboot and everything. And what we want to do is uh, ACP. We want to use ACPI to determine what processors are present on the system, and then we'll use that to specifically bring them up one at a time, and then wait for them to complete the boot process. 
And then once they have completed the boot process, then we can um, we can block because we'll know how many cores should be coming up. Uh, can't you just halt to shut down PC? That's the only thing you can do without ACPI. Don't get ACPI confused with APIC. <laughs> APIC and ACPI are different things, unfortunately. They're very similar, but I mean, from an OS dev perspective, they're quite different. But from a, um, yeah, from a, uh, like, normal programmer world, they're, they're quite similar. Okay. So ACPI, you basically get these tables. And the way that historically ACPI has worked um, was it was mainly just for power control and uh, sleep states and other things related to power. Uh, and then, basically, ACPI has turned into the dumpster of where you put configuration and features. So if we take a look at the things that ACPI now handles, it handles your power states, your device power management, uh, co controlling device power, plug and play events, battery management, thermal management, uh, <laughs> flexible architecture support, uh, it has your memory maps, yeah, so it has all these different tables. Uh, <laughs> uh, root system, uh, yeah, the battery table, the affinity table, we're going to want that. Uh, feature tables, memory, firmware, uh, non-volatile DIM, secure devices, heterogeneous mem memory attributes, platform debugging stuff. It's like, basically what they did is they, they made it so nothing is the BIOS anymore, and I never took this giant shit into ACPI. So now ACPI does everything. So what you do is the BIOS is like two lines of code, and then you have ACPI, which is basically an entire operating system. Very similar to EFI, <laughs> where it's just massive amounts of stuff. Now, ACPI is really interesting because it has... ACPI tables can include uh, code that you kind of need to write like a virtual machine to parse. <laughs> It's really fucky. It's really fucky. But yeah, it turns out ACPI is a uh, about 11,000 line of code specification. Um, yeah. <laughs> that virtual machine is horrible. Yeah, it really is. It's, it's so stupid. It's just such a fucking dumb concept. And... I wonder who is uh, behind making it. It's let's see, let's see who is one of the like the core people. I think it's like Intel. I think they made it, and then everyone kind of followed suit. But look at all this shit, all this revisions. They add so much shit. Look at this. Look at these revisions. <laughs> there we go. Oh, now we're at the table of contents. Holy fuck. Luckily, we only need a couple things out of here, and we don't actually have to write a uh, virtual machine parser. But that's the ASL and AML. That's, like, their languages. <laughs> History of ACPI. Collaboration between Intel, Microsoft, Toshiba, HP, and Phoenix, which is a BIOS manufacturer. Yeah. Firmware, ACPI, operating system. Yeah, so firmware... Basically, the way it works is typically the firmware will populate these ACPI tables. I'm not going to blame my employer. <laughs> uh, basically, the, the hardware at boot time during the firmware is going to initialize... Uh, it's going to initialize all of these tables effectively. Um, and then you can go through, oh, you can grab this, and then you can, that gets compiled, that makes the byte code, and then you make an interpreter in your OS, so you have a, a byte code interpreter of these ACPI structures. <laughs> it's, like, it's exactly what we fucking want. God, it's so bad, man. Ugh. Dude, just make, like, nested tables. Why why do you why do you need a fucking interpreter to describe 
the topology of the CPU and features that are present. It's so stupid, man. It's really just for proprietary bullshit. Would JSON be better? Fuck no. Just have structures. Just have in-memory structures of fixed sizes. And then nest them. Or have dictionaries of them. There's no reason to use complex data structures in a fucking BIOS. So many quirks in the MSVM implementation, table parsers that Linux had to adopt all of them. Oh my god. XML with name so uh, spaces. No, we need soap. <laughs> That's what we need. We need some good old soap. Um Oh, your, your lid, all this shit. Ugh, it's just so stupid. It's so stupid. The, the fact that, like, basically every single hardware, like, every single piece of hardware you need to emulate to make a full system emulator is like a drop in the bucket compared to ACPI. Computer industry is so consistently bad making specifications. Yeah, it's pretty bad. I remember dumping, patching, and reading my uh, DSDT on my first notebook to have a, a working battery under Linux. Yeah, that sounds about right. Like, look at this shit. Ugh. Uh, we're not even at the uh, spec part. Jesus. Okay, all we care about... Uh, software programming model. Here we go. So here's how it works. You have an RSD pointer. Um, and that RSD pointer has a pointer to the XSDT, and then the XSDT points to all these different tables. Um... So basically, we're going to find the RSD pointer, and then we're going to parse all of these tables uh, based off of that, and then they reference all each other and all sorts of shit. Um, <laughs> yep, and then you have all of this stuff that, yeah, it goes into this cloud. That's your ACP dri ACPI driver, and then it just all works somehow. So, Okay. How do y'all think we find the RSD pointer? <clears throat> we, we want to figure out where the root of the ACPI tables. So for like Pixie, uh, we asked the BIOS where, we asked the BIOS where it was. Uh, for the COM ports, they were at a fixed address on the system. Uh, for PCI devices, you can enumerate them and it tells you where the PCI devices are. <laughs> oh, oh, for the RSD pointer, yeah, we're, we're just going to have to scan memory. We're going to have to write fucking cheat engine over here to do an in-memory scan for the letters RSD space pointer space. That's apparently step one of the specification. When they were designing it, there's like, how should we have it? How, how should you be able to find this table? I don't know. Just make sure it's in the lower mega memory and then just tell people to scan for it. It's on a 16-byte boundary. Just fucking scan for it. <laughs> It's just fucking so bad. It's just so stupid. Ah, it's infuriating. I, I just, I. Ah. Yeah, here we go. Finding the RSDP on IA32 systems. <laughs> The OSPM finds the RSDP structure by searching physical memory ranges on 16-byte boundaries for a valid RSDP structure, signature, and checksum as follows. <laughs> Fuck off! Why? <laughs> it's like, what are you doing? How do you implement a specification that's that fucking bad? 
Oh, how do you launch an executable on Windows? Well, the first thing you do is you randomly search through all of memory for a PE file on the di or you search through all of disk sectors for a PE file. And when you see something with a valid PE file, you arbitrarily run it. And then if it looks like it did the right thing, you ask the user, was this what you wanted? And then if they click yes, the program continues executing. This <laughs> is like, what the fuck is this? Ah! So this is what we have to implement. This is why I've been putting this off. This is why we had this bug, because I wanted to just lazily boot all the other processors and just kind of delay until everything's up. But the correct way to do it is to use the ACPI tables to determine what processors are present on the system, and then we'll use that to set up, figure out which ones we can address, and we'll bring them up one at a time, and we'll wait for them to launch before we actually do anything. <sighs> yeah. All right. So that's what we have to do. That's what we have to do. <laughs> Hope y'all are excited. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So the first one kilobyte of the EBDA. The EBDA can be found in the two-byte location, this, on the BIOS data area. Um... Let's see, searching physical memory ranges on 16 byte boundaries for valid RSDP checksum as follows. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're going to deref 40OE, uh, so 40E, we're gonna read that memory. That's gonna have a two byte pointer. That's gonna be a pointer to the EBDA. And then we'll search the first fir kilobyte of the EBDA. And if that doesn't work, then we'll look through this reg region of memory, this BIOS read-only space in E1000 e to F, Fs, many Fs. <sighs> you see why I was putting this off? Easy peasy, yeah. All right. This is also how we're going to get NUMA aware uh, memory models. So we'll probably do this in the same go. This also means we probably won't be able to get to network drivers uh, just because we, ha we have to fucking do this. Kernel source, ACPI. You know, if we get this working in like one hour, then we might be able to do a network driver. So let's see what we can do here. Um, mod ACPI. Pub. Uh, here we're gonna say an implementation for uh, scanning and finding uh, ACPI tables. Um, okay. Scanning uh, an implementation, f uh, a very lightweight ACPI implementation for extracting basic information about. Uh, about uh, CPU topography and uh, NUMA memory regions. Okay, uh, and this will do. We don't have anything online yet. One-time in initialization. We'll get exclusive access to the APIC. Okay. Oh, that's to bring up the other cores. We're not going to do that. So we'll get rid of this code. And now we don't have problems. We can get rid of this delay. We don't, we don't want to use delays. Whenever you're writing code and you use a delay and you're relying on a delay for something to work, uh, it's typically a sign that you did something very wrong. <laughs> just, just TLDR. It typically means you did something very wrong. If you're waiting on a sleep or something... Okay, bye-bye. Cool, so that works. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna have fn init, uh, pub unsafe fn init, and this is going to initialize the ACPI table. So we'll do, um, uh, we'll do a 
unsafe acpi init okay oh we didn't write that okay now we have this now we have to scan um uh, specification says we have to scan from the uh, the first one kilobyte of the EBDA and the um, and the range from OX E1234 to OX F F F F F. Okay, so EBDA is equal to uh, use MM. mm read fizz and we get this from 40e um okay uh this is crate so we're gonna read uh as const oh this is fizz adder um ox 40e this will grab self and Fizz adder. Oh, fizz adder is in page table. Use crates mm. Use page table fizz adder. Okay, so we're gonna read sixteen bytes, or a uh, 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 sixteen bit number. So this is it gets the pointer to the EBDA from the um, uh, BIOS data area. So print EBDA address is at hex this EBDA. Okay, and this should be a pointer to somewhere in memory where the EBDA is present. Okay, 9FC0 looks great. So now we're going to uh, let regions is equal to, we're going to have two regions. We're going to have EBDA to EBDA plus 1000, uh, 1024 minus one. Um, and then we'll do read fizz uh, U16 as a, probably a U size, to be honest. Cast that up to a U size. Actually, we'll do U64. And then that that's the range. So that's the first range. Uh, first one kilobyte of the EBDA. And then this next range is... Um, this next range is uh, from OXEO123 to OXFF123. OX E O O O O OX one two three four five. Okay. Uh, compute the regions we need to scan for the RSDP. I started building an OS and was trying to remember why I didn't need to scan memory for RSDP. I remember I was using UEFI and it was in the system table. Yep. Guess for BIOS they did the shittiest implementation possible. Because um, they wanted people to use UEFI. Well, UEFI didn't really exist at the time. So for a while, there wasn't really an option to use UEFI. UEFI didn't really become a thing, honestly, until like... I mean, it's always been around. It's been around for decades. But UEFI on x86 systems didn't really start to become a thing until like 2012, 2013. So, and this spec goes back to the early 90s. A lot of other systems used EFI, um, but for some reason, uh, Intel motherboard manufacturers seem to always lag behind. And I think that's just due to uh, people being scared about the compatibility. So for start and in regions, I should be able to do this. Uh, I gotta ref that, and then we'll ref this, the tuple, copy that out, and then what we're gonna do for 
uh, let start is equal to uh, start plus OXF. Um, start plus OXF and not OXF. And this is 16 bytes align the uh, start address upwards. Okay, so we 16 byte align up the start address upwards. Then while start is less than end, um, actually we'll just do a for start uh, for address, we'll say it for physical address in start to end, step by uh, 16 bytes. So we'll go through each 16 byte offset. Uh, go through each 16 bytes and dot dot equals offsets in the range specified. Um, now the spec doesn't say if it can straddle the end or if we need to make sure the RSD pointer is in bounds here. Nevertheless, here's the RSDP structure. It starts with a RSD pointer uh, string. So what we can do is we can say if uh, let sig is equal to read fizz of a u8 for 8 bytes at fizz adder, p adder. So dependent, depending on this alignment and rounding, we actually don't know if that's in bounds, but we're just going to go out of bounds and be fine with that because it doesn't really specify in the spec if, it, if the whole table has to fit in that range, right? I don't know if I can add and make sure I can bounce check this physical address. So here's what I could do. Let uh, struct end is equal to, this is byte offset 33, byte length 3. So that's the 36. So that says that this whole structure is 36 bytes. So we'll say struct end is equal to start plus 36. Uh, compute the end of the structure. Uh, minus one, end address of the RSDP structure. If struct end is greater than the end, if it's equal, that's fine. Continue. And then that will continue. That'll consume the rest and it'll break out. I technically can do break here. That's better. Um, Break out of the scan if we break out of the scan if we are out of bounds of this region. So we round that up. We then go through each from the start to the end. There we add 1024 minus 1. We don't have to worry about integer overflows on any of these things because they're all so low and we're working in U64s. Take the start plus 36, which is the size of an RSDP, and we might make a structure refer, uh, representation of that. Nevertheless, uh, we'll do an mm read fizz. Actually, we're going to make a structure. Um, Repr c struct rsdp. Uh, we'll have a signature. This is a u8 for 8 bytes. Um, so this is in memory represent of an RSD pointer, RSDP, ACPI structure. So we have a signature, we have a checksum, which is a byte. We have an OEM identifier, which is a U8 for six. We have a revision, which is a U8. We have an RSDT address. It's uh, U32, that's actually aligned. Physical address of the RSDT. We have a length of the, of the table in bytes, starting from field zero. It's used to record the size of the entire table. It's not available in ACPI 1.0, okay. XSDT, um, adder, this is a U64 and that is aligned 24 yeah 24 is aligned so we don't have to rep or pack this yet uh extended checksum 
So U8, and then reserved. That's a U8 for three. Okay. I'm actually pretty on point with my uh, spaces there. So now I can read an RSDP from there. And we'll print this. We'll hex pretty print this structure. Um, derive, clone, copy, debug. Okay. And then here we'll say if sig is not equal to b rsd pointer, if the uh, table, if the table dot signature is not equal to this continue. So at this point we found one, then we'll have to check some all this shit, but uh, ballpark in it. Um, print the table. So this is an attempt at finding the RSDP, reboot, and here we go. So we found something that looks like an RSDP. Here's the address of something, and then that's gonna go through all the ranges, all the regions. Um, so this will just keep scanning for everything requested, and then here we can say uh, core mem size of RSDP minus one. So compute the end uh, as U64. Okay, so now this this will still work. Beautiful. And we should be able to, yeah. Okay, so that fun RSDP. We have an OEM identifier. I think that's like QEMU, actually. Or that's BOC. Is this box? Is this box? Yeah, I think this has box. B-O-C-H-S. Um, and then a space. Um, and then we have a checksum here, and the way that the checksum is computed is it is the checksum of the fields defined in the ACPI 1.0 specification. This includes the first 20 bytes of this table, 0 to 19, including the checksum field. They, might sum, they must sum to 0. This is for the length of the table, the length of the table in bytes, including the header, starting from offset 0. Oh, wait, not the length. Uh, extended checksum. For the entire table, including both checksum fields. So for that, that's for the whole table. Um, this is only valid for revision two and above, which is ancient, so we're not too worried about it. So um, read the table. Then we're gonna do this for aliasing. We're gonna, uh, we're just gonna say U8 for uh, core mem size of RSDP. Uh, so here we'll read the a U8 for that. Okay. Uh, read the tables bytes. Table bytes. Uh, so we can check some it. We don't really care about performance here, so I'm fine just doing another read here rather than casting this structure to bytes. Uh, so we're gonna read all of the bytes, and then here. We will do a um, let sum is equal to table bytes dot fold o u eight, and this will have an accumulator and a byte. We'll do accumulator wrapping add x, uh, and that will do a sum of the whole table. And then we're gonna say if sum is not equal to zero, continue. Um, read the table's bytes, and then check sum the table. If it's not equal to zero, so the whole thing sums to zero. That's how a lot of these uh, early boot checksums are implemented. Um, table bytes dot iter dot fold. Oh, iter. Yeah, we got to iter fold it. Okay. Check sum the table. And then if it's not equal to zero, then, okay, unsafe, we have no unsafe here. Okay, that's in main. Uh, here we go, reset. Um, there we go, so we were able to find this table. Uh, the checksum matches, the signature matches, and I think that's pretty much all they let us check. Um, 
the signature and the checksum match. So at this point, the signature matches, the checksum matches, we found an RSDP. Let's mute RSDP is none. Um, holds the RSDP structure if found. And then here we'll do let RSDP is equal to RSDP dot expect um, failed to find RSDP for ACPI. Okay, and then this will do RSDP is equal to sum table break. And we got two for loops, so we got to break RSDP search. Break RSDP search. So at that point, we found it, and then we'll unwrap it. Um, get access to the RSDP. And then if we failed to find it, then we would... Um, Nice. If we fail to find it, let's do, let's put an A here, RSD pointer A. Fail to find RSDP, and I should be able to reset. Uh, why is that happening? Um, can I not soft reboot at this stage? I've, I've initialized my APIC. I should be able to. So let's see. Fail to get that. We panicked in there. Z. Handler did not, uh, handler did not install or did not match for deregister. Oh, yeah, we don't need to do that anymore. So let's go into um, kernel source APIC. And we'll get rid of this delay. Delay, delay, drop on the APIC. Okay, this, and then we shouldn't have to enable the pick like that. So we'll just uh, disable the APIC by writing a zero to the APIC enable bit, and then that will do everything that we need to do that'll mask off the LVT. So let's try this, reset. Okay, we can reset there. Let's try it on the hardware. Boom, reset. Okay, so we can soft reboot there. And then let's uh, let's fix this. And then let's print this table. Uh, debug, hex print, everything, RSDP. Now this will give us the table here and here on hardware. Okay, it works. <laughs> it works both here and on hardware. So now we can do, now that we have our soft reboot in a good state, we can actually do our testing on both kind of in parallel. So we'll never really have a massive deviation from uh, either. So everything will be much better supported in both situations. Come back and we're doing ACPI tables. You're gonna build a, a processor for the instructions? Fuck no. <sighs> Hate that shit. I have no need for that. Luckily, the information I need, I don't need to write those. God, it's such a stupid spec, man. We were, we were ranting about it earlier, how, how dumb it is. That one's Lenovo. Oh, yeah. Nice. Checks out. Now you know that this whole stream isn't pre-recorded and fake. Well, that's not necessarily true. I, it, it still could be fake. <laughs> Revision 2. It's, actu it's actually running on real hardware. This isn't rigged. I'm not pretending like this code actually works. It does. Uh... We got that table. I think we only actually care about the XSDT. Um, 64-bit physical address of the XSDT. And I think, let's take a look here. Uh, we'll close everything except we care about the software programming model. And then we care about the, that points to the XSDT, which is all we really care about. And then we'll look at the, um, so here's the RSDP structure, and then the XSDP, uh, where is it, XSDT. So the XSDT 
has all of the tables in there. Yeah, this is pointers to all of the tables, all the 64-bit pointers. Um, 8 times n, where n is, the fuck is n? n is the number of entries, the number of tables. Uh, oh, you compute it off the lank field. OK, so we'll read this checksum. Entire table must sum to 0. And that's for the length. Length in bytes of the entire table implies the number of entry fields at, OK, so yeah, it implies the number. Fucking stupid. Um, why is your cursor so big? It's because uh, I have a high uh, DPI monitor. The one you're looking at isn't high DPI, but another one is. So, and I'm just used to it now. <laughs> but if you have uh, a mixed DPIs, um, that's what Linux will do, or X will do. I think Wayland's probably better about it, but uh, okay. So now we're going to uh, get, uh, this is going to be the um, XSDT pointer is equal to RSDP. Well, we know that. XSDT, we will read the header of the XSDT. And let me see if my MM, kernel source MM, if this read fizz, yeah, we're gonna make this take a sized, maybe. Um, yeah, so we have the XSDT next. Um, XSDT, ACPI structure. Uh, st struct xsdt, here we'll have a signature, uh, u8 for 4, length, a u32, vision, a u8, checksum, a u8, an oem id, a u8 for 6, oem table id, um, which is an, a u8 for 8, an OEM revision, which is, a, I'm guessing, a U32. Honestly, this is aligned, so we'll just say a U64 for this. And the other one's aligned, of course. And then the uh, creator ID is a U32. And then the creator revision is a U32. And then the entries are dynamic, and we'll, uh, we'll do that in a slightly different way. Okay. So we will read the XSDT by doing a um, mm read fizz and XSDT from the RSDP XSDT address. And that's a fizz adder. So this is the XSDT, checks out, wait, that does not check out, that's null, are you fucking serious? There's no XSDT on the system, okay, so we can use the RSDT instead, uh, is there one on this? Yeah, so this system has an XSDT. Um, fuck. Okay, so we need to handle RSDT only. I think that might be fine. The RSDT only supports 32-bit, uh, but it should be the same structure. So let's do this. RSDT. I hope I don't have to parse both, but I think I might have to. RSDT, RSDT, address... Uh, and what do we have? Signature for four, length for four, checksum for one, uh, a revision for one, checksum for one, OEM ID for six, table ID for eight, revision, creator ID, creator revision. Yeah, it's, it's identical. It's basically the 32-bit version of the table. Um, 
95 as u64 okay here we go and that should check out uh, assert rsdt dot signature is equal to b rsdt um, this will be rsdt signature mismatch that's definitely a panic get the rsdt now we'll also we'll want to check summit but sweet that matches works on real hardware as well perfect so now we have a bunch of 32-bit entries here um and to check some of this we'll actually do we'll go by the length uh let's length so go to rsdt dot length uh hmm tables tables is equal to rsdt dot length minus a uh, checked sub mm uh, rsdt uh, core mem size of rsdt that's the header we're going to subtract off the size of the header expect integer underflow on rsdp length and then uh Uh, table bytes uh, Size of that as u64 There we go, so we'll get the uh, This is like remaining bytes or entry bytes or something like that. I think table bytes is fine uh, get the number of bytes for the RSDT table yeah, Rust automatically adds size. Yeah, you have to do question size if it's not size. So I think in our case, we're going to... Um, oh, it's U32. In this case, it's fine. So check sub that. And then we can do entries. Assert uh, table bytes dot len mod core mem size of u32 is equal to zero um invalid uh table size for rsdt we're, we're just making this super strict the stricter the better in my opinion uh, oh table bytes as u size mod that and we just closed it on accident kernel source acpi Okay, looks good. And then let table entries is equal to table bytes divided by core mem size of u32. Okay, and then here's what we can do. Um, uh, as u32. Okay. Divide that down. Looks great. Now, what we can do is let bytes. Uh, now we're going to uh, check the check sum for the RSDT. To do this, we're going to go through each of the bytes. We're going to go for patter in RSDP dot RSDT adder dot dot RSDP dot RSDT adder plus table. Uh, rsdt.length. At this point, we validated the length as much as we can. Um, I could fold here. Uh, dot fold 0 u8. We have an accumulator and a patter. And what we'll do is we will. So we're going to go through each of the bytes. rsdt.length, and then we'll do uh, uh, mm read fizz, fizz adder patter, and then we'll do accumulator wrapping add this. 
Okay. And then assert uh, sum is equal to this. Or we can assert. How do I want to format this? Uh, dot fold here, this, this, this. And we'll say rsd t sum. Assert rsd rsd t sum is equal to zero. rsd t check sum invalid. Uh, physical address as u64. Okay, check some matches. Everything's good. Works both on physical and that, so it looks like all of our lengths and all of the bytes that we feel are included in the checksum are included correctly. Okay. Okay. Um, looks great. What's the use case for custom kernels? Why would you need one? It's mainly so I get full control of hardware and I can cut down on the noise uh, from normal systems. So I want this environment to be very quiet such that I can do research in this environment uh, against the CPU to figure out how CPUs work and what's going on internally in them. Um, so that's one of the things. And another part is I want to be able to write a hypervisor and I don't want to use existing hypervisor technology because they are typically very slow uh, because they're generic, right? They do more than what I need them to do and so they're much slower at the specific things I want to do. I also like to use bleeding edge hardware features that come out much faster than um, operating systems add support for. Quiet like uh, the hardware itself making noise? No, I just mean quiet in terms of uh, the system not doing anything. Like if it's idle, it does nothing. There's no threads that it's switching in, no, no tasks that are running on the side, no timers getting kicked off. If I disable interrupts in the system, I know that literally nothing is happening. The processor is doing nothing, and that's what I want. Yeah, I just want it to be uh, completely silent. So I might actually have to implement an interrupt handler for um, the serial port so that I don't have to use the timer to check that uh, at some point just so I can get that noise down. Is it going to have multitasking then? then? Uh, no, it's not. It will not have multitasking. Okay. Check the checksum of the RSDT. So now we have the RSDT, and this has all the tables. If I'm not mistaken, those point to other description headers, and that's just all of these. I think we literally just go through and we get all of the headers now. So for entry and table entries. Um, uh, zero dot dot table entries let. Uh, We'll say entry patter is equal to rsdt dot rsdp dot rsdt adder plus um, core mem size of rsdt plus entry times core mem size of U32, uh, get the physical address of the RSDP uh, table entry, and then table pointer is equal to mm read fizz, fizz adder entry patter as U64, entry physical address, and this is a U32. Get the pointer to the table, and then here I should be able to do um, let signature say so u8 for four. So you can let mm read fizz fizz adder entry uh, table pointer as u64 print table this signature, and this should print all of the different signatures for all the different tables, and this is a 
as a U32. Um, you know what? We'll up this to a U64. U size. That's this. Table entries as U size. Okay, so this will go through and print all of the tables. Is it just one? Maybe I went to the wrong table. Maybe there's just only one in this implementation. This might be a really lightweight um, uh, ACPI implementation for this virtual machine, which would make sense. Can we just use core mem size of? I, I'm so used to using that explicit, but sure. Uh, percent s core mem size of size of g. Yeah, I guess if I'm using that a lot, it makes sense. One twenty five. Isn't the size of a U thirty two always four bytes? It is, but I think it's more clear to not use uh magic numbers. I think it's important to mention the reason why I'm multiplying it by 4. I'm not multiplying it by 4. I'm multiplying it by the number of bytes in a U32. So it helps uh, indicate what my intentions are. Here we'll do a uh, core stir from raw parts. Or no, from raw parts. Wow. From UTF-8. Unwrap. And... Put a reference there. Uh, APIC. Wow. That, that's the table that I want. Sweet. It's important to not write magical numbers. <clears throat> I don't think I'm writing that anywhere, am I? I don't think I have that right, Fizz. I think you'll find that that was temporary uh, code that we were planning to replace. <clears throat> I think you'll find that uh, all of that is commented out because it's uh, we're replacing it with the code that supersedes it. <laughs> that code is is not is not ready for production. Okay. So now we're going to parse out the tables that we care about. Um, and we found an APIC table. MADT. The MADT. Oh, yep. It is the APIC signature. Yeah, so this is the MADT. The signature is APIC. Um... The revision for all these things. Che technically, we should be checking the revisions. And then this has the 32-bit physical address of which each processor can access its local interrupt controller. Um, interesting. So that's where the that's where the APIC has been mapped. We remap the APIC, um, so we forcibly move it if it's not in where we uh, where we want it to be. So we don't care about that. What we do care about... Oh, no, I forgot. Yeah, this is a weird table. This will go into... Um, this has this structure, and then these have different meanings. It's like a uh, nested table of a bunch of different things. Fuck. All right, well, anyways... If the signature is equal to ACPI, then this is going to be our ACPI uh, parser, or AAPIC. Uh, APIC. And this will be uh, get the signature for the table. And at this point, we're going to say um, parse MADT, and it will give it 
the table pointer as a physical address. As u64, okay. So then we'll have uh, fn parse madt, unsafe it, why not, doesn't matter. Uh, table pointer, eh, we'll just say pointer is the fizz adder. Okay, and then this will say print parsing MADT. And we should be hitting that print in both of these. Uh, oh, B, yeah, there we go. So in this one, parsing MADT, this one, parsing MADT, okay. So this is going to tell us where the apics are. So this will uh, go through each table, uh, each table described by the RSDT. And then here we're gonna parse the MADT. The way we're gonna do this is, I think they all use the same header at this point. Signature length revision checksum, OEM ID, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so this is actually in the representation of an ACPI uh, table header. So this will be a header. And then uh, percent s rsdt header g okay cool so here what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a um pub unsafe fn parse table um uh, parse header this is gonna return a Um, header, probably the size of the remaining bytes, something like that. Um, this, okay. This will take a an address fizz adder rsdt adder. This will switch to address. Compute the checksum for the table. Uh, get the number of bytes uh, for the table. That's for checking that down here. Okay, get, uh, read the header. We're gonna check the signature down here too. Uh, read the header at that address. Head, RSDT, head. Get the number of bytes for the table. Uh, ooh, this is a payload len is equal to head length, check sub that, integer overflow on table length. Okay, and then this will compute the checksum for the table, and this will be uh, table checksum invalid. And then we can actually print this. Um, stir from UTF eight in this case uh core stir from utf8 and we'll uh put a question mark here and this will be on the head signature okay check the signature sum is equal to this take the head length okay we have the address to the end, go through all the bytes, read them, sum them up. Uh, in this case, we already have it. It's just adder. Um, that's gonna fold. We got uh, this. If the unwrap fails, that'll be uh, it'll just print none. And this will be a sum. Table checksum invalid. Uh, check the checksum. Okay, I'm fine with that code like that. 
Then here we'll return a head and payload len as u size. So this will uh, return the parsed header. And this will parse a standard ACPI table header. This will parse out the header, validates the checksum and length, and return the size of the payload uh, after the header. Pretty clear. Uh, here we're going to initialize the ACPI subsystem, uh, mainly looking for Apix and uh, memory maps. Okay. 52. Expected U64, head.length. Done. 122. Okay. Now we'll have let RSDT, RSDT payload is equal to RSDT um, parse header, rsdp.rsdt address. Um, if the rsdt.signature, okay, uh, parse out the rsdt, check the signature, and um, so we rsdt payload as a size. Valid table size for that, and then we div that down by this to get the number of table entries. Table entries is already a u size at this point. Okay. Table bytes, correct. This is uh, RSDT payload, RSDT entries, RSDT entries. Okay, uh, 123. Uh, fizz adder. As u64. Okay, header declared as private. Why is that pub? Okay. Parse a header. Um, unused variables. Some other shit. It's not used. See this chapter six. Uh, what is it? Uh, maybe have chapter six in the instruction set extensions. No, that one sounds new ish to me. Unnecessary, unsafe. No, that was not the location of the unnecessary, unsafe. It's this one. Oops. Okay, let's clean up some of these. Main, APIC, 50, not used. Um, no problem. Done. 149. Uh, we got some unreachable shit. Just halt. Get rid of that. Done. Okay, so parse MADT. Awesome. So now we're back into ACPI. We're gonna parse the MADT. Uh, so let header uh, payload, uh, we'll say header size is equal to um, parse header pointer. And that'll get us the MADT. Now we can print this, it doesn't matter. So uh, parse the um, MADT out of the ACPI tables, uh, parse the MADT header. Now we have a payload. That payload, we validated everything, and now we have this structure type. And this will describe IO Apex and all of, all of these different crazy things. Um. Instruction to have hypervisor manager VM's page table contents and enforce them to prevent ring zero tampering. Oh, interesting. Uh, let me see, section six.
interesting. Oh yeah, that's new. Yeah, all this stuff is new. The bleeding edge. Yeah, it's gonna be a clusterfuck. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> Intel does not have a great uh, track record with security features. They implement things uh, under the hopes of security, and then, um, yeah, and then make it pretty much impossible to do correctly. Okay. Boop. Oh, that's, yeah, that's the reboot. Perfect. Press the MADT, and now we have to go through all of these entries in the interrupt control structure, uh, and we'll return a payload pointer. Uh, return the size, return a physical, a, a physical address, and size of the payload following the header. So that's all been validated, and then parse header. Perfect. Uh, RSDP payload size. Yeah, RSDT payload. Uh, RSDT size, size. Go through all the entries, and then this is the physical address of the RSDT payload. Dot zero plus. The entry times that. Probably should actually have this compute that. This will be um, adder dot zero plus. This is a fizz adder. Plus the uh, size of a header. Okay, 152. Payload, header payload size is equal to that. Got some issues up here. Oh, that just barely fits to the character. I love when that happens. Entry as B64. Ah. It says U size on that one. It's, it's the same. Uh, it's just the least amount of casting. Okay, uh, parse the header. And now we go through all of the bytes. And the way this works, and I realize this is probably unreadable on stream. Um, so this has the interrupt controller structures. And the way that that is implemented is it has these. And these structures, um, are these the flags, multiple APIC flags? Oh, there's some other stuff here. The local interrupt controller address, the flags. The system also has a PCAT dual 8259 pick setup. The vectors must be disabled, that is masked, uh, when enabling the ACPI APIC operation. Um, so technically we could use that to determine whether or not we should be disabling the 8259. Now what we're going to do is... Then we have these structures. And I think there's a header. Yeah, we got all, we got all these different uh, structures that we have to parse, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, we have a type and a length for all of these structures. Yeah, so what we have to do is um, let ICS is equal to the payload dot zero plus four plus four. Uh, skip the local interrupt controller address and the flags. We don't care about either of those. And now we have the ICS. Um, to get the physical address of the ICS. And now what we're going to do is um, while 
let mute, uh, this will be mute ICS, fizz adder this, while the ICS is less than the uh, payload zero plus size. Uh, then we're going to uh, let, we gotta get all this information out. We will need the type, which is equal to the uh, mm read fizz. This is a u8. Uh, at ICS. Then we're going to read at len plus one. So we're going to generically read kind of that table because all of them start with a type length. Yeah. Then what we can do is ICS plus equals type dot zero. And then here what I can say is if ICS dot zero plus two is greater than, yeah, we'll do this loop. If the ICS that plus two is greater than the payload dot zero plus size, mm, let end is equal to payload dot zero plus size. If it's greater than the end, break. Otherwise, uh, make sure there's room for the type and the length. Type in the length. Then here, get the type and the length, and then here we'll make sure there's room uh, make sure there's room for this structure. If ICS.0 plus len as u64 is greater than end, break. Otherwise, we now have the structure and we can go to the next location by adding len as u size. So print type x type. Correct? Can I do dot zero plus equals uh, as u64? Um, oops, dot zero, dot zero, fizz adder, fizz adder. Mm, size. Where? 157? Here as u64. So you get the end address, if that plus two exceeds the end, then we have a problem. Okay, so this is gonna go through and print all the types that we have, oh shit. Okay, well clearly that did not work. ICS is equal to, um, fizz adder, ICS.0 plus, it made a copy of it, that's what it did when we did plus equals. Reset this, it's spewing, so it's not getting the reset request, but that's fine. Wait, really? Pillow plus that plus that, and is that. What? What? The length is zero on one of these. I'm just gonna see the len. I bet the length is zero for one of these. No idea why. Okay, uh, yeah, it's a type followed by length. Do you have to cast this as fizz adder? Uh, which ones? Payload size, so there's a zero length field. Is that the last one? Is the last one zero length? Is that the spec? Um, 
is a list of ICS. The first byte declares the type, and the second byte is the length of that structure. OK. If the length is 0, do we just break? What? What? I guess we'll say if the len is 0, break. But I feel like that's not correct. Reset. Yeah, we're getting nothing out of this table. Payload dot zero. Um, we're correctly finding just that one table. I'm doing something stupid here. Four four. Payload plus four plus four. Plus four plus four. These structures are always the same size. They should be. Uh, t uh, table ID revision, creator ID, creator revision. No. We skip over the flags. Skip over that. Let me print the payload length. the length that ICS plus one shouldn't it be plus four I don't think so yeah it's just one byte payload plus four plus four repeat the end what the fuck Um, we'll just print all of these. Uh, we'll print the pointer, payload, and end. Oh, and the ICS. Am I using payload? No, I am using ICS. And I'll print another one. Pointer, payload, ICS, and that's... Yeah, I'll put some question marks on these. Put some question marks on these. I don't want to figure out which one's which. I'll just do that. Uh, BDE5. Is that structure unaligned? Totally is, isn't it? That structure is totally unaligned. Gross. But it, it, it matches. Signature matches. Everything's good. Table pointer. Parsed MADT. We pass it that pointer. It passes. Passes the check. Uh, let's print the whole fucking thing. We'll print the uh, header. Just to see if it looks sane. MADT. Yep. No, that's right. That's wrong. That's an A. That's an A. Oh, A P I C. Yeah, that is A pick. Um, length revision checksum. This, blah blah blah. Everything looks good. Creator ID that looks good. Creator revision that looks good. And then I have the address. Of the payload, the ICS right here, which is just 8 plus that, which is true, which is, is that 90 off of there? No, this is the end. 134D. 134D. Can I print the whole payload? Uh, mm, for mm, pattern in... ICS dot dot n dot zero print hex. We'll do this because we can. 
Uh, clearly I'm doing something stupid, but uh, it'll show up pretty fast. I think this will be good. Oh, four X. I, I, MM, read, fizz, U8, fizz, adder, patter. Okay, and, uh, uh, U64. There we go. So, we got a 1-0. And what's a one type? Oh my god. Are these ACPI tables fucked? A type one. This is an IOAPIC structure. Is it 12 bytes? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, 12 is at C. That's a zero for eight. Oh, fuck you. And that's an APIC entry, eight plus C is 14, zero, eight. There's another APIC. Um, uh, we want to add eight to that one C. There's a one for C bytes for 12 hex bytes. Yep, there it is, 12 hex bytes. Uh, add C to that, that's 28. We've got a two for A bytes. Okay. Am I not skipping over something? Or is this entry? Um, I feel like that 0, 8 makes more sense. I'm off by 4 bytes. I think I'm off by 4 bytes. God, that bird flying into my window every morning. What is it doing? We're going to go... We add four, we add four. Bonk, yeah. We're gonna Python hex. This is where it starts. Wait. Payload. ICS. Here's ICS. <sighs> Come on. Copy, paste, hex, this, minus, hex of OX. The start of the table. And hex this. Oh, fuck. I don't want to hex it. What am I doing? What am I doing? I think I did this last time I did this too. Uh, 30. What's 30 hex? Decimal. Offset. 48. Oh, I'm off by... I added four too many. Payload plus four plus four. Is my payload off? Is my structure off? My header wrong? Let me do the math quick. Are any of these unaligned? I don't think so. Uh, four plus four plus one plus one plus six. Um, that's 16. Then we've got an eight plus four plus four plus four. That's 36. That's at offset 36. Okay. Math checks out. Everything's aligned here. Four, 32, eight, eight, six. That's an eight. That's an eight. That's eight byte aligned. That's fine. That's reproceed. We're going to take the physical address of the structure where we read it. We're going to add that, return that out. We get to this point. How are we off? Payload plus four. Plus four. What? Let's print the size of, um, what is the size of a header? Should be 36, uh, 36 decimal. So we'll print that decimal. I, 
I think it's 40. What? You know what? Rust is actually adding another field at the end. Because it, uh, yeah. Because 40 is the next alignment. And we're going to do this on this as well. We'll just say packed. Uh, we won't be able to do debug safely. If we do packed, I don't think debug is safe. Oh, but we're in unsafe code, so it doesn't care. Okay. All right. Well, that will fix that. 36. Okay. Well, yeah, we fixed it. It added padding at the end. Um, and I'm not going to do... I'm not going to have debug on these. Okay. 154. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye-bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Now we see the best parser in the world. And then here, assert len is greater than zero. Bad length for... Uh, length is greater than two, at least. Uh... MADT entry. Uh, ICS entry. Okay. There we go. So we have four APICs. We have a uh, an IO APIC, I think. Then we have some five interrupt source overrides. And then uh, APIC NMI. Debug is unsafe and packed. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I think it depends on the uh, I think it depends on the shape of the structure that you're working with. But uh, let's get this going and almost getting to the point where I can order lunch from Grubhub. Fucking excited for that. I'm hungry. I technically have a meeting at like two, I think, or one thirty. I have a weekly meeting. My only meeting every week. So that's my hard stop, which is in one, two, three, four and a half hours. So we can get a lot of shit done in four and a half hours, I think. Um, how's everyone at Microsoft getting on with quarantine? Everyone's working from home. I'm trying to flex my streaming as working. Um, which, worst case scenario, I take time off, but, uh, I actually do think this is the best solution to one of the problems I have right now. So, there's a surface I'm looking at right now that requires full system emulation. I have TKO fuzz, which is, holy shit. <laughs> Some deer just ran by, like, right next to my, uh, computer, and it made me fucking jump. I got spooked. Holy shit. Woof! How many people, uh, everyone at Microsoft? It's uh, the whole, everyone physically in the offices are not allowed to go in. Um, I'm sure there are some, like, essential personnel, of course, that have exemptions. But uh, for most people, you're not allowed to go in. Wildlife is attacking. Yeah, it did actually make me jump. Those deer are, yeah, they're still running around up there. They seem to be eating some of my leaves and my, one of my bushes. We'll grub up to liver chocolate walk, I wish. Uh, what fucking Disney World are you living in with all these animals? I live in the mountains. I live in the mountains on two acres. Do you have a uh, reverse sleep ske schedule? You're in the U.S., right? Yeah, I, 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 am, I am on a reverse sleep schedule. I got up at... Well, let's see. I think I, I think I got up right before sunset. I don't know what time I got up. I r honestly have no idea what times anything are. I lost power a couple days ago. I haven't set, I haven't set the timer, or I haven't reset the clock on my oven, which is what I usually glance at. So I know that it's nine o'clock now because I looked at my phone, but I know that I got up approximately at sunset. <laughs> That's approximately when I got up is sunset. Because I remember the sun was barely up when I got up. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mamba Dev. Hell yeah, thanks for the sub. Thank you so much. I hope you're enjoying. <laughs> My sleep schedule is over now. I'm going to... I think today is the day I fix it. I can probably flex this. I can probably go to bed at like 7 or 8 p.m. And if I go to bed at 7 or 8 p.m., I think I'm golden, right? Uh, 
I'll just get up at like probably four to six or something, and then the next day I'll try and get up at eight, and then I'll try to maintain. You fuckers have to stop making me dev for 18 hours a day. <laughs> don't know how you go for that long. I don't either, quite frankly. Uh, but it really doesn't phase me. If I'm actually coding something, I I can easily lose track of time, and I I don't even notice. I don't get hungry. I don't get tired. It's dangerous. The nights are really short here too right now. Well, they're starting to get shorter. Um, they're still not as short as they get to. I forget how short the, s the nights get. I think we don't actually go to uh, full nighttime here in Seattle. Like, we don't go to a technical night. To, to any realistic person, it's night, but it's not like the full, the full night. When you make it to 18, well, it was 16, but then I have uh, life outside of that. <laughs> Parse out the type and the length of the ICS uh, entry. Make sure there's room in this. Okay, so what we care about is we only care about the lay pick. Here about the local a pick. So we're gonna say if the type is zero, uh, l a pick entry, local a pick entry. Um, and we'll do this. We'll we'll match type, and we'll say zero, just so it's clear what we're doing. No, it's one. Yeah. Ah, uh, zero. Local a pick entry, and then everything else. Uh, don't really care for now. Uh, go to the next ICS entry, and then technically I could assert the sizes of these structures, and I will for this. Assert the len is equal to um, 8, invalid LAPIC entry, ICS entry. So we'll panic hard on that. <clears throat> Some of these structures can get fucked. Uh, it's passing those. So now... All we care about, what are these fields? Yeah, don't care, don't matter. So what we care about is the, um, the OS associates this local APIC with a namespace, I don't fucking care, and then it has the APIC ID. Uh-huh. I see. And that's a one byte APIC ID. So yeah, I think we do to get X2 APIC support, which I think we have on the other machine. We're gonna have to parse the, what the fuck? But this has X APIC. Oh, we might have another table now. Let's see, did we, did we get a new table? Print uh, core stir from utf8 signature unwrap we might have gotten a new table new tably boy 143 um ref that ah we got the fact the facp i don't think i care about that but we did get a new table the fuck is that one it's the fadt and the FADT, this uh, this uh, tells you where all the shit is that you enable, disable, AP, ACPI. That's like the real stuff. We don't care about that. Um, and we don't have an XSDT on this system. So, yeah. Anyways, so we're going to parse the MADT. Does panic mean the system stops? Yes, in this, in this OS, yes. Uh, parse the MADT. Then we're going to go through. We're going to parse these entries. We're going to get the APIC entries. Uh, we might need to get this running on some other real hardware. So, okay. So then this, we know we're going to get the APIC ID. That's all we care about. Uh, MADT. Scroll, 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 scroll. Local APIC. And we know that that is at offset 
Um, a pick ID is at offset three, and it's a byte. Mm read fizz fizz adder ics.0 plus three. Uh, read the a pick ID. Now I have the APIC ID and then the flags. Do we care about flags? Yes, we definitely do. Um, set if this processor is ready for use. If this bit is clear and the island capable is set, system hardware supports enabling this during runtime. If it is clear and online capable is clear, this processor is unusable. Okay, so we'll get the flags. Uh, I gotta refresh my chat. Twitch was getting all choppy. I think I'm still good, yep. I am still good, okay. So we have the flags. The flags are at offset four. So print this, this, apic ID, and flags. Okay, uh, one is enabled, yeah, online capable. So if it's set, then it's all good. So we're gonna have, let mute apix is vec new. We have allocations at this stage, I think. Uh, create a new structure to hold the apix uh, that are usable. Um, so here we'll do apix.push, apic id, um, oh, so here we'll say if flags and one shift zero is not equal to zero, or, so if that is set, then it's ready for use, or if the online capable is set, Uh, if flags and enabled is not equal to zero, or that is not equal to zero, then we'll push that APIC ID. Uh, if the APIC is enabled, uh, if the if the processor is enabled or can be enabled, log it as a valid APIC. And that's what this says. If it's set, it's ready for use. If it is clear and this is set, then it supports enabling it during runtime. If it's clear and the other is clear, we don't we don't really care. If they're if they're both clear, then we ignore that. And it should ignore the contents of this and not use it. Okay. And then we'll do const uh, enabled u32 is equal to one shift zero. This will be online line capable. One shift one. Uh, this is the uh, processor is ready for use. And this is the uh, processor may be enabled at runtime. If and only if enabled is zero. Uh, otherwise, this bit is uh, reserved as zero. <clears throat> okay, uh, vector, we'll pull in from uh, use alloc vec vec. I might have missed some things in chat. Uh, thanks, that's what I figured. What were you saying, Weiwo? Or did I answer you? I, I refreshed my chat, so I lost my chat log. Uh, 154. Um, okay, so we're logging all the Apex, and then at this point, we'll print Apex available. Uh, pretty hex print Apex this. So this will print all the APICs available. There we go, we have four cores available. Those are the APIC IDs. And if I'm not mistaken, are those the initial APIC IDs? We don't really know. 
we don't know the initial APIC ID, but anyways, um, do you think you should remember the flags with the CPU ID? Uh, w or with the APIC ID here? No, I don't care about the flags. Those are the only flags that matter, and we only store APICs that are valid. So we're basically checking if this APIC, APIC is usable. If this APIC is not usable, we don't store it at all. And then this list only contains APICs that are either enabled or can be enabled. Um, APICs that have been disabled. So this can happen sometime. Um, the APIC's actually pretty solid. It's the ACPI that's a sloppy standard. Um, so in this case, the, uh, we only store the ones that we can use. Now, what can possibly happen is in your BIOS, the BIOS can detect that a processor's, a core's not behaving and then won't update this entry, or it could be disabled in the BIOS and sometimes it'll be software disabled. And if it's software disabled, these bits might not be set and we don't want to log that that APIC is usable. And those are the only bits that we care about, and we only care about them at this phase. Um, so that will identify the APICs. We'll try it on hardware. Yeah, there we go. We have uh, four APICs, 0, 2, 4, and 6. Uh, and that makes sense because there are. this is a four-core processor that, that has hyper-threading support. And thus, this is they're skipping, but that's still fine. Because if I had hyper-threading, we'd have 0 through 7. Um, let me, um, let me get my Fi up and running. I'll be right back. I got to move it to this network.
All right, uh, that server's booting. I also rebooted the other one. I had to unplug it to make room. So that should come back up. In fact, it might be up. Uh, that one is not yet. Okay, and then we'll grab the uh, CPU land, and this will be file land, IP my uh, sol dot sh file land sol. And I forget what the fuck I, uh, I think it's, I think it's just this. Damn it. Is it admin? Uh... Oh, that's not responding. So that's just not resolving yet. So that server's up and running. Let's see, that IP my... That server's online. Oh, there we go, I just, it just came up. And it looks like we're good. I don't know if we're booted. Holy shit, we are. Nice, okay. So here's the phi. Now this... The downsides are this only is going to have, this isn't going to have all the cores. Because um, this is going to have, let's print the total here, apix.len. This is going to be a pretty small, this is going to be, I think, 255 or 254. It's not the full set. 223. So only 223 of the processors uh, are accessible through this table. So this one's fine, we got four. This one's fine, well, this one's fucked. We got 223. This one, we got four. What's a five? It's a, a many core uh, processor. It's got a, it's got a bunch of, it's a, got a bunch of different cores, uh, but they're all relatively individually weak. So it's a 256 uh, core system. Oh. Maybe it has cores in different entries. Yeah, none of this is a problem. Um, none of this is su surprising or an issue. We have to parse the other. Um, this has the X1 APIC, the X APIC. We need the X2 APIC table, which is not present in our virtual machine or on our Lenovo machine. Actually, our Lenovo machine probably has it, but the VM does not. And what we need to do is we need to get the XSDT. And the XSDT will have different tables. And those tables will be slightly different. And there will be a another ACPI or a APIC table. Um... If I'm not mistaken, there will be another one. Actually, it might just be different entries in the same table. Let me see. MADT. Oh, local, uh, nice. Local X2 APIC right here. Perfect. Okay. So it is right in the same structure. We don't have to parse another another one. Fuck yeah. Um, that is nice to see. So then one, uh, this is a nine. This is a, uh, flags are the same, so I'll move these flags up. Uh, move those over and move them up here. And these will be, um, APIC enabled and APIC online capable. Um, so this will be APIC enabled. Or APIC online capable. Okay, and we'll do the same logic. And this is for the X2 APIC. X2, uh, X2 APIC entry. Uh, invalid X2 APIC ICS entry. It should be 16 bytes. The APIC ID for this one is a use 32. 
In this case, we're going to cast this up to U32. Uh, U32 at offset 4, and then at offset 8, we have the flags, and then the UID structure, which we don't care about at all. Uh, if the processor enabled or could be enabled, then we save that. And now we should have 256. <laughs> so there we go. Isn't ACPI used for batteries or something? It's used for everything. In this case, we're using it to figure out what processors are present on the system. Okay. You guys like that? Now we know exactly which APIC identifiers are for all the cores. It works on a machine with 256 cores, which stresses the limit of that. ACPI is not x86 specific. It is not. Yeah, ACPI detects all hardware. It's not all hardware, but almost all of it. Yeah, I think that's pretty much safe to say. It's kind of the database of... It's the dynamic database of hardware. It's 64 cores, uh, 256 threads on the Xeon Pi. Okay. Um. Hmm. Hmm. Um, okay, so now I have this information so I can actually initialize these processors uh, correctly. Um, okay. Hell yeah. So I can I can send an init to all of those to bring them online. But I also kind of want... <clears throat> I want to know the... Um, I want to know the memory affinities such that I can set up a... Um, I want to set up a NUMA aware allocator pretty badly. Um... Hmm. Yeah, I think that's the SRAT. The system resource affinity table. And this will tell you which APICs are associated with which memory ranges. Right, let's take a look. It has these structures. This is a local APIC affinity structure. This will say that this APIC belongs to this proximity domain. And these are the top bits. So it's a 32-bit domain. So this APIC belongs to this. Um, and then... There'll be one for the X2 APIC as well for that. And then the memory affinity structure, this is the physical range. And then the proximity domain, which the range of memory belongs. Okay. And then enabled hot pluggable and then non-volatile memory. If clear, uh, it ignores the contents of the memory affinity structure. So that matters. And then this is the X2 APIC affinity. It's the same thing, but it has an affinity. Uh, I guess these are just four bytes next to each other, which is really nice. Okay. So I'll show you how this shit works. And then I'll show you why uh, NUMA matters. I think that's really important to understand. It's basically due to latency differences. But to do this, we're going to grab the SRAT, which we should have. <coughs> uh, else, if signature 
is equal to the S rat. Signet net tour. Uh, parse the S rat. S rat. Parse S rat. Um, and parse the. S rat out of the ACPI tables. This will grab the S rat. Um, it's actually going to be relatively similar code because it's a similar uh, data structure here where we have these ICS entries. And you go through all the entries. It, we might want to make a function that takes a closure potentially, um, but we're just going to do this for now. We're going to see how much we actually want to parse. So this should go through the S rats, uh, S rats, and then MADT, S rats. Okay. So then this should say uh, prints S rats this this uh, type and a len. Up here, we're not going to print the apex. We'll just print the number available. And then that'll allow us to see a little bit better what this printout is. So we have nothing on here. No SRAT there. On the Lenovo. Uh, no SRAT on the Lenovo. And we have... Oh, bad length on an SRAT ICS entry. Okay, let's take a look. Oh, yeah, this will have a different offset. Um, S rat reserved reserved forty eight. Ah, so we have to add four and eight. Uh, so skip skip the uh, twelve reserved bytes to get to the um, S rat payload or S rat structure S R A structure. Yeah, and we'll say invalid uh, SRA entry. Bad length for uh, SRAT SRA entry. Uh, we'll change this to, instead of ICS, we'll say this is the, ICS is the SRA. Okay. So we don't have it there. We don't have it there. And then here we have a, a bunch of different SRAT entries. And that's basically going to tell which processors belong to which groups and then which groups have what memory. What terminal that is? Um, it's just uh, X term. It's X term with BIM. Okay. So now we have that SRAT. You know, this is a lot easier than the last time I tried this. I think I just have gotten better, more experienced at this. It used to be an absolute pain in the ass to do this. And now it's like, whatever, we'll implement. We'll implement this. No big deal. Okay. They're just doing this for the fourth time. I've actually only done this... Probably three times, maybe, maybe, um, actually I might have only done this like two times. One, once in C and once in Rust. This is the first time I've done it in Rust where I know how to write Rust though. So that might be why it's easier. Let me, memory, affinities. I think we're going to use a B tree map here. Mapping of um, proximity domains to their um, memory ranges. And this is going to be a, a B tree map of a U32, which is a proximity domain. And it's going to be to a. Um, What is this going to be? Uh, I guess uh, 
base and a length. So a fizz adder and a length. Oops. We'll have a physical address and a length. And then we'll only store uh, the valid mappings. And then uh, mapping of apex to their proximity domains. Okay. And then this will be uh, proxi uh, apic affinities. And then this will be from a U64, uh, U32 apic ID. And then this will go to their proximity domain, which is a um, uh, a U32. Okay. Use alloc collections b tree map. I think that's where it is. Ten hour stream. Hell yeah. What about assembly? I don't think I did this in assembly. My assembly uh, OS was on AMD, and AMD actually exposes all of this information through uh, PCI bars. So you can write like um, AMD specific things. And what's cool about those is those are the actual things that determine the routing of the physical processor, whereas the ACPI tables are just what the BIOS tells you. And the BIOS might have mapped things incorrectly or pro uh, populated whatever incorrectly. Whereas with AMD, I went right to the source of literally where the routing and topologies were. Um, they literally can't be any different than what is in those registers because those define how it behaves. Okay. Match type. And this, this is a memory affinity. Assert len is equal to 40. Invalid memory affinity SRA entry. And then we're going to get the prox domain. Uh, this is a U32. We're going to read from fizz adder SRA.0 plus 2. Let's the base address low high, length low high. We can just do this. Base. This is a fizz adder, uh, and this is a, a mm read fizz of that. Okay, and we got a fizz adder, loon mm read fizz fizz adder. Oh shit! We're gonna say domain <laughs> just so we can get this going. SRA dot zero plus. Uh, this is the base address low. And then the high or the length low is at 16. And this is the f size of physical memory. And then we have the flags. Physical address SRA.0 plus uh, 28 to get the flags. And then we're going to. Um, Extract the fields we care about. And then, flags. Enabled. If clear, it ignores the memory contents of whatever the structure. OK. So if uh, flags and enabled is not equal to 0, then we're going to do mem memory affinities, affinities dot insert, and I'm pretty sure I need to do a dot entry, but I'm going to do this, and I, I think this is going to panic, um, and here we'll do const enabled is a u32, one shift zero, the um, uh, memory is enabled, in which case I don't care if it's non-volatile, if it's hot pluggable, um, hot add and s hot remove of this memory region. 
I think we're just going to ignore that field, but in theory, that means we should be aware that it could be removed, but we're not going to support that. We're just going to say this OS doesn't support hot plug. Problem solved. Now it's correct. Um, log the uh, affinity record. We're going to insert at domain for base and size. Uh, and then we're going to all others. We currently don't care. We're going to parse some more in a second. And then here I'm going to assert that this is none. Now that assertion is probably going to fail on the phi. Wow. Okay. Um, huh. I thought there would be multiple regions. But maybe not. I thought you could maybe have uh, proximity domains with multiple regions. But I guess not. Hey, Meta, how are you doing? Good to see you back. Um, what do we got here? We log the affinity record. And now I can do this. I can pretty print the affinity records. Um, right, affinity, memory affinities. Let's right, see, we got nothing on here. And then this one, here we have different banks. So zero is this range, one, two, and three. Um, so these are different physical regions of memory, which belong to different NUMA nodes. Fuck well, yeah. Um, so I think, I think I'm going to reboot this uh, Xeon Phi, and we're going to go into the BIOS. And I'm going to change the uh, NUMA tables to be a slightly different model. Uh, force enter BIOS setup. Nice. I'm glad I have that option so I don't have to be here. So this will pop up in the BIOS while we're waiting. 